Hey what's up, it's cute what if this side. Today we will be seeing, what if villain Deku got harem. Now before we move ahead with the fic, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. For future what ifs like this. Izuku sat on the metal shipping container, legs dangling over the side, and looked down on the villains gathered before him. There were just over 60 in total and while the number might seem like a lot none of them were big names. In fact most of them were offenders whose crimes were petty or didn't amount to much in the grand scheme of things by society's standards. Were they bad? Yes, but not as bad when compared to monsters like All for One, Muscular, or Moonfish. However Izuku didn't need the big names, not yet at any rate. He needed foot soldiers, thugs and grunts he could use to wear down his opponents and deal with the riffraff. The old Izuku would have cared about the men and women before him, wanted to help them, redeem them. New Izuku couldn't help but scoff at the thought, he'd known for years what cruelty people were capable of. In fact most of said cruelty had been directed at him. Old Izuku had wanted to save everyone and it had taken a hero killing his mother and a building collapsing around him for Izuku to learn, to understand, to know, that not everyone could be saved. Nor should they. Feeling a tap on his shoulder Izuku turned to look at Momo who was standing behind him on his right. She gave a pointed nod towards the entrance, her eyes locked onto the most recent arrival before turning around to keep talking on her phone. Turning his head to look forward at the entrance to the warehouse, Izuku took in who they'd been waiting for. Just as all for one had said Izuku knew the man when he saw him. He was tall, two stories of solid muscle and that was while he was bent over his hair was brown and spiky much like his body which appeared jagged, much like rock. His teeth were bared and pointed, with his lower canines protruding out of his mouth on either side like an anime orc. He was clad only in a pair of black shorts that hugged his lower body tightly, and a grey hooded cloak that was open at the front, hood down. From appearance alone Izuku would guess the man had a simple mutation quirk that gave him tough, rocky skin, super strength, and maybe increased senses of some kind. However this man served all for one and Izuku knew that appearances could be deceiving the man could have an entirely different quirk or even multiple quirks hidden away within his body, you never knew. Good, great, goodbye. Hearing a beep, Izuku turned his attention back towards his lieutenant who was reaching into her cloak to put her phone away in a utility belt strapped around her waist. Momo was dressed in a hooded black cloak with a kabuki mask in the shape of a kitsune over her face keeping her hidden from view. It was a necessity to make sure that any of their men who got caught would only be able to identify Izuku, who had no intention of giving up his spy so soon. Although he suspected that she was wearing very little underneath due to her quirk, the only thing he knew she was wearing with certainty was the utility belt around her waist. Her belt was rather similar to the one she'd asked for from the UA. Support course, magnetic, with metal tiles attached to it inscribed with the molecular structure of items or materials that could be considered useful. First aid kits, steel, swords, guns, knives, titanium, diamonds, shields, bandages, all of it was a tile away and most of them Momo didn't even need to reference having memorized their molecular structures years ago when she'd practiced and trained with her developing quirk. Feeling Izuku's eyes upon her Momo turned around and gave her master a thumbs up showing that they were good to go. Letting out a breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding, Izuku pushed himself to his feet so he stood above the crowd below him. A stomp of his foot on the metal shipping container caused a loud metallic thump to ring through the warehouse, and immediately everyone's focus was on the greenie. For a moment there was silent but then Izuku spoke his voice confident, commanding, echoing through the warehouse with no trace of the stutter. Insecurity and fear he'd had only months before, a testament to Momo's work to improve the green-haired boy's confidence. I won't waste time boring you all as I drone on and on about our opponents. They aren't some great evil that seeks to destroy our way of life, to slaughter your family before putting the survivors in chains. They do not desire your wives and daughters nor do they want to take what you own. They've committed crimes, done wrong, but so have all of you. So do you want to know what they've done to earn my ire what your reward shall be for helping us in the endeavor I've gathered you all here to undertake? Seeing looks of interest Izuku plowed on, our opponents are what remains of the Yakuza, a name that once sparked fear throughout Japan but with the appearance of quirks has fallen into ruin. They are wealthy, weighed down with money, gold, and jewels obtained from banks and stores all over Japan by their forebearers. But that is not what matters, to me, to us, he said, gesturing to Momo and himself. What matters is that these beasts, the Shai Hasekai, killed our family. They broke into our apartment, killed my father and brother, before raping and torturing my mother and sister. Only my sister survived, the attempt on her life leaving her scarred and disfigured but our resolve has never been stronger. We seek the destruction of those who hurt our own and leave the treasures within the compound to you all for your assistance. The lies and falsehoods slipped out smoothly, with practiced ease and Izuku could see in the faces below that they believed him. Most of the upturned faces were marred by greed for the false treasure, but some held sympathy for a family and sister that didn't exist, and from an unexpected few, rage for such actions being committed against seemingly innocent people. Holding back his grin, Izuku instead twisted his face into one of fury, as he pulled out a stack of old school wanted posters and tossed them into the crowd below. As people bent to pick them up and examine them Izuku explained. 
These are the leaders of the Shai Hasekai as well as the members of the Eight Bullets. They are the ones who have wronged my family. However I don't seek their deaths, instead I ask you, those willing to help me get vengeance, to bring these people before me alive. I do not care what you do with the others nor do I care if you injure these targets. All I ask is that at the end of the day I get the chance to enact my revenge. Personally, the last word was uttered with a dark smile and Izuku looking down on his minions saw that his impromptu speech had been taken exactly as he hoped it had. Of course he had no intention of actually killing all the elites of the group. His research had found that most of the eight bullets followed Chisaki because he'd saved them in some way. Izuku figured that with some persuasion, they would be more than willing to change their employment to someone who would be able to better utilize their skills and abilities. As for the ones who didn't, well the last time Izuku had met with all for one the man had asked for any he couldn't use. Subjects for an experiment of some kind although Izuku hadn't asked for specifics. A gut instinct told him that while he might fall in and become a villain he wasn't ready for whatever the experiment entailed. Not yet at any rate. However if it helped him Izuku had no problem providing all for one with the materials the man required. The crowd looked excited, joyous at the chance not only for riches but to fight freely with the use of their quirks. The fact that the villains would be the good guys for once seemed to rile them up all the more as Izuku knew from research that several of the villains in the room had been Xero school applicants who'd been rejected for one reason or another, either through some fault of their own or, more likely, they had simply been unable to make the cut. As the crowd yelled their support, clenched fist raised towards the sky, Izuku spread his arms wide and the noise began to gradually die down. I thank you, my friends, for your support. Never, not even in my wildest dreams did I imagine that so many of you would be willing to offer me aid in my quest, to do what heroes, he spat the word with disgust, never could. Now go he said gesturing towards the front of the warehouse, transportation outside awaits to carry us to our destination. As the crowd began to funnel outside Izuku turned towards Momo who stood behind him like a silent guardian. Is our surprise ready he asked, voice low. The surprise had been a last minute idea by Momo and was one Izuku had agreed to. Not only would it delay the hero's response to the raid but it would split them up and distract them at the same time. Police, civilians, rescue workers, all attention would be focused elsewhere leaving the raid to hopefully be passed over in the confusion. Momo's nod caused Izuku to let out a small grin as he made his way towards the entrance of the warehouse. Just before he reached it however a giant hand came down, cutting off his path forward. Turning Izuku found himself looking upwards at the giant of the man sent to assist him by his mentor. For a moment the two stared each other down, a modern David and Goliath but eventually the living mountain spoke. You are. Confusing. The giant's voice was rough, grating but Izuku's face remained blank. You inspire others, like Master. But you give hope, like him. The giant growled the last word in a manner eerily similar to all for one and behind him. Izuku sensed Momo tense up slowly trying to move to a position the Ravenet bodyguard could use to her advantage if she needed to battle the giant. The only problem is there was none not from flat concrete to a monster rising two and a half dozen feet above her. And Izuku asked, his voice calm with a polite curiosity that any politician would find enviable. You are not worthy of succeeding master. The large man growled. You are weak, you do not inspire fear in enemies. You are nothing compared to him. For a minute Izuku was silent, his head tilted downwards as shadows covered his eyes. The giant looked at the green eat before turning away with a sigh of disappointment. I will help. Master commanded me to. However, I will not help afterwards. Not when you are unworthy. Gigantomasia, Izuku said. His voice was low but it was enough to make the giant walking away from him pause in midstep. That's your name isn't it all for one told me about you how you used to be his bodyguard, about your abilities. He spoke highly of you, but the thing he praised most was your loyalty, how steadfast you were in your support of him. Tell me are you questioning his decision? Izuku had barely gotten the word out before the now named giant had turned around, his fist raised to deliver a crushing blow. Momo began to react but she was slow, unable to keep up with Gigantamasia who moved faster than any man his size had the right to do. Izuku didn't react as the fist came down towards him and merely closed his eyes, blocking the dust and small pebbles that were thrown into the air when Gigantamasia buried his fist into the ground just in front of the greenie. Do not question my loyalty, the giant growled, his eyes locked onto Izuku who calmly opened his own emerald orbs to meet the man's gaze. Noted, Izuku said, raising a hand to brush a small piece of concrete off his shoulder. However, I will tell you now, Izuku raised his head and the giant froze for a split second at the look on the boy's face. It was a look of death, of pure one-minded focus that was eerily familiar to the man. Do not call me weak, because my experiences have made me a million times stronger than you will ever know. The tension between the two was staggering and to Momo, the sole person looking on it appeared as if lightning itself crackled and burned between the two. Gigantamasia was the first to turn away, we shall see, he said as he strode off, slamming the steel door closed behind him as he exited. 
Izuku stood tall for another moment before collapsing backwards. Wow, he said, as sweat ran down his forehead. He's even more intimidating than I thought he would be. Izuku turned towards Momo only to be greeted with a slap to the face. The force of the blow sent Izuku tumbling head over heels and for a moment he felt as if his soul was leaving his body heading upwards towards a bright light but it returned to his body when Momo began shaking him. What were you thinking the Ravenet cried, as tears streamed down her face, her kabuki mask lying forgotten on the ground. I thought he was going to, I couldn't sobs racked Momo's body as she buried her head into Izuku's chest. For a moment Izuku lay there uncertain of what to do but after a moment he raised his hand, and began to rub circles into Momo's back. In the brief moment he'd looked into the girl's eyes Izuku had seen fear, not for herself but for him. The fear that if he died she would once again be alone with no one her own age who understood her like he did. There, there, he said, his voice soft, I'm right here, everything is going to be alright. For a minute the two lay there, just finding comfort in the other one's presence. Eventually Momo's sobs began to die out, and she raised her head looking at Izuku with red, puffy eyes. Promise me, she said, her voice soft and low, trembling with emotion. Promise me that you'll never challenge someone like that again. That you'll never do anything that risky. Please let me know. I can't. Izuku's voice was firm as he cut her off. Looking at his friend's shocked expression his eyes were soft pools of jade as he explained himself. I can't promise you that I'll stay safe that I'll never do something like that again. I want to so badly it hurts, he said the slightest tremble in his voice allowing the Ravenet to hear his sincerity. But I can't. I'm a criminal, a villain and in the underworld strength means everything. I have to be strong even when, especially when, I'm not and right now I'm not strong. I'm quirkless, literally everyone is stronger than me, better than me. I only have two things going for me my brain and all for one support. If I lose either I am finished plain and simple and you can't just walk away from villainy without sacrificing something. Right now the only thing I have that I care about is you and I refuse, Izuku's voice hardened, and a dark look covered the green eats face in shadows, to sacrifice the first friend I've had since I was four. I was ing for the last time I had a friend when I had anyone I could rely on that wasn't my parent from birth, and even one of them walked out when he found out I was worthless. And ing Deku tell me, Izuku yelled at Momo as tears appeared in the corner of his eyes, tell me what the world has ever done for me, why I should give a crap what happens to it, why I shouldn't tear it down with my bare hands, why? Izuku began to sob looking at Momo as tears streamed down his face, his voice lowering from a shout to a whisper, why it took away the last thing I cared about. Eyes closed Izuku and felt rather than saw Momo pull him to her chest, the warmth of her body and soft, low thump of her heart doing more to calm the boy than any words ever could. I can't lose you, he whispered, whimpered, softly, I can't, not after everything. I don't care what happens to me but if I lose you I'll have nothing, no one at all and I can't go through that again. Momo ruffled Izuku's signature curly hair, don't worry I'll always be here for you, she said, her voice soft and caring. H how can you know that Izuku asked, pulling his head away from her chest, his eyes now puffy and red as he sniffled. How can you promise that? Because it's true, taking a deep breath Momo pulled away from Izuku who fell backwards onto his knees. As Izuku watched Momo created a knife and took a deep breath before with a single smooth motion she cut the palm of her left hand. As flowed from the wound Momo tossed her knife to the side and brought the pointer finger of her right hand to the injury, dipping it in the. Then she looked towards Izuku and promptly stuck her finger in his mouth. Shocked, Izuku fell backwards onto his back coughing and sputtering as he tried to spit it out but some of the crimson liquid still found its way down the green eat's throat. By my, Izuku turned his attention back to Momo when the Ravenet spoke and found her looking at him. Though her voice was flat, emotionless the young woman's eyes screamed fondness, loyalty, compassion, and the barest hint of something he didn't want to name, an emotion that if he were more confident he might label love. I swear my loyalty to the one who holds my within them. The one I claim is my master. A servant bonded in life and in death, to act as his sword and shield, companion and friend, soldier, healer, and whenever else is needed of me. To follow my master's orders obediently from now until the end of time. Let no doubt, no question, remain within me and may he never doubt my sincere vow. By my I swear this unbreakable oath. For a moment the two were silent, Izuku's mouth opened and closed like a fish out of water while Momo looked onwards, calm on the outside but nervous on the inside as to how her now confirmed master would take her vow. Well, now we'll always be together, she said as she gave him a strained smile. Said smile seemed to snap Izuku out of his shock, did you? He asked voice trembling, did you really just swear my oath to you instead of all for one, yep. Momo said cheekily. In their months together training Momo had explained her family's history to Izuku including the fact of how each member had sworn their loyalty to all for one when they'd come of age. How they were raised from literal birth to serve him and only told when they were trusted not to betray the legendary figure. Momo was the first in literal generations to break the tradition swearing her loyalty instead to the green eat before her that she'd known for less than a year. Bibi but, smiling with fondness Momo grabbed Izuku's arm and pulled him to his feet before reaching down once more to grab her kabuki mask from the ground. Come on master, she said as she fixed it upon her face, we'll talk later, right now we have Yakuza to raid. 
Four tour buses made their way through the city of Jaku, cutting through the mid-morning traffic with a purpose before eventually being forced to stop due to a red light. Beside them nestled in between several office buildings was a traditional Japanese residence which, while Strangel was nothing too peculiar to take note of. However it was just as the light turned green and the buses prepared to pull away everything went bottoms up. Loud bangs rang out and smoke began to rise up into the clear blue sky as massive explosions went off all across the city. Cars crashed and people ran in panic and fear, uncertain of what was happening. While this occurred a giant figure in a gray cloak who'd been walking down the sidewalk stopped and let said cloak fall to the ground in a heap. As the doors of the tour buses opened and the villains Izuku had gathered began to pour out, the former bodyguard of all for one pulled back his fist and slammed it into the front gate of the compound, sending the wooden doors flying inwards. As Gigantamesha charged and followed by the various villains shouting their battle cries, Izuku stepped off the bus with Momo right behind him. The few civilians still on the street turned and ran shouting to non-existent heroes for help. Looking around at the chaos surrounding them Izuku turned towards Momo, giving her an approving nod. The masked girl didn't react and simply dropped the remote detonator in her hand onto the ground where she promptly crushed it underfoot. The explosions had been Momo's last-minute surprise, meant to serve as a way to distract emergency services, police, and heroes while the raid occurred. The two young villains had no doubt that the forces would eventually arrive but they would be severely hampered by the chaos occurring throughout the city. The explosions had been bought using all for one's resources from the black market. Hooked to a remote detonator Momo created with her quirk, the explosions had been set at predetermined points all throughout the city. From the tour bus agency where the buses had been stolen from to an electrical plant that provided power to the Shai Hasekia base to sewers and several abandoned buildings or construction sites the explosions were meant to provide secondary assistance to the raid and cover Izuku's forces tracks while sowing chaos with minimal casualties. As Izuku and Momo walked through the front gates of the compound Izuku couldn't help but wonder how the UA. Entrance exam that day was going and if a certain blonde Pomeranian firecracker bully was in attendance. At the same time, Katsuki Bakugo let out a growl as he stalked forward into UA. His hands shoved deep into his pockets as he made his way past other student hopefuls and raptured by the sight of the number one school in the country. Damn extras, the blonde growled uncaring of the girl he knocked onto the ground with shoulder-length brown hair cut in a bob style. He was here, the next big milestone in his road to becoming the next number one yet it felt off as if something was missing. Hey isn't that Bakugo you know, from the sludge incident he heard an extra whisper to his friend. Casting a glare at the ur who'd spoken Katsuki let out a feral growl, as he forced himself to keep his hands in his pockets instead of exploding the dumbass for making him look weak. That was the other thing bothering him, ten months ago he'd been attacked by a villain and saved by all might the number one pro hero himself, his lifelong idol, and yet he'd been unable to remember it. He remembered waking up in a park covered in burns and ash as if he'd been hit by a powered up version of his own explosions, but he had no memory of how he'd gotten there nor of anything that happened after the last school period of the day had ended. Confused and in pain he'd made his way home and walked in the door only to be immediately set upon by his witch of a mother. She'd asked if he was okay and when he'd asked what she'd meant she flat out told him they were going to the doctors. He'd growled and protested but the old hag hadn't budged and it was in the waiting room to see the doctor that he actually found out what happened to him from a TV resting on a corner of the wall displaying the day's news. As he watched himself being held hostage before being rescued by the number one hero Bakuo's head had started to throb and he'd actually groaned in pain. It had felt like a nail was being pounded into his head but thankfully as the pressure worsened the doctor had arrived to see him. The man had carefully examined him, remarking that the burns on his body were likely self-inflicted since they shared all the markers of his quirk since explosions were apparently different from one another. Combined with his pounding headache, apparent amnesia, and psychological profile the doctor had theorized that after his rescue Bakugo had, in a fit of rage at appearing weak, attempted to use his quirk either for practice to improve it or on himself resulting in his burns. Such an occurrence combined with possible PTSD from being held hostage, and suffocated likely caused his brain to simply repress the memories, locking them away until he could handle them. That sounded like bullcrap to Katsuki but his mom had lapped it up and after thanking the doctor, took him home where she'd actually had the nerve to make him go to bed saying he would miss school the rest of the week. He protested he couldn't appear weak to the others especially not in Deku, but his mom had been firm. At least his dad had been cool about the incident which was unexpected, merely asking if Katsuki was okay before leaving him to his mother's overbearing care. The next morning when he'd come downstairs having slept in since he didn't need to worry about school he'd been shocked to find his mother and dad sitting together at the kitchen table instead of at their respective jobs. His mom cradling her face in her hands as she cried while his dad rubbed her back supportively. What's wrong you old hag? Shut up Katsuki. For once Bakugo had been speechless, no matter what it was his mom had always been the one wearing the pants in his parents' relationship, and it was the first time he could ever remember his old man raising his voice at him. And no no no, he needs to know. 
His mother had sniffled, raising her head to look at him with red eyes. Last night a villain attacked the Horikoshi apartment complex. For a moment Bakugo felt a twinge of worry he recognized that name. It was where Deku lived, but he brushed it off. He didn't care about the quirkless hero wannabe and it was just an attack. One of the many that happened every day so why was the hag so upset? The villain got into a fight with the pro hero and one of the apartments ended up collapsing before everyone could evacuate. Now Bakugo was worried, where was she going with this I just got the call. They need me to go identify Ai and Ko's body as she forced out the name his mom collapsed into his dad's embrace as her sobs renewed. And Deku he asked, his voice barely above a whisper. He felt numb, like he was in a dream. This couldn't be happening not only was he shown to be weak on national news but his former friend, corkless, useless Deku was. They don't know. His dad's voice was soft but firm layered with a steel Katsuki had never seen nor heard from the man before. They haven't found a body but they have found a lot of in the lobby they determined to be his. It was on a piece of wood in the lobby and it had the remnants of. Of what Katsuki asked, his voice a whispered croak. Dot 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 of organs on it. Organs, as in plural Katsuki could feel himself paling as he pictured Izuku lying on the ground a wooden stake protruding through his chest. It was unnaturally easy to do. They haven't found a body, body but based on the evidence they've listed him as missing, presumed dead. Katsuki was numb, he didn't feel himself walking forward to collapse heavily onto a chair. He vaguely remembered food being set before him and eating it robotically. Deku was dead. Deku was dead. Deku was dead. Wasa dead 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 dead. Katsuki remembered everything he'd done to the green eat who'd once been his friend. The torture, the beatings. Forcing Izuku to hand over money to avoid being beaten up only to beat him up anyway once Katsuki got tired of extorting the freak only to take the money anyway. When was the last time he'd been nice to the green-haired boy, done anything for useless, we for Deku as his mind drew a blank Katsuki's brain went back further and further searching, looking, hoping that there was at least once incident where he hadn't bullied, abused, or taken advantage of the green eat. Finally it found the time the four of them Izuku, fat wings, finger knot, and himself had been strolling through the woods. It was just after their quirks had come in before Izuku had been officially diagnosed and Bakugo was in the lead like always. The quartet had come to a stream and Bakugo had made to cross it over a log much to the other's shouts of approval. However the log had been wet from last night's rain and Katsuki had slipped, falling into the creek below. Only Izuku had come down to see if he was okay. Only Izuku had held out his hand with genuine worry in his eyes to help him up. Only Izuku had seen him weak but Katsuki had been the one to slap his friend's hand away. Lying in bed that night as the memory played itself over and over in his mind Katsuki couldn't help but feel a pit forming in his stomach at the realization that that last time he'd been anything other than a bully to Izuku had been when the two of them were four. Ing for the thought only made the pit inside of him deepen but Katsuki refused to acknowledge it. Instead he pulled out his phone and looked up video of the sludge incident. Opening a video taken there on someone's phone Katsuki watched himself in the shaky amateur footage be held hostage, his explosions holding the pros back while setting his surroundings aflame. Katsuki watched and waited for All Might to appear, to save the day, but found him sitting up in shock when he saw someone else rush forward to help him. A person the blonde was rather familiar with, Deku he whispered unbelievingly. Katsuki watched silently, mouth agape as the green eat threw his school bag at the villain, managing to hit him in the eye with luck rather than skill before clawing futilely at the slime. When the slime villain recovered Bakugo felt himself freeze in horror as the villain drew back Katsuki's arm, the blonde's palm cackling in preparation to launch what would assuredly be a massive explosion. Bakugo wanted to turn away, look anywhere but at the screen but he forced himself to continue. Then at the very last minute All Might appeared protectively in front of Izuku before sending the villain flying with a single punch. As the villain was blasted away Katsuki's headache returned with a vengeance. If yesterday the pounding had been reminiscent of a nail then now it was a hot iron being thrust into his skull. Yet through the pain details began to emerge. The choking feeling of being suffocated, the taste of the slime down his throat. This time Bakugo was watching the scene play out once again this time from a first-person perspective as his memory returned to him in a flash. He remembered kicking the bottle, the villain coming out of it, being captured and used as a living weapon, Izuku attempting to save him only for All Might to actually do it. Hell he remembered being complimented by the heroes afterwards, some of them even asking for him to come work at their agency once he graduated but he brushed all of them aside. They weren't worth his time or attention, not why they hadn't done anything to help him. Besides he intended to become the next number one hero not some lame-ass psychic to a third-string hero wannabe. After regaining his memories Katsuki threw himself headlong into training for the UA. Entrance exam. Never again would he be helpless. Never again would he be weak, and never, ever, ever would Katsuki have to be saved by a corkless, useless, Deku. However even as he thought at the hole that had formed in Katsuki's stomach upon hearing of his childhood friend's death grew just a tiny bit more but the blonde boy locked the feeling away when it arose. It was of no use to him in his quest to achieve his goal of being the strongest, to be the next number one hero so he chained it down deep inside, determined never to let those feelings see the light of day, a mentality that only grew when he actually thought he'd seen the green eat when the hag had sent him to put some flowers on Auntie and Ko's grave. 
The boy had gotten into a limo and Katsuki had shaken his head driving the thought from his mind and retaining the hole in his stomach that had loosed upon seeing the green-haired boy. Izuku Deku Midoriya was dead and Katsuki knew that he was never coming back so the blonde boy instead turned his attention to his training. In his haste to grow stronger Katsuki failed to notice that there were still holes in his memory he couldn't remember. The few minutes immediately after school had let out the day of the sludge incident. What happened to him after he'd been released by the heroes, how he'd ended up burned and beaten by his own quirk all of it was still missing. It was as if some of his memories were still hidden away in his mind, waiting to be unlocked the moment they were needed. As she turned in her written test Itsuka Kendo let a soft sigh escape her mouth as she massaged her aching temples with her hands. Ever since she'd met All Might all those months ago her life had become for lack of a better word, hectic. Or maybe controlled chaos would be a better way to describe it. Learning that the number one hero's quirk was able to be passed down was a shock learning he wanted to give it to her even more of one. Sure she dreamed of being a pro hero and helping others but that was her goal, to help. She didn't care if she became the next number one as long as she was able to make a difference in the lives of others. It might sound stupid to some but that was fine, it was her goal and she intended to pursue it at all costs. Now here she was entrusted with becoming the next symbol of peace, with a new quirk she'd inherited from a hair she'd swallowed just hours ago, preparing to take the UA. Practical exam. Was she nervous? Yes but at the same time Itsuka had never felt more comfortable in her life. She trained in martial arts for years at her family's dojo and spent just as much time developing her quirk. She'd always had a decent build but All Might had taken it a step forward designing a workout plan that accommodated for school, martial arts, working out, and everything in between. Hell the man had even specified what she should eat and in what amounts. Slightly creepy and overbearing, yes but it was the intention that counted. As a result of her training Itsuka's body was now rather reminiscent of the rabbit hero Maruko and physique with an athletic build and muscular arms and legs although hers weren't as well defined as the number 6 pro hero which was to be expected all things considered. After only eight months of All Might's original ten-month plan the blonde hero had declared that Itsuka's body was strong enough to be able to handle one for all but it was a shock to both the blonde hero and herself when she declined. Seeing the disappointment growing in the number one hero's eyes she had been quick to try and reassure the man that she still wanted to be his successor it was just, I want to take the test using big fists, the orange had said looking at the ground shyly unable to meet her mentor's gaze for fear of what she might see. I've known I wanted to be a hero for years and, well, she let out a frustrated sigh as she cast her gaze upwards to the few white clouds floating in the mostly clear sky above why was it so difficult to put emotions and intentions into words. I just want to know if I would have been strong enough to get in with just my quirk. Young Kendo. That's a great reason All Might had shouted growing into his hero form before promptly turning back in a cloud of smoke, leaking through his smile, and down his chin where it dripped to the sands below. Wanting to test yourself, to see if you would have been strong enough. That is the mindset of someone who wants to be stronger never be satisfied with what you have always go the extra step, run the extra mile all so that when it's needed you can go above, and beyond to save one more person. There's a reason you a. S slogan is plus ultra, in Latin it means further beyond because that is what heroes do, they go beyond their limits all for the sake of others. So the last two months All Might had given her more free time, although he'd made sure she hadn't slacked in her workout routines, so the orange jet could practice her quirk. Itsuka had no idea whether it would be effective or not but she felt that she had slightly more control over her quirk than she'd had before. Whether her hands were larger or her attacks slightly stronger if nothing else she knew that she had prepared the best she could. And if needed, if there was no other option she had a backup plan. That morning she had finally accepted All Might's offer eating one of the blonde's hairs, albeit reluctantly and with much protest, so as to gain the man's quirk. She didn't feel any different but she trusted Yajai Sensei. If he said she would feel it she knew she would. Returning to the present Kendo took her seat and looked down at the stage as a pro hero she recognized as present Mike walked to the podium. Welcome to today's live performance, everybody say H-E-Y-Y-Y the hero yelled. Cupping an ear towards the crowd the pro looked like he was waiting for a response but the room was silent save for a faint cricket noise. Well that's cool, my examinee listeners I'm here to present the guidelines of your practical are you ready though he didn't cup his hand to his ear. Instead spreading them wide present Mike received only silence once again. This time not even the crickets chirped leaving the room as silent as a tomb. Looking slightly downfallen the hero pressed on. This is how the test will go. My listeners you'll be experiencing 10 minute long mock sit-escape maneuvers bring along whatever you want after this presentation you'll each head to your assigned testing location looking down. Itsuka found that her testing ticket displayed site D on it. Each site is filled with three kinds of faux villains points are awarded for defeating each according to their respective level use your quirks to disable these faux villains and earn enough points to pass that's your goal little listeners of course playing the antihero and attacking other examinees is prohibited. May I ask a question a voice cut present Mike off before he could continue. Turning with the rest of the crowd, Itsuka found herself looking at a stiff-looking examinee with short blue hair, 
and square glasses. In the pamphlet provided for us it says that there are four faux villains. Is this an intentional mistake because if so it is quite unbecoming of a school whose heroics program we are all trying to enter. Thank you for noticing Examine 7111 I was just about to get to that in addition to the three other types of faux villains there is a fourth variety that you'll get no points for beating picture it as a hidden boss in a video game. You don't need to battle it but you can if you want to however by doing so you'll be wasting time you could be spending getting more points does that answer your question 7111? Yes, thank you, the stiff looking boy said with a bow before retaking his seat. Great now before you sked it'll let me leave you with these words. Heroes are not forged from nothing all of them possess the spark that drives them, pushes them to go the extra mile, to go above and beyond, and push through their limits to go, plus ultra thank you and good luck. After changing into comfortable clothing, a simple teal t-shirt and black shorts, Itsuka made her way to the fake city UA, had prepared as her test site. Looking around Itsuka took in her fellow competitors but only a few stood out, an explosive blonde rolling his neck and cracking his finger one by one, a tall boy in a mask with six arms connected by folds of skin like a bat, a girl with vines for hair, another boy with a bird head who seemed to be talking to his own shadow, and a boy with weird marking around his eyes who appeared to be eating bits of metal. Some of the applicants were talking amongst themselves while others stretched, warming up their bodies or quirks, and begin present Mike's voice rang out over the speaker as the gates opened up. Most of the applicants stood there looking around in confusion, but two launched themselves forward into the mock city. Itsuka had learned from her spars at her father's dojo that there was no countdown in real life. Apparently only one other applicant had realized that this was likely another test. Casting a quick glance to her side Itsuka found herself looking into the red eyes of the blonde she'd noticed earlier. The boy's hands were pointed behind him and he seemed to be creating explosions from the palms of his hands that he was using to propel himself forward. Producing explosions was a useful quirk, one practically built for fighting or in this case the practical test itself. Separating from the boy, Itsuka focused back on her task, launching herself at the nearest robot standing in the middle of the street. Balanced precariously on a single wheel the two-armed robot had a large red one spray-painted on its forearms. Swinging one of said arms towards the orange-haired girl Kendo jumped over the obvious attack and using the arm as a makeshift springboard launched herself over the robot. Enlarging one of her hands as she went, Itsuka grabbed the robot's head as she hopped over the droid's shoulder to pull the machine off balance so it fell backwards with her, the head still in her hand. As she landed, Itsuka slammed the robot's head into the ground, the metal collapsing like tinfoil, as she did so, giving the orange-haired girl her first point. Itsuka didn't pause to celebrate however, instead turning her attention to her next opponent. The two-pointer was a tripe with a large scorpion-like tail coming out of the back of its body, and red two spray painted on its legs. As the faux villain drew back its tail to strike Itsuka leapt forward and kicked the side of the tail as it descended, redirecting it to impact another one-pointer standing nearby. Landing on the robot's back Itsuka pressed her advantage, punching at the armor underneath her feet. In a few short moments she'd breached the metal giving the orange jet access to the wiring inside which she ripped out uncaringly. The robot immediately collapsed to the ground as its leg gave out, six red eyes on what would be its head fading to black at its defeat. However she wasn't done yet, target locked, commencing destroy protocol, initiating. Turning around Itsuka found herself facing a three-pointer, with treads for all-terrain movement, heavy armor, and the ability to fire multiple missiles from the two-model MLRS on its back there was a reason the three-pointer was worth so many points. Cursing her luck Itsuka dodged the missiles as they were fired, her training and instincts automatically kicking in to help her as she slowly but steadily made her way closer to the machine. As explosions rang out behind her the orange-haired girl rolled to avoid a particularly low-flying rocket. Picking up a decent-sized chunk of concrete on her way back up Itsuka launched the rubble at the rocket system managing to nick one of the rockets as it emerged from its tube. The piece of concrete barely nicked the missile but it was just enough to knock the rocket off course causing it to hit another missile setting off a chain reaction destroying the robot. As present Mike's voice rang out announcing one minute had passed Itsuka let herself grin. Seven points in one minute was pretty good but she wanted to do better. Enlarging her hands she launched herself at the other robots as the other examinees began to finally catch up. In a control tower located an equal distance from all four mock cities, a group of shadowy figures looked at screens showing multiple views of the test from hidden cameras implanted in either the robots or hidden within the city itself. Looks like we have a decent crop this year, one said. We don't tell them how many villains there are or where they're located, another added, looking at a screen showing a blue-haired boy with exhaust pipes coming out of the back of his legs axe kicking a one-pointer in half. Such a wide battlefield and limited time drives them forward, motivating them to give it their best and go plus ultra. It's still too early to tell, one said dryly, their shadow resembling a giant cocoon or hot dog. True, the smallest shadow, one resembling a rodent remarked, but this should hopefully tell us more about the kind of applicants we have. So saying they lifted a glass case and pressed a bright red button labeled Kaiju just as present Mike yelled out. Three minutes remaining. Stumbling a bit, Itsuka ducked under a stab from a two-pointer's tail before grabbing said tail, 
and karate chopping it with her free hand cutting it in two. Attacking before the robot could retreat she drove the tip of the tail into the robot's head destroying it. 53, she said with a grin. Her grin fell though as the ground began to shake. All around her applicants fell down just as a large groan echoed throughout the testing site. A building collapsed and out of the rubble emerged a giant figure, a robot taller than most of the of the skyscrapers that surrounded it. As the applicants watched frozen in fear the giant swiped a clawed hand into the sides of one of the buildings. With a heavy groan the building collapsed, kicking up a cloud of dust that covered the testing area, and those within it. Two minutes remaining. Present Mike's voice kicked the examinees back into action, many of the applicants just straight out running in pure terror from the monstrosity behind them. Itsuka was at the back of the crowd helping up any who'd fallen down. Several times during the practical she had saved someone who'd bitten off more than they could chew or been about to be ambushed from behind. Such behavior wouldn't get her anything but it was the right thing to do which was all the orange girl cared about. Shit whirling around Itsuka found herself looking at the blonde boy she'd seen earlier who was lying on the ground. His eyes blazed with fury but from where she was standing Itsuka could clearly see that the boy's foot was twisted at an unnatural angle, likely sprained if not broken. But the worst part was that he was directly in the path of the zero-pointer. One minute left. Itsuka didn't have time to think, to consider what she was doing as she started sprinting towards the blonde knowing that she'd never be able to reach him in time. Come on, she thought angrily as she pushed her legs harder, reach him. That's all that matters. As if in response to her summons Itsuka felt something inside of her awaken and power like she'd never felt before flowed through her bottom two limbs. If the girl had looked down she would have seen orange veins crawling along the surface of her skin, as if a roaring fire had begun to burn within her. Bending her knees, Itsuka launched herself skyward directly at the massive machine's face pushing off so hard she cracked the ground underneath her forming a large crater in the process. Drawing back her right arm Itsuka forced this foreign power she knew must be one for all into her limb as she increased the size of her hand making it as large as she could while forcing one for all into the appendage as well. As her jump reached its peak making her level with the zero-pointer Itsuka launched her attack throwing a punch at the air in front of her. To the shock of the blonde and examinees below, as well as the teachers looking on through hidden cameras, a massive wall of air seemed to slam into the zero-pointer's faceplate causing the head to crumple like a soda can. As the monster reeled backwards collapsing on its back multiple explosions erupted from its body from the damage Itsuka had caused but said girl had more pressing concerns. As gravity began to regain a hold of her she began the fall to the concrete hundreds of feet below her. Okay primary threat taken out now what do I do the girl wondered suppressing her immediate panic. Itsuka tried to move her limbs but immediately let out a scream of sheer agony. Turning with tears streaming from her eyes the girl found her limbs flopping around uselessly and midair clearly broken. Only her left arm remained intact and her right hand was red but seemed to function unlike the arm it was attached to which like Itsuka's legs were purple in color, twisted at unnatural angles from visibly shattered bones. The pain and power of her new quirk made Itsuka rapidly regret her decision to not accept and train with one for all earlier. If she had she likely wouldn't be in this situation. Hell she might even have some semblance of control over the quirk if she hadn't thought subconsciously that all might had to be exaggerating how powerful it was. Rapidly approaching the ground below Itsuka drew back her left arm ready to draw upon the power of what she was quickly coming to see as the biggest annoyance she would have to deal with in her in an attempt to break her fall. However her actions were unneeded as a sudden explosion below caught her attention. The blonde with the hurt foot had pushed himself to his feet and using his explosions had launched himself skywards. Reaching out towards the boy with her uninjured arm Itsuka felt relieved when she felt their fingers intertwine. The boy pulled her to him and shifted the orange jet to his back, Itsuka's working arm instinctively wrapping around the boy's throat in what could barely classify as a piggyback ride. Once she was secured the blonde boy used his explosions to slow their descent, eventually settling them on the rocky ground. Kneeling down the boy let the injured girl slide off his tone back onto the rough ground below. Knowing she was safe Itsuka let herself fall into unconsciousness, her last thought before she faded out being that she never got her savior's name. Striding home Katsuki Bekugo let out a growl of frustration as he kicked a can lying on the ground sending it bouncing away. Why had he saved the girl it wasn't like him and as much as he wanted to say it had simply been to repay her for saving him Bekugo knew that was untrue. He'd acted on instinct just like Ingdeku although he refused to believe that instincts were the sole driving force behind his actions. Bakugo shook his head driving down the name and image that appeared when he'd said that name a green-haired boy with a wide hopeful smile, and sparkling emerald eyes and a black middle school uniform, a yellow book bag across his back as he scribbled notes down in a worn notebook. The blonde also locked down his mental defenses refusing to acknowledge the heavy feeling rising in his chest choosing instead to focus on what had happened next after he'd saved the girl. 
The old hag who was apparently the school nurse had refused to release him until she'd given him a. Although his wound was now gone, Beck Hugo was exhausted both physically and mentally. He'd done it again, appeared weak needing to be saved by someone else. Katsuki knew he'd done well on the practical. His quirk was practically built for destruction but at the very end when he'd ignored the zero pointer in favor of getting more points he tripped on a piece of scrap and landed wrong spraining his ankle. Talk about anticlimactic and karma catching up to him at the worst possible moment. Walking in the front door of his house he growled a greeting to his parents and briefly answered their questions, dealing with them as fast as he could. All he wanted to do was collapse into his bed and take a nap but the old hag would never let him do that until she was satisfied. After a dozen minutes he finally managed to escape from the two and make his way to his room. Lying down on his bed Katsuki felt the bliss of unconsciousness approaching. Before he faded away though his brain finally realized why he had wanted to save the girl. Falling, her shattered limbs blowing uselessly in the wind. The girl had been weak, defenseless, useless, just like Deku. With the realization the pit in Katsuki's grew just the tiniest bit more before he passed out entering the land of Morpheus. Strolling through the smashed front gates of the Shai Hasekai compound, hands in his pockets as Momo followed behind him attentively. Izuku would have looked to an outside observer as if he was going for a casual walk around the city rather than strolling through an urban battlefield. The Green Eight wasn't sure what to expect as he entered. After all he was merely following his forces, letting them charge ahead to deal with the resistance while he followed along behind them. Gigantamacia led the bullheaded rush, leaving scattered bodies in his wake. As he strolled along the stone path Izuku cast a casual glance to the side taking in the bodies that lay defeated around him. They appeared to come from a wide range of professions and incomes. Some were dressed in casual clothes while others were more formal in well-fitting suits and ties, but all of them shared the same connection, membership in the Yakuza. Some of the defeated members groaned in pain, lying on the ground as they nursed injuries or broken limbs. Others were unconscious, only the rise and fall of their chest testifying to their survival. However even more lay still, too still as pools of formed around them. Scattered among the defeated were various weapons, makeshift clubs and bats, some knives, and even the mangled remains of what was once a gun. Izuku felt a small part of him, deep inside want to reach out, to help the people around him, to be a hero but before the voice could even open its metaphorical mouth the green eat crushed it ruthlessly. He had come too far, spent too much time devoted to searching for the perfect quirk to give up now. For ten months he'd trained for this day and now that it was here Izuku refused to fail. He couldn't, everything depended on his victory. Returning his focus to the path in front of him Izuku saw Gigantamacia lower his shoulder in preparation to charge through the front door of the building. His size likely meaning he would take most of the wall down with him. Around the giant some of Izuku's troops clashed with members of the Shai Hasekai. A quick scan let Izuku know that none of the eight bullets or top brass were nearby, not that Izuku expected them to be. These were the riffraff, the members with no real value other than to serve as living meat shields, time wasters, and errant boys that weakened those who targeted their masters. A loud crash caused Izuku's attention to focus back on the present in time to watch as a large fist emerged from the inside of the building smashing the front doors into wooden splinters before colliding with Gigantamacia's head. The force of the punch swung the giant around but the ex bodyguard didn't go down, instead turning his spin into an attack, the backside of his left palm backhanding the face of his attacker as they emerged from the building. Izuku only had a brief moment to take in the man's appearance, a plague mask completely covering a small head which rested atop a long neck that connected to a giant body all of which seemed to be composed of pure muscle. The man was dressed in a black tank top and jeans but that was all Izuku was able to see before Gigantamacia's counter-attack sent the man, who was still not fully emerged, smashing through the left front side of the house and through the cement wall of the connecting building where he was buried under collapsing rubble. For a moment both sides of the conflict froze in shock both at the power displayed and the pure ease with which Gigantamacia seemed to dispatch his opponent but Izuku, in the brief time he'd seen the figure had been able to identify the man. Riki Akatsu came, he whispered. As if in response to his name a lone hand emerged from the rubble, feeling around for a moment before using ground to push himself out of his stone prison. Ugh, Katsukame groaned, rubbing the back of his head with his hand, that hurt. Looking up, Katsukame pointed at Gigantamacia, seeming to not care about the several dozen attackers that surrounded the titan of a man. You, fight me, the masked man ordered, you're clearly the vanguard and the strongest person here. It's my duty to restrain you for as long as I can. For a moment Gigantamacia looked as if he wanted to accept the challenge, even taking a step forward which caused those below him to scatter to avoid being crushed accidentally. However the man hesitated, casting a glance towards Izuku. For a moment Izuku was confused, the man had made no secret of his belief that Izuku was unworthy of all for one's attention, but then the Green Eight remembered what his injured mentor had told Gigantamacia, that when it came to the raid Izuku was in charge. Gigantamacia might not like the Green Eight, but Izuku had to at least acknowledge the man's loyalty to his master. Basically abandoned in a forest for years on end the man had emerged with just as much devotion to his lord as he had before his imposed vacation. Make it fast and don't kill him. Izuku ordered, his voice ringing out with authority over the courtyard. 
Katsukame's a member of the Eight Bullets, one of the people I want captured for later, and you'll be more useful to me inside than you will outside. For a moment Izuku wondered if the temporary servant would obey him before the man lowered his head submissively although Izuku could practically feel his resentment even from across the courtyard. As you command, Gigantamesha practically growled before turning back to charge towards the first member of the eight bullets to appear. Katsukame didn't wait for the giant to reach him, instead charging forward to meet the titan in battle. The two behemoths clashed halfway between the stone path that led up to the entrance to the residence, and the attached building that Katsukame had been sent flying through only moments before. The two exchanged a flurry of blows at blinding speed before stepping back to see the damage inflicted on their opponent. Gigantamesha appeared to have taken no damage whatsoever. No bruises were forming on his tough hide and the man's outfit which consisted of his black shorts and similarly colored protective armor that encircled the giant's shoulders and upper arms was undamaged. The giant was breathing rapidly but it seemed to be more from the excitement of the fight rather than any actual need to. In comparison Katsukame's breaths came in short, rapid bursts. The man's tank top was wrinkled and ripped with several clear impressions in the fabric in the shape of fists from where Gigantamesha's attacks had impacted him. As Izuku watched a trail of leaked out from under the man's mask, flowing down the man's neck before being wiped away with the backside of one of his arms. The movement was unconscious, reactionary, instinctive but it was a movement Gigantamesha took full advantage of. Dashing forward at speeds that defied his size the giant wrapped his arms around the smaller man's waist. Lifting the member of the eight bullets aloft as he continued his forward charge the two figures plowing into the same building Gigantamesha had sent Katsukame flying into mere minutes before just to the left of said hole spraying dust, and rubble flying into the air behind them. Thumps, crashes, and thuds led Izuku and all those who'd stopped to watch the fight that the battle was still going on. And if the cracks that were spreading on the outside of the building were anything to go by, was actually endangering the structure's integrity. If Izuku didn't know any better he would have had Gigantamesha retreat. The giant's victory over his opponent was inconsequential if the giant buried overhaul, and his other followers under tons of concrete and stone. However Izuku spies both old and new had given him the same information, that the buildings were nothing more than false flags meant to waste time. The real base was underground, an intricate network of tunnels that stretched for miles throughout the city. Ignore the battle and let's go Izuku shouted, turning his followers' attention from the titan's brawl to himself. Charging forward Momo on his heels Izuku dodged under a club's swing not even bothering to counter-attack as he pressed forward, his men following behind him. Only a grunt of pain and the thumping of a body let Izuku know that Momo had done what he did not but Izuku ignored the Ravneet's actions, his attention entirely focused on reaching the hidden entrance inside. The doorway the two entered through opened into a long hallway decorated in the traditional Japanese style with wooden floors, blank walls a grayish, green in color. Thankfully the hallway was deserted, if Izuku had to guess Chisaki had sent out most of the expendables to deal with Izuku's forces only to be defeated almost instantly by Gigantamesha. Sure there were some remnants still clashing in the courtyard but most of Izuku's men had followed Izuku into the building a quick glance over his shoulder told Izuku he had around 40 of the original 6 to 2 the others either defeated or engaged with the Hasekai's remaining forces outside. Charging down the hallway Izuku slid to a stop in front of a small alcove with a simple black porcelain vase with flowers inside. Lifting the vase Izuku, haphazardly tossed the item to the side, an annoyed protest letting him know that he'd almost hit one of his men with the throw. Ignoring the noise, Izuku concentrated pressing down on the wooden floorboards the vase had hidden in a specific sequence, careful not to make a single mistake. His spies hadn't told him what would happen if he did and the green eat would rather not find out. After pushing down on the last board Izuku stepped back, balancing on the of his feet ready to attack, defend, or dodge at a moment's notice. Beside the green-haired boy Momo's right hand emerged from the depths of her cloak a small throwing knife in hand although only Izuku knew that the girl had likely made it on the spot. Behind the two, dozens of small-time villains braced themselves waiting for their boss's orders. A small click resounded down the hall and the tension rose as the alcove slid backwards on hidden tracks before sliding to the left revealing a secret entrance to the gathered crowd. A simple set of stairs led downwards into the earth. There were no lights and the illumination from the hallway ended before the stairs did leaving the rest cloaked in shadows and darkness. Izuku turned towards his Momo, his masked friend giving him a silent nod of encouragement. Taking a deep breath Izuku exhaled before confidently descending the steps, showing no trace of the nervousness that had begun to rise within him. Momo followed behind him and after exchanging looks their gathered men did as well. When the last man entered the hidden doorway emerged from its hiding spot sliding to the right and forward where it locked into place, leaving no sign of the entrance it hid. It was as if the entire group had disappeared into thin air. Meanwhile, Overhaul let out a growl as he stalked through the underground halls of his base, Chronostasis following loyally behind him like a white shadow. 
The man had been quieter the last few days but Kai knew it was likely due to him finally beginning his operations on Eri. He had known the man for years and not once had Chronostasis given him any reason to doubt his loyalty. The man hadn't even argued with Kai's plan to use Eri to manufacture bullets that would destroy quirks despite the methods needed to do so. Out of the hundreds of people spread throughout Japan that worked for the Shai Hasekai and subsequently for him only Chronostasis had Kai's full trust. The two had been through too much together, fought too many battles side by side not to. Even when Kai had put the boss into his coma chrono had remained faithfully by him not once questioning his decision. The only other person who could maybe say they had Kai's trust was Joy Iranaka, more commonly known as Mimic. The general manager of the organization Joy was the one who organized the subordinates and implemented Kai's plan through them. Kai might be the leader but Joy was the one who held the members' loyalty especially with the boss's absence. Although Kai knew that Mimic suspected him for the boss's current state just as much as the others did. However Mimic was also the member most committed to restoring the Yakuza to their former glory besides himself. It helped the two reach an understanding. However that didn't mean the man knew the full extent of what Kai had planned, no one did. Kai hadn't wanted to do it, go against the man he respected and owed so much to but the boss hadn't given him a choice. Eri was the key to everything, restoring the Hasekai's power, money, reputation all of it could be done through her but the boss had refused. Kai could still remember what he'd said, the man to whom chivalry was everything. If you do this Chisaki, you won't be human anymore. Your chivalry, your honor, will be dead. No one's going to follow someone like that, a demon without a heart. Am I human anymore Kai asked himself in his head. He could still remember that dump of a beach he'd lived in after being abandoned as a child. Scavenging for food and scraps from dumpsters and trash bins. Begging on street corners cold and wet as rain poured down on him from above. Then one day meeting the boss hearing those words as Kai squinted in the harsh sunlight trying to make out the facial features of the man before him. What's your name? The boss had taken him in, raised him, given him a purpose. Kai owed him everything. He'd lived by the boss's code of chivalry just as all the others had but no matter what happened, no matter what steps they took the Hasekai continued to decline. Membership went down, less money was coming in, and new names began to become bolder as they attacked the Yakuza's borders in the hopes of claiming their territory. Kai had tried to stop it, he'd fought the invaders driving them back again and again only for new ones to take their place. He'd recruited the eight bullets and started selling drugs despite it going against the boss's chivalry, his code. The boss had confronted him about his actions time and time again but for all his protest he hadn't told Kai to stop, he knew how much the money was needed. However even with the new members, the drug money coming in, and Kai's quirk it seemed as if the shy Hasekai were doomed, faded to fade away just like all the other Yakuza. Then she'd appeared, like an angel from on high. Kai had been called in to see the boss who'd showed him a live camera feed on his computer of a girl sitting on a bed in the hospital wing of the base, her short white hair hanging down in light waves to her shoulders with downcast crimson eyes and a small horn, more of a bump really, on the right side of her forehead. This is Ari, my granddaughter, the boss had said, voice weary and tired but still with the same undertone of strength, that Kai knew the man possessed in spades. My stupid daughter abandoned her. My husband died, the girl is cursed, those were her exact words. The boss sighed as he rubbed at his temple with his right hand leaning back in his chair to look up at the ceiling. Apparently, one day, when her husband reached for the child, his whole body vanished. Her quirk manifested, one that doesn't take after either side of the family. It's no curse, it's a mutation. I hear they're extremely rare but it happens. Kai, the boss sat up to look at the boy in a black doctor's mask before him. Iri doesn't know what her quirk does or how to use it. She doesn't even know what she did to her father, all she knows is that her mother abandoned her for seemingly no reason to me, a grandfather she has little to no memories of. The boss had locked his firm, unyielding gaze on Kai as he spoke his orders. Look after her, her quirk is similar to your own and investigate it while you're at it. I know you're good at that kind of stuff. Kai had done as the man he viewed as a father asked, hiding himself away in his lab researching the white-haired girl's quirk. It had taken him days to get said quirk to work and weeks to fully understand what it was but once he had the possibilities hit him like a wave. As he watched the mice in their cage regress first to juveniles, then children, followed by babies and then fetuses, before finally fading away into nothingness Kai couldn't help the cruel grin that spread across his face as he understood that fate had given him everything he needed. After all, with a quirk like hers, almost anything was possible. Shaking off the memories Kai focused back on Chronostasis, what's happening he questioned. Although his voice was slightly muffled by the magenta plague mask embroidered and tipped in gold that covered his nose and mouth. We aren't sure, Chronostasis responded, his voice calm. The two had been at the far side of the base preparing to leave for a cash run when the tunnel had shaken around them. Chronostasis had immediately leapt protectively over Kai as pieces of the ceiling collapsed to the ground around them. Once the shaking had stopped the two had gotten up and Chronostasis had immediately pulled out one of Yeirazu Inc.'s tablets, quickly tapping away at it. It looks like explosions are going off all over the city and... Chrono's voice trailed off as Kai turned to cast a glare at his lieutenant. And what he hissed. The lower members that guard the main entrance say we're being raided, as in right now. 
Ricky has already gone up to fight them and the other eight bullets are hunkering down while Joy's going to get a supply of trigger. Only Nomoto's unaccounted for. Kai nodded as he began to walk away his pace noticeably faster than before. Good. Nomoto's doing some scouting for me at the moment on a gang that's been getting a little too aggressive for my liking. Tell the bullets to delay the attackers as long as they can. Are there any standout members in the raid party? Not really, Chrono said, swiping at the tablet with a finger as he walked behind the boss, completely focused on the device. The only real noticeable people so far is a man with a gigantification quirk but Ricky is likely going to end up dealing with him. Otherwise there are reports of someone in a black cloak with a kabuki mask shaped like a kitsune. Their leader seems to be young and have green hair but that's all we've got on him. All the other members though are just common criminals but at the moment they are overpowering our forces mainly due to their vanguard, the man with the gigantification quirk. Kai didn't answer, instead only picking up his pace so Chrono had to jog to keep up with the young Yakuza boss, so, what's the plan he asked? Gettery, get my research, and get out of here while the others buy us time to escape. Kai responded not even taking time to spare his assistant a glance. As long as we have Eri in my notes we can rebuild somewhere else. Oh, and call Joy. Tell him what we're doing and that as soon as we're far enough away I want him to retreat with any of the bullets he can get. We'll contact Nomoto later. As Chrono pulled out a phone and punched in a number Kai stalked forward. He didn't know who was attacking or what their goal was but it didn't matter. Between Eri and his quirk nothing could stop the shy Hasekai from returning to their rightful place as the rulers of the underworld. Not even the Boogaman the boss had told him about, the one the old man feared was still alive, plotting his vengeance in the shadows. The monarch of darkness who disappeared years ago, after his defeat at the hands of All Might, all for one. A few minutes later, Gigantamesha let out a savage roar as he swiped a massive arm at his opponent. Katsukame took the blow and just like before Gigantamesha felt a bit of his vitality slip away from him. Clenching his teeth in frustration the giant stepped back, breaking the two's connection. As all for one's former bodyguard watched, Katsukame's size increased as the already giant man grew another half foot in height, his muscles bulking up right alongside him. Gigantamesha wasn't feeling any ill effects from the vitality Katsukame stole from him, likely due to his original quirk, but it was still a pain to deal with. The two's battle had dragged on for nearly a dozen minutes and Gigantamesha was beginning to become annoyed. He might not consider his master's heir worthy of his title but his lord had given him an order to obey him and to Gigantamesha his lord's command wasn't something he would willingly disobey. The Greenite had ordered Gigantamesha to make the battle quick but it was beginning to become anything but the simple problem was that the two's quirks were essentially counters for each other. Rikia Katsukame's quirk, vitality stealing allowed the man to siphon away his opponent's stamina by inhaling their strength away from them. Said vitality would then be added to his own increasing the man's size and strength in the process with the simple requirement that Katsukame needing to be touching his target for his quirk to be able to steal the person's vitality something 8 bullets member had no problem doing in his very physical battle with Gigantamesha. Speaking of the man, Gigantamesha's primary quirk, endurance, allowed the giant to transform his morale into physical energy and stamina. The more driven he was the more his strength grew and with a seemingly endless loyalty to the villain he followed that morale provided the giant with the ability to grow his already immense strength to titanic proportions. This stalemate had meant that the battle that Gigantamesha had thought would be over in seconds had dragged on and on. The building they'd begun their fight in had long since collapsed, not even lasting a full minute once the two had begun their brawl inside. The collapse had caused the only recess in their fight so far as it had taken time for even Gigantamesha to force his way out of the tons of concrete and cement that had buried the two. Now the two battled in the streets a massive trail of destruction in their wake with shattered windows, crushed vehicles, and the bodies of the few heroes and first responders that had stumbled across them. There would have been more but the bombs had sent civilians fleeing to safety and was still the main focus of all those who would otherwise be trying to stop their battle. Letting out a growl Gigantamesha leaned to the side to avoid a punch stepping back to create more space. If he had been allowed to go all out the battle would already be over but he had conditions, rules he had to follow. He had been forbidden from revealing that he had multiple quirks and while it had made his task more difficult it was still more than possible for him to fight. Then his master's heir had ordered the capture of the man before him. Gigantamesha didn't know why but his master had told him to follow the boy as if the green eats orders came from his lord himself. If he was allowed to use multiple quirks the battle would be over. If he was allowed to kill his opponent the battle would be over. But no it wasn't and as a result Gigantamesha was becoming impatient. Master's heir had ordered him to end the battle swiftly and he fully intended to do just that. It was at that moment an idea struck Gigantamesha causing the titan man to bear a fanged grin. As Katsukame charged forward launching a punch at Gigantamesha said man leaned backwards stretching his right arm backwards and activated one of the quirks his lord had given him, Maul. 
As mole-like claws grew from his fingers Gigantomatia dug said claws into the road, the tough, hardened keratin easily penetrating the asphalt. Swiping his arm through the ground and upwards Gigantomatia launched rubble towards his opponent causing Katsukame to stop his attack in order to cover his face. Most of the rubble bounced off but it still did damage, however the attack served as the distraction Gigantomatia needed to go on the attack. Deactivating Mole Gigantomatia launched himself at his opponent as he activated another one of his quirks, Tough Muscle. Said quirk hardened the giant's muscles to exceptional levels and Gigantomatia used that to his full advantage launching a frenzy of punches at the still defending Katsukame. Cuts appeared all over the muscular man's body and it was all the masked man could do to keep his arms up to protect his face. Drawing back his arm Gigantomatia launched a punch at Katsukame's unprotected midsection which finally broke through the man's defense and sent the man flying backwards where he lay prone on the ground. Thinking the man unconscious, Gigantomatia turned away only for a weak voice to reach his enhanced senses. Your quirk isn't gigantification, is it Katsukame asked from the ground. Gigantomatia didn't answer as the defeated man let out a small laugh, it's a body modification quirk isn't it you can manipulate your body, make yourself stronger, change your appearance. That's how you grew during our fight, how you got those claws, why your skin and muscles were so tough. How the man let out a bitter chuckle, you were holding out on me the entire time. A soft thump let Gigantomatia know that the man's wounds had become too much for him and that he'd finally fallen unconscious. Though he didn't show it Gigantomatia felt proud on the inside for what he'd done and how his plan had worked especially since he wasn't the smartest individual. He'd followed his master's command and hadn't revealed he had multiple quirks, instead making it appear as if he had a single quirk that allowed him to manipulate his body. Though uncommon such quirks weren't rare by any standard and though they only normally allowed the user to change one aspect of their body there were those that allowed the user to manipulate multiple parts. Gigantomatia had gotten the idea from his gigantification quirk which not only increased his size, but also caused his bones to grow as well as his teeth and fingers to give him increased attack and defense power. Gigantomatia had used said quirk in his fight with Katsukame to grow right alongside his opponent, and it was that quirk that served as the inspiration for his plan. Shaking off his self-congratulations Gigantomatia let his quirks deactivate as he activated another one, Dog. Sniffing the air like the animal the quirk was named after Gigantomatia tried to find the scent of Master's heir or the girl who'd been with him. He had been ordered to return as soon as possible and though it had taken longer than he'd like Gigantomatia had no intention of failing in his duty. A few minutes earlier, Joy Iranaka more commonly referred to as Mimic clicked the end call button on his phone with a growl. For a second he stared at the small black device before letting out a frustrated scream as he smashed the handheld computer into the ground shattering it. Jumping up and down on the remains did little to calm the man within the small black suit with a white plague mask sewn over where the face would be. Breathing heavily Mimic stretched his tiny arms out placatingly as he began to mutter to himself, it's okay, it's okay, we can fix this. This isn't the end of the Yakuza, we can still realize boss's dream. However despite his words Mimic couldn't keep his thoughts from wandering back to the phone call he'd just had. Chrono had ordered Mimic to keep the attackers occupied with the help of the eight bullets while he, overhaul, and Eri made their escape. Mimic could forgive such behavior if not for one thing. The trio were not going to be taking boss with them. Like the other members of the Shai Hasekai, Mimic knew that Overhaul was almost certainly the one responsible for the boss's current state. He had gone in to see the boss who had been in perfect health and when he'd come out the boss had been comatose. No matter what they did they were unable to wake the man up and it was at that point Shisaki had taken up the position as head of the organization donning the name Overhaul as well. The Yakuza, despite their actions which more often than not were on the other side of the law, did not see themselves as villains. They possessed honor, integrity something most villains did not and yet Chisaki, or Overhaul as he was now known, seemed content to toss the boss's ideals aside in favor of returning the Hasekai to power. While some had protested Overhaul had been quick to silence those who opposed him his quirk allowed him to torture and kill dissenters before reassembling them just to do it all over again. He had made examples out of his opposition and did not hesitate to kill his underlings for failure. Fear made them loyal and Overhaul was someone to be feared. However within the change of leadership Joy Iranaka had seen opportunity. Unlike the lower members of the Hasekai, Iranaka served as the general manager of the organization in charge of funding, and general day-to-day -day leadership of the Yakuza. As a result Iranaka, like Overhaul, knew that the Hasekai had been declining all across the board be it funding, recruiting, territory, membership, or even business. Yakuza were dying out and the underworld knew it. Brokers and criminals didn't want to do business with those who might not be there to supply them in the future so they turned their attention, and their wallets elsewhere. The boss, for all his preaching about honor, did nothing to fix the decline, insisting that things would get better in time even as the Hasekai began to collapse. Then Overhaul had taken control. Overhaul had done the things boss had been unwilling to do and despite the protest of the lower level members Iranaka knew that under Overhaul the Hasekai, at the very least, stood a chance at persevering and surviving. 
Joy respected the boss and would always consider the man to be the one he truly followed and it was that loyalty that drove him to follow Overhaul, the man who had in all likelihood acted against the boss. The boss loved the shy Hasekai, it was his life project, the thing he devoted himself to for years nurturing it and growing it like a garden or a flower. However as the flower wilted and died, poisoned by weeds the gardener seemed unable to uproot Joy had turned to the one who could solve the problem even if it went against what the gardener wanted. The man who held the weed killer the gardener refused to use a fear of it poisoning the flower. Donning the name Mimic, Iranaka had convinced the lower members to follow Overhaul, something made easier by their already massive fear of the man. The Hasekai had then expanded into drugs something the boss had refused to get into but Mimic as the general manager had begun to see money, and clients trickled back in. Seeing those numbers rise had almost brought the man to tears, it had been proof that the Hasekai were not yet gone, that they still had a chance. Mimic had sworn to serve Overhaul to rebuild the Hasekai to what it had once been to restore the power, influence, and coffers that they had lost over the years. Even if the process to do so went against the boss's wishes Mimic had sworn to restore the Hasekai before having Overhaul fix the boss. Mimic had no delusions that the boss would be happy with him, or even allow him to stay a member. He had betrayed not only the man but his ideals, the honor the man preached about to those under him. However even if it cost him his position not only as general manager but as a member of the Hasekai itself Mimic would be able to leave with pride, having given the man who'd taken him off the streets a dream come true. Mimic, unlike the members under him, was aware of how much the boss meant to overhaul. He knew about the young man's past and was one of the few that knew that Overhaul still visited the boss's comatose body on a daily basis. The man despite his actions against the boss was still loyal to him, owing a debt he considered impossible to repay. Knowing that all of Overhaul's actions were done out of a twisted sense of loyalty had made it slightly easier for Mimic to follow him as he would hazard a guess that just like him Overhaul intended to rebuild the Hasekai before restoring the boss to health and begging him for forgiveness. But now, now Overhaul intended to leave the boss behind as he fled. Mimic had no problem offering himself up as a sacrificial pawn alongside the eight bullets if it meant that the boss would get away along with Overhaul and the others but no Overhaul intended to flee leaving the boss behind at the invader's mercy. If it were heroes Mimic would be able to understand. Heroes for all the corruption and fakes that ran among them would not kill a comatose man, it went against the very nature of what they stood for and represented. Their current attackers however, the ones they knew nothing about, might not be so willing to leave the boss alive. Yet Overhaul still intended to leave the boss behind. Pulling a syringe from a hidden pocket of his suit Mimic looked down at the murky purple liquid inside. Trigger, a quirk-enhancing drug band in Japan, was the primary source of income for the shy Hasekai as well as the main drug the group had begun to deal after the boss had fallen into his coma. Plunging the syringe into the side of his neck Mimic pressed down on the plunger forcing the drug inside his body. The effect was immediate as the black suit Joy was inside of ripped apart as the man forced himself out of it. Trembling Mimic fell against the wall leaning against it to support himself before turning around to press his back into the metal surface, as he sank into the wall disappearing inside of it. He would find the invaders and defeat them before overhaul. The man who could save the boss, fled. He would protect the boss, after all, everything was for him. Back in the present, Izuku, Momo, and the forty or so odd villains that were following them ran down the pristine halls of the base. Thankfully after descending down the darkened stairwell the space had opened out into an illuminated pristine hallway, the very one that the group was now running down. How are we doing Izuku yelled over his shoulder at Momo, turning his head to look at the Ravenet girl. We're going the right way. Momo called back, her attention focused on the device she was holding in her hands. Good, we need to get to overhaul before he escapes. If he does, he'll disappear and we'll lose our chance to get him. Take a right, Momo commanded Izuku, following her directions without question. However as the group rounded the corner the ground began to shake. A wall appeared from nowhere cutting off the group's path forward as the floor and walls seemed to shift and flow bumps appearing, and disappearing seemingly at random. For a moment Izuku was confused, no one in the shy Hasekai that he was aware of was capable of something like this and in that confusion a second wall rose up from the floor behind the group entrapping the invaders. The closest was probably overhaul but the surroundings weren't breaking apart before reforming they were moving, twisting and turning as if they were being directed by hidden commands. It's Mimic Izuku yelled out, extending a hand against the nearby wall to keep himself standing up. He's the only one whose quirk is capable of doing something like this. The shy Hasekai are known for their recent increase in drug distribution, Momo added from where she knelt with a knee on the floor. One hand gripped the electronic device she'd been holding in her hands while the other clutched a sword she'd planted into the ground to remain upright, likely having created it on the spot. It's likely he's using a quirk booster to increase his powers for a limited time, probably trigger. That means he's around here somewhere, Izuku said as he and the others began to look around. His quirk says that while he's inside something he is able to control it but he has to manifest his body to be able to perceive his surroundings. It also means, Momo said as she reached inside her cloak, likely creating something to use, that he has to focus his attention right here, he can't be elsewhere. 
What's that mean? One of the small-time villains with a simple fire-breathing quirk asked, clearly confused. It means that we need to split up, Momo said as she withdrew her arm from her cloak, drawing it back as if preparing to throw away. A small object the size of a base sat in the palm of her hand but before Izuku could get a good look at it Momo brought her arm forward throwing it at the wall that had cut off their path with a grunt. A massive explosion rang out sending small chunks of metal and concrete flying. The force of the blast sent all those who'd been able to remain standing falling to the floor including Izuku. Ears ringing, Izuku slowly pushed himself to his feet, stumbling a bit to maintain his balance. Dust surrounded him but he could vaguely make out Momo who was waving her arms at him frantically. Her mask had been damaged leaving her mouth exposed as Izuku was watching it move up and down. What Izuku asked, cupping a hand to his ear as he squinted at the rave net. I'm sorry I can't hear you, he said, gesturing to his right ear. Momo ran forward and grabbed his arm, before starting to drag Izuku along behind her towards the newly made hole in the wall that had cut off their path. Just before they passed through it the ground began to shift once more and a push in the small of his back was all the warning Izuku had as he was sent falling forward through the hole. Turning around Izuku just had time to catch sight of the mask over Momo's face before the hole in the wall disappeared. Rolling on the ground Izuku came up on his backside and groaning pushed himself to his feet. Looking back at the wall Izuku could see the surface shifting but the hallway around him seemed solid, at least at the moment. I guess Iranaka can only manipulate a limited area at the time even with a quirk booster, Izuku muttered to himself. Taking a step towards the wall Izuku felt his shoe bump against something. Looking down the green ate caught sight of the device Momo had been using to get the party along. On the screen of the device was displayed a network of connecting tunnels and a blinking green dot showed Izuku over Hall's current location. Doing a quick mental comparison of the map to the city above him Izuku froze as he realized how close overhaul was to a likely exit point in the city's lower district where it would be easy for someone to disappear. Izuku had a choice and for a moment he stood frozen glancing between the device and the wall Momo had pushed him through. The decision was soon made but as Izuku took a step towards the wall the image of Momo's mouth as she dragged him towards the hole in the wall came back to him only this time the greenie could make out what the girl was saying. Trust me, I can take care of myself. You just make sure to deal with overhaul. Pausing midstep Izuku closed his eyes as he let out a groan of complaint although only he heard it. Fine, I'll trust you but if you're injured when I get back I'm going to kill you so screaming. Izuku took off running, reaching down to scoop up the tracker as he began to track down the man whose quirk he desired. Iranaka watched the green eight who seemed to be the leader of the attackers take off down the hallway. His eyes locked onto the strange device the masked woman had tossed through the hole as she pushed him. Although the general manager would have preferred to keep all the intruders together, letting one slip through wasn't the end of the world since he wouldn't be able to do anything by himself. Overhaul was just that strong. So thinking the man turned his attention back to his captives. While it was tempting to attempt to just crush them all, the problem remained that he was simply unaware of what the invaders were capable of. The common saying was if you can think of it, there's a quirk for it, and Mimic was capable of thinking of quite a few quirks that could counter him and his abilities. The other problem was the trigger, he could already feel the effect of the drug beginning to slow down and though there was no immediate sign of it right now, within the next few minutes, the area he was capable of manipulating would begin to shrink. It was imperative that if he acted he did so right now. Raising a wall mimic separated the group again leaving the woman in the broken kabuki mask with about a third of the invaders. The other two thirds were trapped on the other side of the wall with only a single wall separating them from the hallway leading back to the stairs. It was like an E with the woman in the kabuki mask and those trapped with her being a wall away from pressing onwards while the majority were a wall away from being able to retreat. However, Mimic wasn't done yet. Manipulating the floor below the woman in the mask Mimic turned the area immediately underneath her into a slide. The woman didn't even scream as she fell but Mimic didn't care, focused on directing her where she needed to go. It was obvious that the masked woman and the boy with green hair were the leaders of the attackers so by separating them from the others Mimic would be free to deal with their followers in the limited time he had left before the trigger wore off. Momo emerged from her impromptu slide in a roll. Coming up on her knees she was already creating a shield and that more than anything saved her life. A fist coated in what appeared to be diamond smashed into the shield and though it vibrated at the blow the shield held. Creating a rapier Momo slashed blindly at her attacker forcing whoever it was to leap away. Lowering her shield, Momo cast a quick glance to see who she was facing and couldn't help but grit her teeth at what she saw. Standing in front of her in a rough half-circle were six individuals who she recognized as members of the Eight Bullets. Directly in front of her was a bald man in a white surgical mask. He wore a dark dress shirt, the top few buttons left undone, and plain white pants, along with a pair of black dress shoes. However the thing that proved his identity were the crystals that covered his lower arms and fists identifying the man as Yu Hojo. To Hojo's left was a very large, muscular man with long, light brown hair. His face was hidden beneath a black plague mask with white eye holes. He was clothed in a tattered t-shirt and dark pants covered by a light blue tunic and decorated with two belts. He wore what appeared to be improvised gloves which covered his hands and wrists with several leather straps and his knuckles with metal. 
the former underground fighter Kendo Rappa. On Rappa's left was a tall, slim man with short, spiky hair ash blonde in color. He wore a traditional black-colored yukata with a pair of geta on his feet, and a long gray piece of cloth that acted as a belt around his waist. Covering his face was a plague mask, his being a plain brown one worn strapped to his face with three belts, one down his forehead and one on each side of his face that also covered his ears, like mufflers. The newest member of the group, Hekaji Tengai. The man to Tengai's left wasn't standing tall like the others but rather leaning drunkenly against the wall as he drank from a bottle of sake. A very skinny and bony but muscular man with greasy black long hair, reaching just below his shoulders. The drunk wore nothing but a furry vest and dark pants with black shoes. His plague mask was gray and rather plain although the eyes seemed to be drains if the way the sake was seeping through them was anything to go by. The Eight Bullets resident drunk, Deidoro Sakaki. Going back to Hojo, the man with the crystals there were two more individuals on the man's right. On the man's far right, and Momo's far left was an individual dressed in a purple dress shirt and gray pants with black loafers. He wore a ragged burlap sack mask that covered his entire head and was held by a rope knot located around the man's neck. The mask has two openings from where his eyes were visible, and a stitched in smile that seemed to extend almost to where the man's ears would be. Momo tensed upon recognizing the man as he was someone Izuku considered to be one of the most dangerous members of the Hasekai through no fault of his own. The man who was unable to stop eating and one Izuku thought might one day be driven to cannibalism by his quirk, Soramitsu Tabe. Standing between Tabe and Hojo the last individual was a tall and lean young man with chin-length hair, a bright golden blonde color, parted to the left so that it obscured the man's right eye. He wore a dark green dress shirt with black pants tied around his waist by a brown belt, and a brown plague mask covered the man's nose and mouth. Seeming to be the leader of the group if the way the man stepped forward Momo aimed the tip of her rapier at the man known as Toya Satsuno. Oi, 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 Missy, Satsuno said, holding out his hands placatingly, there's no need for that. Besides, a sudden pull caused Momo to lose control of her shield which flew off her arm and into Satsuno's hand. If you aren't careful someone might get hurt. Momo grit her teeth under her mask, the Ravenet was in trouble. One or two, maybe even three of them she could probably handle depending on who it was but six of the eight bullets even she had to admit that they were out of her league. She would fight but eventually she'd be overwhelmed, falling before them. As the eight bullets began to advance Momo stuck her hand inside her robe and activated her creation quirk. I don't want to say it, but it's over for the Hasekai. Chrono said as he followed over Hall down the otherwise deserted corridor with Iri clutched tightly in his arms. Over the last few months since the last time Iri's quirk had gone out of control and Kai had been forced to disassemble her to force her quirk to deactivate the girl's horn had grown, and now stood about the size of a young bull. Chrono had been there as Kai had recorded the growth data comparing it to how quickly her quirk had taken to recharge the last time it had activated, and the news was concerning to both of them. The time between when Eri's quirk forcefully activated remained about the same but the power each time it went out of control was increasing. So far four members had been rewound to before they existed and if this continued there would be more. Chrono had even suggested some quirk training to get the quirk partially under the girl's control but Kai had vehemently refused. I don't want her to have any control over her curse, the man had explained as he looked at Chrono across the desk in the seat the boss had once sat in. If she has control of her quirk then she can weaponize it, use it on us. It's better to just let it go out of control every few months and wait for the fit to pass. Besides I just need her body, I don't need her to be sane or in control. As long as she's alive all my goals are possible. Even if we get out of here this attack has as good as finished us. Others will come racing to take our territory, territory that even with your quirk we won't be able to defend with our lack of numbers. It's fine, Overhaul said, his voice calm even as dust fell from the ceiling from the battles going on above them. As long as the boss and I are here, the Hasekai won't die. Most of the underlings follow him and don't understand my thinking even though I'm the one who respects boss will the most. Between me and Eri we can rebuild no matter what state we're in and eventually we will reclaim our rightful place in the underworld. The two walked in silence for another minute or two until a voice rang out behind them. C-H-I-S-A-K-I-I-I turning the two found themselves facing a green-haired boy in a black t-shirt, and similarly colored dress pants. The boy was gasping clearly having been running after the two as he used the back of his hand to wipe the sweat from his face. Behind the boy the two could make out a small electronic device, some kind of tracker most likely. Who are you Chisaki asked, his voice calm although Chrono was able to detect the undertone of anger in it. Chisaki clearly recognized that this green-haired boy was the one mentioned by Chrono as leading the attack which had not only broken through their defenses, but destroyed years of work in the progress. My name doesn't matter, the green eat said as he let out a breath he'd been holding before taking a fighting stance, balancing on the of his feet. What does matter is that today is the day I take everything from you to help me achieve my goals, and I do mean everything. Chrono, go on ahead. Kai ordered as he began to use one of his gloves to pull the other off his left hand. This will only take a moment. With a bow Chrono turned and began to walk away leaving Izuku Midoriya, the heir to all for one and Kai Chisaki, the acting head of the shy Hasekai to face each other alone. 
Momoye Irazu reeled backwards, stumbling over her own feet in an effort to retain her balance as the ground seemed to tilt underneath her. Looking up a flicker of movement was all the warning she had to dodge to the side causing the three throwing knives that would have struck her to instead go wide. However the knives didn't miss completely as Momo's dodge had been more of a drunken stumble out of the way of the attack rather than an expertly executed evasion. The knives leaving deep cuts on the right side of her cloak exposing the pale alabaster skin of the midriff underneath. Momo's attackers didn't give the girl a chance to recover, instead the ravenette was forced to duck underneath the diamond-encrusted fist that passed through the space her head had occupied just moments before. Thrusting her right hand forward, palm open, Momo crafted a staff, the steel pole smashing into the exposed throat of Yu Hojo. The bald man with a simple white surgical mask collapsed to the floor clutching at his neck, the crystals that comprised the man's quirk shattering into sparkling dust as his quirk deactivated. The man's convulsions brought Momo a few seconds and she quickly retreated backwards creating space between her and her attackers using the brief respite to analyze her situation and surroundings. She was in what appeared to be a large training room, tan tatami mats covering the floors and brown protective padding coated the wooden walls, the kind you would find in a gym or exercise room. Large fluorescent light strips were set at evenly spaced intervals in the ceiling and flooded the room with artificial light. There were two doors in the room, a simple metal one to her right that was likely a storage room or supply closet, and a more traditional sliding door in front of her made out of rice paper that was decorated with various scenes of nature. The latter was likely the exit to the room but a simple obstacle kept her from reaching it. Between her and the door were six of the eight precepts of death, five if you ignored the man writhing about in pain on the floor. Speaking of the precepts the monk was crouching down over Hojo seemingly to check on the man's condition. Standing to the right of the two from Momo's perspective was the drunk Sakaki who, as Momo watched, took a swig from his bottle of sake. To the left of the duo was taped the man in a mock scarecrow mask whose quirk let him eat anything. The last two members of the precept stood in front of Hojo and Tengai Kendo Rappa smashed his hands together, and even from across the room Momo could practically feel the man's battle lust leaking out. However her teeth ground together when her eyes finally landed on the seeming acting leader of the group Toya Satsuno. As she watched the blonde man casually swung the rapier she'd created when she had first been dropped into the room around testing the saber out. Momo's shield lay discarded behind her. The mobile defense having been severely damaged upon receiving a single punch from Rappa the man's attack had been so strong it left a physical imprint on the metal face of the shield in the rough shape of the man's fist. A slight tug on her newly crafted staff had the ravenette tightening her grip around the metal pole. However her efforts were in vain it was as if the pole had been scrubbed in butter and despite her best efforts the girl could only watch angrily as the staff left her hand floating over to Setsuo's free outstretch one. The man closed his left hand around the staff the second it hit his palm and swung the weapon around a few times experimentally before tossing it aside. The staff bounced off the floor for a second before it began to roll, only stopping when it impacted the wall next to the exit door where it came to rest. Ah, 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 the blonde chided, wagging his finger as if he was scolding a misbehaving child. We don't want any of that now so be a good girl and keep those weapons stored away in whatever pocket you keep pulling them out of. Let her summon them, the ex-underground fighter Rappa ordered as he cracked his knuckles. It makes the fight that much more fun. You know what the young master ordered Rappa, the monk Tekaji said looking up from Hojo's body which had finally stopped writhing about although Momo could still see the occasional twitch from the man. We are to deal with those who stand out and buy him time until we are ordered to retreat. Yeah, yeah, but we are dealing with her, the man complained, gesturing in Momo's direction as he turned to look at Tekaji. I want to fight her but it won't be any fun if Satsuno keeps taking her weapons while Sakaki, here Rappa gestured to the man drinking from his bottle of sake, makes her too unbalanced to fight back. We are obeying the young master's command, Tekaji hissed. Overhaul gave us orders. Screw the orders Rappa yelled, turning to face the man who created a yellow protective barrier around himself, and Hojo, seemingly ready to protect the two of them from the wrath of their own teammate if needed. I haven't had a decent fight in ages so don't get involved in this one. Fine. Satsuno's voice rang out, the two turning to face him. Go ahead Rappa, fight the girl. I promise that none of us will get involved in your little battle with her. But, I said no Tekaji, Satsuno spoke as he shot the monk a glare. Overhaul's instructions, his orders were clear. We are to delay whoever mimics sends to us and then retreat once we get the signal. Rappa fighting the girl will only waste more time, time that Chisaki can use to get away with Iri. Iri Momo questioned as she gritted her teeth and shifted her body to brace herself for the impending onslaught from the ex underground fighter. Who's that? The white-haired girl with crimson eyes clutched the sleeve of the man who carried her not understanding what was going on. She had been in her room, curled into a on her bed from the most recent session just the day before when overhaul, and Chrono had come for her. At first she thought that it was already time for the next one, she didn't understand what happened in the room, what they did to her, all she knew was that it hurt. It hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. However this time when the two had arrived it had been painfully obvious that something different was happening. When Overhaul normally came there was always an undertone of something in his voice, like he was excited to be doing a session with her. 
This time though he had been unduly serious, not even speaking to her, just telling Chrono to get her so we can go. The young girl thought it might have something to do with the strange rumblings that had begun a while ago causing the room to shake, knocking over the unopened toys her string of makeshift guardians had gotten her. Or maybe it was related to the strange noises she could hear through the vents. Either way Overhaul and Chrono had taken her from the room and begun leading her to a part of the base she'd never seen before. She'd been quiet and listened, hoping to find out what was going on, but all she'd gleamed was that there was some kind of attack and the shy Hasekai, according to Chrono, were doomed. That had made the white-haired girl want to shout for joy but Overhaul's response that he would be fine as long as he had her made the girl pale instead. Burrowing just a little bit further into Chrono's arms in the hope that they would finally offer some form of protection from the man responsible for her seemingly endless torment. For a faint single moment the girl thought that Chrono clutched her tightly, possessively, protectively, but it was only her imagination. Then a shout had rung out through the corridor they were strolling through Chisakiii causing the trio to turn around. Looking back her crimson eyes had seen a boy with dark green hair, and pale skin dressed in a black t-shirt and similarly colored pants staring with hatred at her captor. Chrono go on ahead, Overhaul had said as removed one of his gloves. This will only take a moment. Chrono had bowed before doing as his master commanded, hurrying the girl away to safety. The two walked down the rest of the hallway and rounded a corner where Chrono suddenly stopped. Tilting his head the man seemed to listen to the sounds coming from back down the corridor. Curious, the young girl did the same, closing her eyes to focus on listening. She could hear a rumble and grunts of exertion although she was unable to distinguish just who the noises were coming from. A mumbling caused the young girl to open her eyes and turn her crimson gaze on the person holding her in his arms. She was surprised to see that Chrono, who had always followed over Hall's commands without complaint, seemed torn between obeying and going back. I have to help him, Chrono muttered and to her surprise the man after another moment of deliberation had actually set her on the ground. Uri, Chrono said and Uri was surprised by how soft the man's voice was, lacking the usual emotionless harshness she'd come to associate with it. I have to go back. I'm sorry for what overhauled it to you and I'm sorry I didn't stop him but what is happening here is bigger than either of us. But that doesn't mean I'm going to let overhaul keep tearing you apart. If you go that way, Chrono said, gesturing down the hallway they'd turned into, you'll come to a set of stairs that will let you out in an alleyway. Take them and get as far away from here as you can. Turning around Chrono grabbed the corner of the wall peeking around it to look towards the fight. She didn't believe him it had to be a trap of some kind, a trick to get her to lower her guard so they could have another session. Well what are you waiting for go Chrono's shout shook her out of her thoughts and her legs started pumping before her brain could understand the words she'd heard. She ran down the corridor casting suspicious glances over her shoulder as she went. The first glance showed Chrono standing there on the corner of the intersection, one hand reaching into the depths of his cloak. The next showed Chrono twirling some kind of blade in his hand peeking around the corridor, looking at something she was unable to see. The third glance showed nothing, except for her the corridor was empty and it was at that point she reached the stairs. In her eagerness Uri didn't run up the stairs, she scrambled climbing on all fours using her hands and feet in a mad rush to escape everything these sterile white tunnels, and haunting bird masks, represented. Momo tumbled head over heels as she hit the floor rolling until she came to a stop. Groaning, she forced her aching body to its feet, her left arm hanging limply by her side sprained if not broken entirely. During the fight her hood had fallen down exposing her rave net hair which was mattered down and slick from her own. Her kabuki mask was cracked and broken around her right eye, the onyx orb underneath almost completely swollen shut from a punch Momo hadn't been able to dodge after said attack had shattered the shield she'd formed for protection. All in all Momo was currently in the process of losing. Badly. So this is the difference between training and experience, Momo thought grimly as she focused her only working eye on Rappa. The ex-underground fighter was faring much better than his opponent with several slight cuts over his torso, and arms most of which were leaking thin trails of. In fact the only real notable injury to the man was the fact that he was now missing his left ring finger. And Pinky. Momo had been on the defensive for the majority of the fight, if it could even be called that. All she had done was create shield after shield, each of which had been weaker than the last. The cuts on Rappa were from a small knife she'd made to complement her shield but so far the cuts were proving ineffective against the larger man. A pattern had started to form in their fight, Rappa would leap forward and destroy her shield, a barrage of blows reducing the metal to little more than a piece of scrap. Momo would then slice at Rappa and cut him causing the man to leap back to avoid getting cut more during which time she would create a new shield, repeat as necessary. However her constant production of shields was beginning to take a toll on the reserves of fat the Ravenet had stored up. Momo was just grateful that she had stocked up before the raid, eating a veritable feast of fatty foods from American pizza and burgers to a literal buffet of desserts such as cake, ice cream, brownies, cookies, and more. If it wasn't for the fact that the fat she ate seemed to go to certain areas of her body causing them to grow Momo was sure she would have the appearance of a beached whale. But then again so would her father, and all those who'd held the quirk before them so maybe it was actually a minor power of the quirk. Huh? Now that was an interesting idea, food for thought if she was somehow able to survive long enough to consider it. 
After her third shield had broken under the onslaught of Rappa's attacks Momo had begun to rethink her plan of defending herself. Rappa's quirk strongarm allowed the man to rotate his shoulders at superhuman speeds but tired Rappa out when he overused his quirk. Momo had originally planned to just endure the man's onslaught and then go on the offensive once he wore himself out but if she kept going the way she was now she was going to be pulverized before she even got the chance. So when she crafted her fourth shield she made a trap, the edges were metal, hard and solid, but the center was made out of rice paper gray in color to appear like it was made out of metal. Rappa attacked just like Momo knew he would and just as she'd planned his left fist went straight through the center of the shield with Momo dropping down to avoid the punch as he did so. For a moment Rappa stood there dumbfounded and confused, something Momo took full advantage of. Turning from her crouch on the floor she swung her arm around crafting a knife in her hand mid-swing. The blade cut true severing the pinky and ring finger from Rappa's left hand but Momo was unable to cut any further before the man recovered from his shock. Faster than Momo's eyes could follow Rappa's right arm slammed into the creation girl's side and it was all Momo could do to get her left arm up in a weak defense. The attack threw her backwards to where she now lay, watching Rappa pull the band of metal that had formed her trap off his left arm before crushing it. As Momo pulled herself to her feet panting as she held her injured arm, Rappa looked at the stubs that were formerly his fingers before looking at Momo with a savage glee. Good. Good good he screamed in frantic excitement charging at Momo in a bullheaded rush. As he began to let punches fly Momo held her arms up defensively and could only endure as the man let loose on her. She lasted all of five seconds before a punch slipped through her guard and hit her square in the stomach. Hunching over instinctively, Momo was unprepared for the knee to the face that Rappa followed up with, grabbing her shoulders to pull her down before letting go of her once the attack impacted. But Rappa wasn't done as the Ravenet reeled back the man launched a kick which his dead center into the girl's face, cracking the kabuki mask even more. Knocked backwards once more Momo cried out in pain when her back hit the wall. While the padding dulled the impact somewhat Momo still couldn't contain the bile that came out at the sudden high speed to a dead stop. Sitting up her head woozy, the room seemed to spin around her. Momo tried to stand only to collapse to the ground in a heap. Slowly, oh so slowly the Ravenet extended a hand against the wall and managed to gingerly pull herself to her feet. Her left arm was a deep blue almost purple from bruising and was clearly broken so badly that Momo's half-unconscious mind was surprised that there weren't bones sticking out of it. Her right arm wasn't as badly off although it was bright red and hurt to move it wasn't the agonizing pain that came with the slightest jostle that was her left arm at the moment. Momo wasn't able to do anything more as a hand wrapped around her hair pulling her up so her feet dangled off the ground leaving the Ravenet helpless in the air. Momo found herself face to face with Rappa. She could see the man's eyes through the holes in his mask, they were wild, crazed and it took Momo's rattled brain a moment to realize that it was the man's hunger for battle shining through. Come one give me more Rappa yelled slamming Momo into the wall hard enough that the girl was forced to gasp for air sending spittle and bile flying. Is that all you've got come on, punch me kick me fight me with each demand Rappa would emphasize his point with another slam into the wall. But Momo barely reacted. She could only groan weakly, causing a bubble that had formed around her now exposed nose to pop as she weakly raised her right hand, laying it against Rappa's chest in a futile effort to push the man away before going limp in his arms. The man dropped Momo's body in disgust although whether from the sprinkling of that now covered the front of his body, or from the girl's apparent weakness it was unclear. Rappa walked back towards the eight bullets in disgust shaking his head while he muttered about how disappointing the fight had been and criminals who thought they were stronger than they actually were before falling silent. A look of confusion on his face. Does anyone else hear that? The other members of the eight bullets who had been coming forward to congratulate the man stopped and looked around in confusion. In the silence a low rhythmic beeping soft enough that it had been able to be covered by Rappa's rant could be heard. Beep, beep, beep. Why is that Sakaki slurred, stumbling slightly as he raised a finger to point at Rappa's chest. Following the drunken man's direction the bullets turned their attention to the man who was looking down as he had his head to the side in confusion. A dry laugh interrupted the men's focus and they quickly turned to where the body of the woman Rappa had just beaten lay, or rather where it had been lying. For sitting propped up against the wall was Momo who had removed her broken mask leaving it to lie discarded on the ground beside her. What's so funny Satsuno asked as he moved up to stand beside Rappa, incorporating the man back into their ranks despite his earlier promise. You're defeated, in no condition to fight and are going to die. We'd have left you if you had just stayed quiet and played dead, so what are you up to? Momo's reply was to smile exposing her teeth, dyed red in her own. She began to laugh quietly but had to stop to spit out a wad of, the dark crimson a sharp contrast against the tan tatami mats covering the floor. Her lack of a response made Satsuno that much more cautious and the man opened his mouth to tell the others to be quiet when Rappa who'd been unusually quiet let out a roar although whether of fury that the girl was proving so frustrating to take down or of joy that the fight might not yet be over Satsuno didn't know. Reaching out a hand Satsuno was only able to get out a quick Rappa no, before the man charged forward towards the down girl and what clearly appeared to be a trap of some kind. 
Before he could even react the girl's smile which had been a small grin grew splitting her face almost maniacally. Holding up the hand at the end of her unbroken arm which had been resting on the ground beside her Setsuno was able to make out a shape the man instantly recognized as a detonator. As he raised his hand and began to activate his quirk, already knowing it was too late Setsuno just had time to make out a single word the girl spoke as the yellow dome of Tengai's barrier covered him protectively, boom. Then the world in front of him exploded. Izuku leapt backwards dodging a plethora of spikes that sprouted from the ground around him, narrowly avoiding being turned into a green-haired shish kebab. It was only thanks to his months spent training with Momo that Izuku was even still alive. If he still had the baby fat and agility that came with a life spent cooped up in his room staring at videos of heroes then Izuku likely would have ended up on the end of a spike the first time Overhaul used his quirk. As it was, Izuku was still being pushed to his limits to dodge the spikes Overhaul created as he used his quirk to deconstruct, and then reconstruct the ground around him. The man hadn't even moved or changed his pattern at all he merely knelt there on one knee glaring at Izuku over his plague mask as he overhauled his surroundings, shaping them to suit his needs. The worst part was it was working. Izuku might have a better physicality than he had months ago with more muscles and stamina than he could ever have imagined possessing, but he was still human. He could still get tired, get hurt, get killed, and having to dodge spikes as they appeared to avoid being run through by them was beginning to physically take its toll. Dodging out of the way of another spike Izuku slipped on the smooth floor, it was a fatal mistake and he could feel the smile underneath Overhaul's mask as he fell. Got you, Overhaul muttered as the ground underneath Izuku began to break apart. A movement to his left out of the corner of his eye caused Overhaul to turn and it was instinct more than anything that caused the masked man to raise his arm defensively. As a result the knife that had been aimed at the man's spinal cord instead bit deep into the young Yakuza's left wrist cutting halfway through the limb before stopping. For a moment Overhaul and his attacker battled, each attempting to overpower the other, but as Overhaul's eyes interpreted who he was fighting they widened in surprise, and the man, instinctively, for a single moment, relaxed just the slightest bit upon seeing a familiar mask. That brief moment of weakness was all the time Chronostasis needed to push his blade the rest of the way through Overhaul's wrist, severing the appendage from the man's arm. Said hand seemed to fall to the ground in slow motion, its impact with the ground sending droplets of flying, dyeing the clean floors an eerie polka dot red. For a moment everyone's eyes, including overhauls, followed the appendage descent and during that time Chronostasis, the only one who hadn't turned his attention to the falling hand, struck again driving a second knife that seemed to appear in his left hand from nowhere into the underside of Kai's other wrist forcing it off the ground and saving Izuku's life, buying the green at the time needed to scramble to his feet where he dusted himself off. However this time Overhaul reacted, stepping back away from his attacker the masked man yanked his arm upwards in an attempt to free it from the blade piercing through it. For a moment it looked like the young boss would succeed, but it seemed like luck was not with the auburn-haired man as Chronostasis tightened his grip on the knife in response. Growling in frustration Overhaul wrenched his arm to the side and managed to succeed in tearing his arm free of the knife, but severed the entire right side of the wrist in the process. This meant his only remaining right hand was attached to his arm by only a few centimeters of muscle, bone, and sinew on the left side of the man's wrist. Seeing Overhaul step backwards not only in pain but to create distance between his attacker Chronostasis retreated to hopping backwards to stand protectively in front of Izuku who after regaining his feet had stood watching the entire exchange with his hands in his pockets and a knowing smirk across his face. You aren't Chrono, Overhaul growled, as he retreated backwards trying to push the pain both physical and mental from his head. Who are you where's Chrono? He's dead, Chrono spoke and Overhaul gritted his teeth as Chrono delivered the news of his own demise. I captured him when you sent him out to spy on Team Reservoir Dogs. Finding a guy in a plague mask wasn't all that hard to do. Fake Chrono said thoughtfully, raising his right hand as he tapped his chin with his pointer finger. He was so loyal too, refused to talk, or at least he did until I started removing body parts. He was able to withstand losing his toes but it was the fingers that got him. Of course he tried to use his quirk but a quick once over with the razor to shave his head and well. The fake Chrono's finger fell as he lowered his head fixing overhaul with what the man knew to be a thirsty grin behind his mask, he might as well have been quirkless. Overhaul stilled momentarily at the jab. One of his favorite things to rant about was how quirks were a disease. Blame is mysophobia or fear of germs but Kai genuinely believed the old theory that quirks originated from rats and then spread to humans. History had shown how deadly a plague carried by the vermin and their fleas could be, the Black Death serving as a prime example. How the UA principal was a ing rat, that might as well be evidence right there when you considered how few animals actually possessed quirks. Overhaul's true plan, the one he kept to himself, was to eradicate quirks entirely. If quirks were a disease then he was the doctor coming to deliver the medicine to take them away and treat the illness people didn't know that they had. It was all possible thanks to Uri, wait a moment, if Chrono or whoever was imitating him was here then, where's Uri overhaul growled as he took another step backwards. He reached backwards with his still usable right hand for the wall he'd been slowly backing towards but before he could touch it a knife struck the wall just inches away from his hand causing him to recoil. 
Now, now, Fo Chrono said, his voice carrying a trace of humor despite the disappointed head shake he was currently doing. Behave, we don't want there to be an accident, do we? The man's voice became more serious. As for the girl, she's out of your reach. Once more the fake shook his head although this time it was more tight, as if he was trying to keep himself from attacking Overhaul who noticed the man's fists were clenched tightly at his side. Seriously experimenting on a child, a young six-year-old did you seriously not expect me to get her as far away from you as I could before coming back to help? You experimented on a child the voice was low and looking towards it both Chrono and Overhaul found the green eight who'd been there the entire time trembling. His fists now out of his pockets and clenched by his side as his head hung low, green locks obscuring the boy's eyes from view. For a moment Overhaul pondered not answering the boy but as he took in the teen's posture the basics of a plan started to form in his head. The boy was clearly emotional at the thought of what Overhaul might have done. And that was something Overhaul could use. Yes, yes I did, he bragged, it was for the greater good after all with her reviving the shy. Hasiaki, the dream the boss had, was possible. Of course I had to harvest what I needed from her. Chisaki trailed off meaningfully leaving the bait hanging out in the open. Harvest the green eats voice was low but Kai couldn't contain the dark grin that grew underneath his mask at the question. Yes harvest, Overhaul said, his voice cheerful as if he was having a friendly conversation with a neighbor about the weather. I needed her, bone marrow, and quite a few bits and pieces that I could only get from her if I, well, went digging around inside of her if you get what I mean. Kai watched as the green eat began to tremble angrily. The fake Chrono meanwhile was looking back and forth between the two men, clearly confused, trying to understand what Overhaul was up to. Her kidneys, liver, some bones and I think I even took her brain stem at one point. Don't remember what I needed if for but, Overhaul shrugged nonchalantly, the more you know right. Everything were needed to help me in my research. It was just my luck I had the perfect quirk for it. He trailed off once again as the green-haired boy's face flew up his eyes wide at the full realization of what Chisaki meant. Just one more push overhaul held up his left arm, elbow bent so the stump where his missing hand had been was evident for all to see right next to his face, it was so easy to harvest what I needed when I deconstructed her very body, cut her wide open so I could get in there and get what I needed. Then a touch of my hand once I was done and poof, all better. A cow as good as new, ready and waiting for its next slaughter. She felt everything of course, can you imagine it being a six-year-old and feeling as your body morphed again, and again against your will with you trapped inside unable to do anything but able to feel everything. After the third time, the green eat looked like it was taking all his restraint to keep from trying to tear Overhaul's head off the slightest touch of a finger on the metaphorical trigger would set him off. However Overhaul didn't lay a finger on the green eat's button he slammed his fist down on it, she didn't even bother to scream. Izuku no, Chrono yelled, reaching out towards the boy but it was too late. With a roar of righteous anger, Izuku charged forward, drawing back his arm and for a straightforward punch at Overhaul's face. Overhaul grinned holding up his only remaining hand. Izuku's eyes widened as his brain finally realized the trap he'd fallen straight into but it was too late. His hand was already moving forward, and there was nothing Izuku could do to take it back. Chrono screamed, a shout of NOOO echoing down the otherwise deserted hallway. Flesh mit flesh. Overhaul activated his quirk. And Izuku fell backwards as the sterile white walls that surrounded the three were dyed crimson from the red splattering onto them. As the dust cleared Tengai let his barrier fall both he and the other bullets mentally thanking Overhaul's mysophobia making the man require that they wear some form of mask. Without it the dust and smoke in the air would have seen the bullets on their hands and knees coughing out a lung. As it was they were forced to wait until the dust settled and the smoke escaped the room through the ventilation system. When it all finally dispersed and the four remaining bullets could see, none of them were able to control their shock at the sight that awaited them. Momo still rested against the wall where she'd been lying, a shield the girl had obviously created in an attempt to protect herself falling to the floor with a muted thud revealing the Ravenette's unconscious body. Red burns on her exposed skin and a light smattering of char showed where the heat and flames of the explosion had managed to get around her improvised defense. However the main focus of the group was on Rappa. As an underground fighter Rappa had been renowned for his physicality, sometimes not even using his quirk and relying on only his natural strength instead to pound his opponents into the ground. Where other heroes and even some villains relied on specialized gear or gadgets to assist them in a fight Rappa relied only on his body. He had trained it for years and combined with his quirk it was not a lie to say that Rappa was a massive threat at close range, easily stronger than most minor villains, and low-ranking pro heroes. It was this power that had made Overhaul seek Rappa out, entering into the ring with the man only for him to best the reigning champion with a mere touch of his hand. Since then Rappa had challenged Overhaul no less than seven times only to be beaten again and again. Unlike the other bullets he didn't follow Overhaul because the man gave him a purpose, no, he did it because he wanted to fight the man and emerge victorious. Nothing more, nothing less. Now Rappa's once proud body was black from the fire that had erupted from his stomach. 
Despite obviously being unconscious the man had somehow remained standing. The light rise and fall of the upper chest the only sign he was even still alive. His shirt was gone, disintegrated in the blast, and he was clothed only in the tattered remains of his pants which somehow managed to preserve the man's modesty. Black strips, the remnants of what was once his mask clung to wrap his head although it was unclear whether that was because they had survived the blast or because the heat had been so hot that they'd melted and hardened on the man's bare skin. Rappa's normal brownish-orange hair was charred leaving him bald in some spots and coloring the rest of his hair the color of soot but the worst of all was the man's stomach which resembled something from a horror film. The sound of retching reached Setsuno's ears and the man turned to see Tengai on the ground having removed his mask so he could vomit without the barrier his mask created. Turning back to look at Rappa, Setsuno felt tempted to join him as bile rose in his own throat. The explosion hadn't only gone outwards, it had gone inwards as well. The skin on Rappa's stomach was practically gone, vaporized from the blast exposing the vulnerable internal organs and bones within, the liver, the stomach, the intestine, a kidney, and what might be a lung. Visible burns marred said organs and the bones of Rappa's ribs were dusted black from ash and char. Dark red, so dark it was practically black, dripped from the gaping wound to the floor below joining the growing puddle beneath the man turning the now blackened floor crimson. Why isn't he bleeding more Tabe whispered. The wound is cauterized, Tengai replied, his voice broken, like the man was dead inside. Hearing this Setsuno turned to find the man who'd been vomiting only moments ago reaffixing his mask to his face before continuing. Although the former monk made sure to look everywhere but at Rappa. The heat by some miracle. Or curse, Setsuno couldn't help but mutter to softly for the others to hear. Sealed most of the veins and arteries as it damaged them. That's why he isn't bleeding even more. But this is bad, Tabe said as he began to pace around his hands pulling at his mask as if it was constraining him. This is bad, this is bad, this is bad he's bleeding and I can see his ing organs for God's sake the man in a scarecrow mask said gesturing to wrap his open stomach. We need to get him out of here, to a hospital, or a doctor, to overhaul, something. Why is Sakaki whined, as the drunkard stumbled forward to lean on Setsuno who pushed the man off him in disgust. He lost which means he failed. And we all know how overhaul treats failures, the man said, his voice at the end sounding almost sober. Indeed, Tengai added and turning Setsuno found the monk with his gaze firmly locked onto a spot on the wall which had somehow avoided being burned. It would be best both for him and for us if we left him here. But he's a member of the Bullets, Tape protested. He's our teammate, our friend. We can't just leave him here he'll die. And I know that Tengai yelled, spinning around to glare at Tape, actually opening his eyes as he did so. You think I want to leave him when we can help? It goes against the very things I believed in as a monk to do so but trust me, my fear of overhaul is greater than my desire to help somebody who's already dead. Satsuno, Tape begged, turning to the blonde man. We have to help him, right? Satsuno opened his mouth to answer only to close it before opening it again. However he was saved from answering as the room began to shake and dust began to fall from the ceiling. As the quartet looked upwards all of them watched in both fascination and horror as five massive claws not unlike those of a mole penetrated the ceiling sending both rubble and dust falling down towards those below. Satsuno's sharp eyes were able to make out several bodies amongst the rubble including mimics as the roof was torn off above them. Tengai quickly formed a barrier around the bullets although as large pieces of concrete and rubble bounced off the yellow shield Setsuno could see the strain it was having on him. As the ceiling finally gave way and collapsed completely a large, monstrous form fell down into the room sending a wave of dust blasting outwards. The air pressure of the wave was too much for Tengai when added to the strain the man was already feeling from blocking the falling rubble and the barrier fell sending the bullets and Rappa's unconscious body flying backwards. The unconscious ex-underground fighter landing on his back next to Hojo who was forcing himself to stand, rubbing his throat unconsciously in the hope of alleviating some of the pain he was still feeling from when Momo had almost crushed it. As the other four bullets still in fighting condition stood up to join him the five took in the new arrival, only now revealed as the dust once more began to settle. The creature was 40 feet tall and it was only thanks to the collapsed ceiling that the behemoth wasn't forced to crouch down to fit into the room. He had spiky brown hair and parts of his body appeared to be jagged, much like rock. He was clad only in a pair of black shorts that hugged his lower body tightly, but the most unsettling thing about him was how his teeth and fingers protruded from his body, jutting out at unnatural, almost painful, looking angles. As they gazed upon the titan before them primal instincts awoke within each of the bullets. Their very bodies, the cells within them screamed danger in capital letters. This thing before them wasn't human, it was a monster, a demon and if they fought it the bullets had no doubt that they would lose. It was all they could do to remain standing perfectly still, paralyzed from raw terror as the creature seemed to sniff the air. Not here, the creature mumbled, its voice rough and grating. Not here, but near. Close. The creature seemed to sniff again and the bullets watched with horrified fascination as it turned away from them, focusing on the limp body of the girl they'd been fighting minutes before. Assistant. The creature muttered, reaching out with a giant hand it plucked the girl from the ground lifting her up to examine her at eye level several stories above the ground. 
hurt. The creature noted before sniffing again, smells like others, targets, and the bullets could only stand still as the gaze of the creature turned to them. As they watched the creature set the girl gingerly down on the ground only for a black ooze-like substance to immediately emerge from her lips. The liquid enveloped the girl's body completely before dissipating and before the bullet's eyes both the girl and the liquid were gone leaving the five alone with the titan whose gaze was focused solely on them. However as great as their fear for the monster in front of them was there was another they feared even more and so as gigantic claws sprouted from the behemoth's fingers and his body seemed to grow even larger if that was at all possible the bullet braced themselves for the fight that was sure to follow. Izuku fell backwards landing on his rear with a small thump. His eyes were the size of saucers as he stared at the scene before him. The slight widening of Overhaul's eyes was the only visible sign that the young boss of the Yakuza was surprised as well. Together the two watched as Chrono fell towards the floor in seemingly slow motion. The bare, bleeding stump that protruded a few centimeters from his shoulder the only sign of what was once Chrono's right arm. As he fell towards the ground Overhaul was surprised to see a grey slime cover Chrono or rather seemed to emerge from the man. As he watched the man's clothes and outline seemed to dissolve, hiding the figure within for a moment before the slimy cocoon burst apart. Overhaul felt his eyes widen in surprise as he saw his lieutenant, second in command, and childhood friend turn into a blonde-haired girl. Owen said girl was nude. That seemed important especially considering stains made up of the grey slime which Overhaul highly suspected related to her quirk in some way given what had just happened covered her inner thighs and the front of her ample s preserving her modest and protecting nipples from view. The surprising sight of what could be called Kai's best and only real friend transforming into a new teenage girl caused the young man to once again lower his guard, and just like before the blonde didn't hesitate to take advantage of his moment of weakness. Her left arm might have been torn away into nothingness but she still had her right one and she didn't hesitate to use it. A knife appeared in her grasp and the girl turned herself midfall to slash vertically upwards at Chisaki in a desperate attempt to sever what was left of his right wrist. However Overhaul recovered faster than he did last time and leaned backwards pulling his right arm out of the girl's reach. However that didn't deter the girl, instead the blonde changed her attack's trajectory, her slash instead slicing through Overhaul's left cheek. Continuing upwards the attack severed the strings on Overhaul's plague mask causing it to fall to the ground but that wasn't all as just before she was forced to pull away to keep from overextending her blade managed to reach Overhaul's eye. As the golden orb burst Overhaul screamed pain erupted within him that when combined with his already missing limb and injured wrist overwhelmed his mind. Clutching at his face with his stump and remaining hand, Overhaul couldn't think straight. All he could focus on was the pain not even thinking to activate his quirk to heal himself so overwhelming was it. His pain and panic only worsened when the man realized his mask was gone which meant was now dotting his face. Overhaul's mysophobia, the fear it brought, allowed the man to finally focus. Slamming his hand into the ground a plethora of spikes erupted forcing the girl back. Directing his pain, rage, and fear at the one who'd undone all his hard work Overhaul took control of himself slowly, deliberately, walking towards where his severed hand lay on the ground. Picking it up Overhaul brought his hand towards his face, ignoring the that splattered onto him and the pain the action brought as he activated his quirk on himself. To call the battle between Gigantamasha, Toya Setsuno, Yuhojo, Soramitsu Tape, Hekaji Tengai, and Deidoro Sakaki a fight would be a vast overstatement of what occurred between them. It was not a fight or even a battle, hell it could barely be called a skirmish. As Tengai would later recall it was nothing short of a full-scale slaughter. The giant charged forward with seemingly no regard for his own protection. Sakaki activated his quirk slush but the giant didn't even stumble instead bringing his right arm in front of his body in preparation to attack. Tengai quickly activated barrier but as the titan brought his arm around for a powerful backhand the protective shield might as well have been made of styrofoam for all the good it did. The massive hand caught Tengai in the chest and sent the man flying into the wall hard enough to leave a crater where he impacted. For a moment Tengai hung there two and a half feet off the ground, held aloft only by how deep in the surface he was embedded before falling forward, and collapsing to the floor unconscious. The other bullets dodged the attack either going under, around or in Sakaki's case diving through the large fingers of the titan's hand. Drawing his throwing knives from within his cloak Sakaki let loose a barrage at the giant's face forcing the creature to raise its left hand to protect his vulnerable eyes. While the monster was occupied, Hojo charged forward activating his quirk causing crystals to grow over his arms, head, and back. Setsuno joined him, summoning the rapier that had been discarded earlier back to his grasp. Together the two attacked one of the giant's exposed feet only for their attacks to bounce off, unable to penetrate the tough muscle of Gigantamasha's body, a byproduct of another one of the man's quirks. However just because their attacks didn't penetrate didn't mean that they didn't hit and Gigantamasha was able to feel the pressure their attacks caused just fine. Like a human swatting an annoying bug the giant swung his leg forward catching both the bullets in their surprised state sending them reeling head over heels, unconscious before they even hit the wall. No, a soft voice whispered and it was only Gigantamasha's enhanced senses that allowed him to hear the noise. Turning towards it the giant caught sight of Tabe who was furiously scratching at the neck of his sack. 
No, 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 no. Letting out a scream of mad and fury Tabe rushed forward the front of his mask splitting apart to expose the man's mouth. You won't hurt them Tabe screamed as he closed his mouth, biting down into one of the claws that Gigantamacia had swung his way, crushing it like the claw was a potato chip. I'll devour you before you can. Focusing solely on Tabe Gigantamacia deactivated his claws and raised his left arm skyward before bringing it down to crash into the floor. The impact sent dust and bits of rubble flying upwards but that didn't slow down Tabe who charged at Gigantamacia's lowered arm, his mouth open devouring anything that got in his way. Just as Gigantamacia pulled his hand free, leaving an impression of it three feet deep in the ground, Tabe reached his target and bit down. Gigantamacia's hardened muscles gave way like butter before Tabe's teeth but even with his quirk the scarecrow masked man was incapable of biting completely through the giant limb leaving him stuck, wedged in the giant's arm. However the bite still hurt and Gigantamacia let out an injured roar, feeling pain for the first time in a very long time. Acting more on instinct than reason Gigantamacia swung his arm around slamming it into the wall. Drawing it back an observer would have had only a moment to see a clearly unconscious tape practically bruised in the wall. His exposed mouth why from both the harsh impact and his teeth being forcefully removed from his mouth so deep in Gigantamacia's arm had they been buried. His clothes were ripped and torn and his face was bare to the world, the ruins of his mask entrenched in the wall around him. But Gigantamacia wasn't done yet, there was a reason he had been chosen to be the bodyguard of All for One, molded and enhanced with quirks to fit that role. Engraved in his mind and body was the understanding that if he was experiencing pain then his master was in danger which meant the thing that caused the pain needed to be erased before it could hurt him. If it was a math equation it would have looked like this. Pain equals danger equals master endangered equals protect master equals end what caused pain. It was a simple understanding for a simplistic giant but with Gigantamacia's power, simple could become overkill very easily. That programming that had been pounded into him again and again is what caused Gigantamacia to continue his assault on the motionless tape bringing his right hand forward mere seconds after he had detached the bullet from his other arm. Activating Mole Claws Gigantamacia buried the claw of his pointer through Tabe's torso, drilling it into the wall behind him, the claws on his other fingers striking the wall around the man. The mere size difference between the two practically guaranteed that Tabe was dead but Gigantamacia wasn't programmed to take an almost or practically as an acceptable outcome. He needed to be certain which was why he didn't hesitate to, upon piercing through the man's body, tear it apart. Swinging his arm to the right Gigantamacia's claw vaporized what remained of Tabe's side, splattering, organs, and unidentifiable pieces of meat and tissue onto the surroundings. As if that wasn't enough the claw on his thumb which had gone to the left of Tabe, missing the man completely upon Gigantamacia's initial strike went with the giant's hand, as he slashed it to the right. This meant that the claw cut through Tabe's body just above the man's waist bisecting the man horizontally, severing him in two. Seeing his companions taken down so easily, and the sheer brutality of his foe upon being injured the sole remaining bullet, Sakaki's confidence shattered. Turning the man attempted to flee running, scrambling away on all four tripping over rocks, and rubble as he cast desperate glances over his shoulder, his drunkenness having ended through sheer terror leaving the man stone cold sober for the first time in years. Gigantamacia was nothing if not obedient however and he turned moving at speeds that seemed impossible for his large size pinning the man to the ground with a single giant claw. Please, Sakaki croaked his voice weak, I'll give you anything you want. Two can help you, I know things, important things. I know where the money's kept, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. The man cried tears leaking out the same eye holes he'd specifically designed to let Saken so easily. Just don't kill me. I won't kill you, Gigantamacia spoke in the same gravelly tone he'd used earlier although it now contained the barest traces of emotion. Master, there need you. Pressing down just a little harder Gigantamacia forced the man unconscious. When Sakaki finally went limp Gigantamacia stood up and deactivated his gigantification quirk, shrinking down to stand at his normal but still massive height. Lifting his head Gigantamacia sniffed the air once more this time successfully picking up Izuku's scent. It was close and had three scents close to it. One smelled like a woman he'd smelled on Master's air when the two had first met at the warehouse, but the other one was new. For a moment Gigantamacia considered going to help but he shot the idea down. A lord had to be strong and the new scent felt dangerous, a perfect challenge for the boy to prove his worthiness. Satisfied with his decision Gigantamacia said about picking up the limp bodies of the bullets around him, as well as the body of a man he remembered having been buried in a wall he'd smashed through. When he reached the body of Tabe he hesitated but eventually decided to leave the man behind. While it pained him to know he'd failed to fulfill his master's will by not completing the heir's objective of retrieving all the bullets alive, such an act could still have its uses. It would serve as another test, to see how the boy reacted to not getting everything he wanted. As he turned away from the body of Tabe Gigantamacia began to stride away, the bullets and Maninth Yuol unconscious on his back. It was a long walk back to his master who had told him to return with whoever he captured and he still had to grab the body of the growing bullet he'd beaten earlier. At least he wouldn't have to deal with any pro-heroes, the giant thought ruefully. They were still focused on the explosions and were only now beginning to realize that in the chaos the criminals were going after one another. 
The distraction had been well planned, the giant had to admit, with any luck he would be long gone with the bodies before the heroes even arrived to investigate the raid. As he set Hojo on his back with the others Gigantamacia grew and pulled himself out of the hole into the underground base to the road above, only to be greeted by three police cars, and a minor pro-hero who all turned to look at the giant fearfully. He sighed deeply, this might take slightly longer than he'd originally thought it would. A healthy, healed overhaul, the last thing Izuku had wanted to have to face during his raid on the Shai Hasekai. Overhaul's quirk was incredibly dangerous making him able to remodel his surroundings on a whim and kill someone with the barest touch of a finger it was sheer luck the man had been completely focused when he'd laid a hand on Toga destroying her arm rather than her entire body. In battle Izuku knew that the chances of emerging victorious over the masked man were slim to none, especially in close or medium range combat. As a result the ideal solution, and the one he'd wanted to go with first, would have been to have had somebody simply snipe overhaul when he was out walking on the street, preferably from a couple dozen blocks away where the sniper would have been out of sight and range of most detection quirks that tended to only work in the user's immediate area. Unfortunately overhaul's schedule was nearly impossible to predict, constantly changing and only known to his closest advisors. So Izuku had gone with plan B. He was truly thankful to whatever twist of fate had led him to come into contact with Toga that day in the alley. Given the choice between three dumb small-time crooks whose greatest defense had been shoplifting a rotten rutabaga and dropping a church bell on the head not of a covenant, or a girl whose quirk made her the perfect spy, Izuku would have to go with the latter every time. The plan was simple they would kidnap a member of the Shai Hasekai and Toga would replace him. She would spend some time blending in and making sure she wasn't discovered while trying to learn the rough layout of the base. When Izuku and his forces raided Toga would separate Chisaki from the other members while Izuku would chase them down using a tracker on Toga. While Overhaul was distracted by Izuku Toga would use the chance to stab Overhaul in his spine, attempting to sever it in his upper back to turn the man into a quadriplegia, meaning he would be unable to use any of his limbs. For someone whose quirk relied on him being able to use his hands it would be an instant loss. Unfortunately, just like Plan A, Plan B was now going down the drain but this time Izuku didn't have the courtesy of being able to come up with another one. You overhaul growled fairly, his golden eyes locked onto Toga. This is all your fault you've cost me everything Eri, my research. Chrono everything is your fault overhaul screamed as he lunged at Toga, acting more like a beast than the young man he actually was. Even injured, Toga still retained her agility and she dove aside, rolling once she hit the ground to avoid the spikes overhaul created when his hand hit the floor where the blonde had been standing just seconds before. Drawing a knife with her sole remaining hand from a strap on her thigh Toga launched it at Chisaki who had risen from the crouch he'd fallen into only for the man to lean out of the way. Slamming his hand into a nearby spike, Chisaki overhauled the spikes he'd just made. Toga attempted to leap out of the way but whether from loss, pain, exhaustion, or just simply not being able to react fast enough the blonde was unable to move fast enough to dodge a spike that sprouted from the side of an already existing one. The new spike pierced straight through Toga's left thigh and the blonde was unable to contain her scream of pain. Already in the air Toga's jump turned into a semi-controlled fall, the spike in her thigh breaking off from the main body it had grown from to fall with her. Hitting the ground the blonde whimpered in pain as her bare thigh impacted the floor, the cool surface forcing the concrete spike even farther inside of her. Laughing darkly, a crazed look in his golden eyes overhaul strode over to where the blonde lay on the ground, trying to use her sole remaining hand to crawl away from the man approaching her leaving two trails of crimson in her wake from her missing limb, and her injured thigh. Turning to cast a fearful look his way overhaul grinned at the fear he saw within her eyes, the color so similar to his own. He was also pleased to see that the fall hadn't left her unscathed either, a thin trail of leaking down the side of her face from a cut on her forehead, the wetness slightly taming the girl's disorganized blonde locks. You think you've accomplished something here, Overhaul said, using his right hand to sweep his hair back from his forehead, for once not caring about what germs might be covering either surface. You think that Arya's safe, that she'll be able to hide from me. Overhaul chuckled a crazed look in his eye. She won't, that girl is cursed. She doesn't know what power she holds or how to wield it, all she knows is that her power, her quirk, her curse, is responsible for every misfortune that has ever befallen her. Tell me, what do you think she'll do when it goes out of control again when she makes somebody else disappear in front of her eyes? You won't of her, Toga spat defiantly, a look of pure unadulterated hatred on her face. That's the beauty of it, Overhaul said allowing Toga to see the slight grin on the man's face, I don't have to. Eventually she'll come back to me. She doesn't know anyone else and it's such a cold, cruel world out there. Her fear of hurting others, of bringing them pain will cause her to seek me out and I'll have people there to bring her home once she realizes that. The bullets can be replaced, so can underlings, supplies, and anything else I need. You might have raided our base but we have other hideouts that just aren't as large. You went after our base but I doubt you went after our funds which means I still have money to pay people and get the equipment I need. Really the only thing you've done is inconvenienced me, wasted my time. It'll take a while to re-establish ourselves, to recruit new people, and I'll need to start over on my experiments but what's a couple months, 
or years in the grand scheme of things. Quirks will still be there, so will heroes and villains. All you've done is delay the return of the Yakuza but once you're gone, no one will even remember that. Go to hell, Toga hissed. She tried to spit at the devil of a man crouching over her but failed miserably, the red white saliva merely sliding down her cheek to the ground beside her. Oh I will, but not for many more years. Say hi to Ari's mother for me and make sure to let her know what great care I've been taking of her little girl. Raising his right hand over Hall reached for Toga's face, the blonde girl staring defiantly at the man in the space between his fingers as the shadow of his hand covered her face. A sudden shadow on the ground next to him was all the warning over Hall had to dodge out of the way. Ducking to the side over Hall stood up, turning he watched as a small concrete rock clattered on the ground next to where he'd been crouched, well wide of both him and the blonde that had been just underneath his fingers. Over Hall's eyes scanned back and forth looking for the person who'd thrown it. The green eat who'd slipped from his mind but the spikes he'd been using to fight now blocked his view offering a multitude of hiding spots. Growling in annoyance over Hall reached down to the ground below him making sure to keep his head up eyes darting back and forth as he did so not wanting to be ambushed in his brief moment of weakness. As a result when there was movement behind him over Hall turned immediately only to see another rock clatter off a spike to the floor below. Upon recognizing the distraction for what it was overhaul immediately started to turn back around only to dodge out of the way of a weakly thrown rock, courtesy of the disabled blonde lying on the floor who flashed him a stained grin through crimson teeth. Once more fury overtook overhaul's thoughts and he took a step towards the blonde only to scream as something slammed into his back. Whirling around overhaul slashed his right hand through the air in a horizontal swipe, the green eat who'd ambushed him ducking under the wild swing. Overhauled had only a moment to see the stained knife in the boy's hand before said blade was slammed into his side. Once, twice, a third time. His right hand out wide from the swing overhaul lunged forward with his left only for the boy to dodge backwards out of reach. His side and back throbbing from his stab wounds overhaul considered healing himself but quickly tossed the possibility aside in favor of attacking. He reached for the floor but was quickly forced to dodge out of the way of a knife thrown his way. Chisaki grinned, the boy had tossed aside his only weapon in order to keep him from using his quirk. That left Greenie weaponless, harmless, and based on what Overhaul had seen the boy lacked a quirk for fighting, he was helpless, a pig ready for what was about to be a literal slaughter. Charging forward once more Overhaul reached arm outstretched towards the boy who took a fearful step back. The calm mask of control the Greenie had been wearing shattered just the slightest bit, eyes darting downward towards his leg a look of betrayal slipping across the boy's face. The sight made Chisaki grin and as his hand drew closer Overhaul could feel everything once more going his way, until a knife hit him in the back, again. For a moment he wondered where the blade had come from before it hit him. The boy hadn't been throwing his knife to stop Overhaul from using his quirk. He'd been tossing it to his partner, the wounded girl who'd been laying on the ground and in Overhaul's mind out of the fight. The sudden pain caused the leader of the shy Hasekai to stumble and the green eat who'd looked like he'd been preparing to flee leapt into action. Ducking under his outstretched hand the boy slammed a fist into Chisaki's gut, giving the man just a moment to realize that it had not been the green eat caught in his trap but him caught in the boys. Spittle flew but the green eat, no Izuku, wasn't done. An uppercut slammed into Chisaki's exposed lower jaw and overhaul felt his open trap audibly slam shut. And pain filled his mouth, the sudden action having actually severed the tip of his tongue from the rest the muscle but Chisaki barely had time to feel it. As his head flipped backwards from the kinetic energy of the punch a hand closed around his face covering his eyes. For a moment there was a feeling of weightlessness, of falling, and overhaul desperately tried to reach, to touch, but before he could make contact something slammed into him and then there was only darkness. Izuku panted as he stood victoriously over the unmoving body of Kaichisaki. He'd done it. He'd done it a disbelieving chuckle slipped out of the green eat's mouth as his knees gave out under him and he fell to the ground, leaning against one of the spikes that protruded from it as he tried to wrap his head around the fact that quirkless he'd managed to overcome a man with what was easily one of the most powerful quirks he'd ever come across. For a moment Izuku considered whether he actually needed a quirk at all. Maybe, just maybe he could accomplish his goals without one. Izuku let his mind imagine the reality but eventually he shook his head, forcing the thoughts away. No, while it was a nice dream, he had to face reality. He couldn't get caught up in delusions he had to stay realistic. A quirk was necessary to his success and he wasn't about to give up the one before him. A movement caught Izuku's attention and he looked up from where he was sitting to see Toga, now back on her feet, limping her way over to where Overhaul lay unconscious on the ground. In her hand clutched so tightly her knuckles were white was a knife, likely picked up from amongst the rubble. No, I'll do it, Izuku said, his voice soft but it carried in the silence. Toga stopped where she was and gave him a hesitant look but something about his face kept her from voicing any doubt she may have had. Instead she merely watched as Izuku pushed himself up and approached her. Once he was close enough Izuku raised his hand, and, after a moment's pause to search his face, Toga consented handing over the knife handle first. 
For a moment Izuku stood there feeling the weight of the thin blade in his hand before he crouched down next to the unconscious Kaichisaki. Holding the knife over the man's wrist Izuku paused to look at the unconscious man wondering if this was the right thing to do. Closing his eyes Izuku thought back not to his goals, the plans, and dreams but to what the man had said he'd done to the girl. What was her name Eri? Some people don't deserve to be saved, Izuku whispered, his thoughts focused not on overhaul but another man, a base-themed one who'd taken away the most important woman in his life. Then after a moment's hesitation Izuku brought the knife down. Eri walked down the sidewalk, her arms crossed in front of her as the sun sank down in the sky painting the heavens a variety of colors the white-haired girl had never seen before. However she was unable to focus on the sky so wrapped up was she in her trembling and the developing pressure in her forehead. She recognized the feeling, the same one she'd had on the day she'd made her daddy disappear. When her mother had called her cursed and dropped her off with the grandfather she'd never known existed. Then her grandfather had given her to overhaul and the rest was history. She was a curse, a mistake, and right now she was doing everything she could to internalize the growing pressure. But it was like trying to dam a raging river with twigs or block a fire hose with a finger. No matter what she did the pressure kept growing and the slowly increasing weight on the right side of her head told the girl the pressure wasn't the only thing growing. A sudden bump sent Eri stumbling and for a moment she lost her concentration. She quickly tried to regain control but any influence she might have had was long gone. Hey, are you alright? A sudden voice startled her and she looked up to see a man in a business suit reaching out to her. His expression one of concern but Eri could only see the hand. A hand that would touch her and then, she knew, the man would disappear just like her daddy did. No she shouted, scrambling away from the man on all fours, don't touch me looking around frantically Eri only now noticed the mass of people surrounding her, people of all ages, people she might make disappear, forever. Fearful tears began to fall down her face and if anything the liquid seemed to make the people worry all that more. Hands reached out to her, voices questioned if everything was alright but all Eri could see, over and over again, was daddy reaching out to her asking how his little unicorn princess was doing then a pressure on her forehead, and daddy was gone leaving only his clothes behind. A gasp had caused four-year-old Eri to turn around to find her mother standing in the doorway of the room, a hand over her mouth as fearful eyes looked at her own flesh, and daughter. Mommy Eri had asked, ing her head innocently to the side, where did daddy go? Noo Eri screamed as she flashed back to the present, she wouldn't, she couldn't make anyone else disappear. Pushing herself to her feet she began to run away from the people, from her past, from everything. After all she was cursed, what did it matter what happened to her? As if in response the pressure surged with renewed force almost sending Eri to her knees. Looking up, her red eyes found the entrance to a park. She'd heard about parks before from one of the books a caretaker had left for her. They were quiet places, peaceful, where not a lot of people went. It was perfect. Slowly Eri forced herself forward stumbling almost drunkenly into the park as the pressure threatened to overwhelm her completely. Just a little more. Eri thought as she turned off the path stumbling into the trees nearby. Just a little farther. After around a minute and a half the trees cleared up and Eri found herself in a clearing devoid of people but encircled by trees. Perfect, was the last conscious thought Eri had as she collapsed to her hands and knees. She could feel the pressure already beginning to leak out and could, out of the corner of her eye, faintly make out the faint glow of her horn. Looking down Eri watched as the grass around her hands began to shrink, retreating back into the ground. Seeing her curse power at work once more caused Eri to try to grip down on the pressure. But once it started, her curse had no intention of bowing to her will once more. The pressure which had been building up all day and had been growing for weeks now erupted like Vesuvius over Pompeii. Eri opened her mouth but was unable to tell if a scream emerged so overwhelming was the force escaping her. Her horn now the size of the one she'd seen on the man on the news glowed with blinding light forcing Eri to squint to see. As she watched a seeming wave of power started to spread to the meadow around her in a circle with her at the center everything growing younger as if in a strange reverse time speed video. Grass and flowers grew smaller and smaller retreating into the ground leaving bare dirt devoid of any greenery. A small rabbit hidden by the grass attempted to run but was caught in the wave of power growing even smaller before disappearing as if it had never been there at all. Eri hoped that her power would be contained to the meadow, that she would be able to protect anyone that may have been around her but her hopes died as the wave of power reached the trees on the meadow's edge. Giant trees 30, 40, even 50 feet tall that had taken years, decades, maybe even a century or two to reach set heights shrank into the earth in mere moments. Tears leaked from Eri's eyes as her curse spread, and the life around her disappeared. Maybe, she thought bitterly, it would be better if my curse took me too. At least then I won't be able to hurt people. All I do is hurt. I'm a monster, a curse just like Overhaul said. I'm just like him. Eri wept bitterly at the thought, the knowledge that she was just like the man she saw as evil incarnate, that she could be as bad as he was, it was heartbreaking to see. And the universe seemed to decide to give the girl a break. Messy black hair floated into the air as the owner's red eyes glowed brightly. To Eri it was as if all the pressure disappeared in a moment, simply vanishing without a trace. Sitting up on her knees Eri gingerly reached upwards and touched a small bump on her head the size of a dumb dumb lollipop she'd once had it took a moment for Eri to realize that the bump was her horn but when she did she couldn't stop the tears of joy from falling. 
She might not know a lot about her curse but she did know that the bigger her horn grew the longer a session lasted when the power erupted. Hey, a tired voice called out, sending Eri frantically turning around in fear, looking for the man who'd spoken. Are you alright? Yes, Eri responded hesitantly as she sat still although her eyes darted around frantically. Good, the voice responded and as Eri watched a black shadow fell from the branches of a tree that had yet to be hit by her power to the ground below. It would have ed if I'd had to get my friend to knock you out. As the man stood up Eri took in his strange appearance. The man was tall and slender with pale skin and messy, shoulder-length black hair that hung partially in front of his face. He appeared fatigued, on the verge of either passing out or taking a much-deserved nap. Unkempt facial hair and tired, flat, half-lidded black eyes currently focused on Eri only added to that conception. He wore a ragged black outfit consisting of a long-sleeved shirt and matching pants tucked into a pair of boots. A strange silver scarf hung around the man's neck and a pair of bright yellow goggles rested comfortably on his forehead. On the pro-hero eraser head, the man spoke, causing Eri to turn her attention from his outfit to the man's face, we can excuse your unlicensed quirk use, you're young and it's obvious from a glance that you don't have much control over it. But why are you here by yourself and where are your parents? Eri opened her mouth to speak but froze. How was she supposed to respond the few times she'd managed to escape the shy Hasekai base overhaul had shown up claiming to be her father but her real mommy and daddy were gone? Well Eraser had questioned and looking up Eri found the man's hair floating in the air as he glared at her with now red eyes not dissimilar to her own. I'm waiting. The intimidating technique was too much for Eri after the day she'd had so she did what any young child would do when faced with something scary, she started to cry. Immediately Eraserhead's hair fell back down and his red eyes returned to their normal black color. W8, he stuttered, holding his hands out placatingly obviously nervous, and on edge, there's no reason to cry, I'm not mad. I was just trying to get you to tell me what I needed to know to help you. See, he said gesturing to his face as Uri looked at him as she sniffled. I'm not scary. Then the hero smiled. Unfortunately for Eraserhead the man did not have much experience smiling. As such what was supposed to have been a reassuring grin the hero modeled and promptly on All Might came out as a deranged, maniacal smile that when combined with the man's facial hair and tired looks made the man out to be quite villainous in appearance. Eri's eyes watered once more and she began to bawl once more actual waterfalls coming out to turn the dirt around the white-haired girl into mud. A blow to the back of the head caused Eraserhead to stumble forward and he turned to cast a quick glare at his friend. Unfortunately for him she was not intimidated and merely at an eyebrow at him as she tilted her head towards the child in question. Scaring children now Eraserhead if you aren't careful your ranking will fall even lower. She shook her head as she folded her arms in front of her ample s. Tch tch tch, what would your mother think? Her sweet young showed a scaring children. Shut up, Eraserhead grumbled tilting his chin downwards so his capture scarf covered the bottom of his face, you know I'm not good with children. The underground hero mumbled. And yet you're a teacher. The woman questioned with a raised eyebrow. There's a difference, my students want to be heroes. They're teenagers, practically adults and I treat them as such. That didn't stop you from expelling your entire class last year, his partner pointed out. Only to whistle innocently as Shota turned his glare on her. They treated it like a game, like a joke. They expected to come out on top and only thought about the fame and money they could earn. They didn't care about helping others, all they cared about was themselves. We don't work 95 jobs and this isn't a ing video game, it's a matter of life and death where not only our lives but the lives of countless others are entrusted to us for protection. And besides, he mumbled almost inaudibly, Nezu let them back in. Okay I get your point, the woman raised her hands in the air only to direct her right pointer finger at Shota's chest. But, that doesn't mean they can't learn. This year no expelling the entire class on the first day, that's an order. Yes, ma'am the tired hero muttered, Nezu already told me I can only expel one the first month, and even then it'll be subject to review. Any other expulsions have to go through him. Great, his partner said cheerfully, nice to see the rat actually keeping you in line this year. I know you guys over at UA. Get a ton of freedom but he needs to make sure that you guys know that there's a line you can't cross. After all, she said, her cheerful expression becoming deadly serious, and in Shota's humble opinion far more intimidating than any glare he could ever hope to pull off, you wouldn't want me to come investigate you would ya? No, Eraserhead sighed. Great, now what's the deal with the girl? Don't know, Shota sighed as he leaned back against a nearby tree, wasn't able to get anything out of her before she started crying. It's obvious that she doesn't know a whole lot about her quirk though and it looks like a stockpile kind if I've got to guess. Her horn was the size of Miyagi's, you know from the news, but when I erased it it turned into that. He said gesturing at the girl who'd finally stopped crying and was now watching the two through cautious, puffy red-rimmed crimson eyes. When it was activated her power spread out in a wave affecting all of her surroundings although I'm unsure if that was due to how much power she'd accumulated or some other factor. All I can tell is that it affects living things, she turned a meadow into this, he said gesturing to the bare dirt around them, and I saw her make a rabbit disappear. Disappear. Vanish, poof, whatever you want to say one moment it was there the next it wasn't. 
We'll need to get her file if we want to learn more and maybe even a quirk doctor if her quirk has changed in some way. Might have been mislabeled or misclassified. Could explain why she doesn't have control over it. Okay, his partner said, nodding her understanding as she moved towards the girl who began to crawl backwards, her expression fearful. Seeing that the woman stopped and crouched down, balancing on the of her feet so that the young girl wouldn't feel pressured. Hey there, cutie I'm not gonna hurt you I just wanna help. For a moment the girl was quiet, obviously studying the lady, judging her to see if her words were trues. What's your name? The woman blew up her cheeks in an obvious pout. What you mean you don't recognize me from TV? That hurts cutie. The girl giggled quietly and then froze, seeming shocked that she'd made such a noise. My name's not cutie it's Eri. She complained, blowing up her cheeks in a rather adorable imitation of the woman's pout. And what a cute name for a cutie like you, Wellery to answer your question, the woman said, standing up to strike a pose which showed off her skin tight. Sleeveless, black bodysuit with knee guards and two protective plates that covered the rather large assets hidden underneath I'm a pro hero. She shook her head, causing her dark blue and pink two-tone hair tied up in a ponytail to flutter about exposing the long rangefinder in the shape of a lightning bolt over her right eye, the sniper hero Lady Nagant. Golden rays from the setting sun filtered in through the half-open blinds, dyeing the bright white room in warm shades of orange and yellow. The only sound was the slow steady beeping of a heart monitor, a dull, rhythmic thumping, and the low breathing of two individuals, the room's sole occupants. One of the individuals lay in one of the many hospital beds scattered around the room, eyes closed seemingly unconscious. Her pale face was upturned and decorated with a myriad of purple and blue bruises, slightly faded at the edges. Black hair the color of a raven's wing spilled out over the pillow her head rested upon, framing it like a dark halo. A blanket rested across the girl's waist, weighed down by the arms lying limply across it. When combined with the loose bandages wrapped around the young woman's large chest the two pieces of fabric protected the girl's modesty from the gaze of her lone companion. Said companion sat in a chair beside Momo's bed hunched over, his forearms resting on the top of his thighs while his hands lay firmly clasped between his spread knees. His right foot tapped a steady, if slightly offbeat, rhythm against the cool tile floor but Izuku's emerald gaze stayed firmly locked on the unconscious face of the woman, who, in the last ten months, had risen to replace his mother as the most important woman in his life, the one alive at any rate. Closing his eyes Izuku took a deep breath before opening them again and letting the orbs wander over Momo's exposed body. The words of the underground private doctor who'd been hired to treat her two days ago, the day after the raid, running through the green eight's head as he did so. She's lucky to be alive, Izuku's eyes found their way downward from the ravenette's bruised face to the raw reddish pink skin that covered her shoulders, neck, and upper chest although Izuku knew there was more on her forearms and lower legs, but even then the damage to her body is extensive. The burns are minor mostly first degree, second at worst and those are simple to treat with some antibiotic petroleum jelly. I'll wrap them in bandages and in a few days they should be good to come off so long as you make sure to keep the skin moist by reapplying the jelly semi-regularly. The doctor had sighed, that's the easy bit though, it's everything else that you should be worried about. Blinking Izuku's eyes continued their journey traveling from Momo's collarbone to her left arm, broken in two different spots with numerous fractures along the rest of the bone. The doctor had shaken his head, it'll take her easily 12 weeks to heal and be longer still for her to get it back up to even a portion of how much strength it used to have. As for if she'll ever be as strong as she once was, the doctor had shrugged helplessly. I don't honestly know, it'll depend on her and her body as well as how far she's willing to push herself. Izuku's eyes moved from Momo's shattered arm back up the Ravenette's body before settling on her bruised face once more, his focus on a particularly large bruise just slightly off her right temple. Her head's the worst, the doctor had said, opening one of Momo's eyes he'd shined a flashlight into it moving the small device back and forth looking for a response. She took repeated heavy blows to the head and the computed tomography scan showed swelling in her brain. Her skull has been fractured in two places both in the front and back, likely from where she took the blows and then from where her head slammed into something, hard. She's comatose, the doctor had said bluntly rubbing his eyes, and only the fact that evoked response testing showed that stimuli was reaching her brain is keeping me from calling her brain dead right now. When will she wake up Izuku had asked as he held Momo's hand, giving it a soft, reassuring squeeze. The doctor had given him a deadpan look, she's comatose and despite what it may seem like medicine hasn't progressed, that much the last two centuries, you know with quirks emerging and throwing everything we thought we know out the window. Izuku had lowered his head letting his viridian hair fall in front of his eyes, he did know. Just like every other kid around the world Izuku had sat in class and learned about how the world had gone to hell when quirks first emerged. Governments had fallen only for new ones to rise and take their place. Some countries had tried to segregate or persecute quirked individuals only to stop as the numbers of the very people they decried swelled as more and more people developed powers of their own. The emergence of villains hadn't helped matters and with heroes at the time only existing in comic books, and on the screen vigilantes were the ones to step forward to try and restore order. The only problem was they could be just as bad and in some cases even worse than the villains. In such an anarchist state the police and militaries of the world were next to useless serving more as targets for weapons, 
and supplies than sources of relief. The decision by most not to use quirks as weapons due to the majority of quirks belonging to children had put the forces of justice even more at a disadvantage. However, their decision to not inscript the youth as child soldiers ended up changing everything. According to the textbooks it was the children, raised in chaos and disorder, who had been the ones to restore peace to a broken world. They had watched as the people who risked themselves every day to help others turned away from the easy choice, passing their problem on to the next generation, in favor of shouldering the burden themselves. They'd watched and observed and in the following decades they had shown how the choice had inspired them. Some went bad but the vast majority helped and became what many considered to be the first heroes, even if it was unofficial. However even with their help it had still taken decades for basic order to be restored and several more for technology to recover to the level it had been. As it was, the majority of technology nowadays was just slightly above what it had been during the pre-quirk era with some exceptions. There was a reason people still drove cars on the road but prosthetic limbs looked like something out of an old pre-quirk era Siffy movie, Luck of the Draw. Medicine however was an issue that was still rather behind. With every single person's body being different medicines were now more often than not made specifically for the individual, and treatments were now as unique as the people they were used on. After all, when one patient had acid for and another had the body of a horse from the waist down you couldn't give the two the same tests, or you'd be liable to melt yourself and get a horseshoe to the gut. That's why healing quirks were so heavily desired and those with them were heavily pushed towards pursuing medicine. As a career, it allowed the user to bypass all the details and conflicts that were normally there to just fix what was wrong. It was why the youthful heroine recovery girl was a name known to most doctors and nurses around the country despite her elderly age. Her quirk heal allowed her to speed up a person's recovery process allowing her to fix injuries that would take months to heal in seconds with a mirror. Her retirement from professional practice to take a position at UA had been a source of deep sorrow to the medical community and one quite a few still ed about on online forums behind the anonymity the internet provided. Unfortunately Izuku didn't know anyone with a healing quirk nor did all for one believe it was safe to give Momo the super regeneration quirk he'd given Izuku to heal him after his ill-fated fight with Slugger. Izuku could still vividly recall the conversation the two had had over the phone, Izuku having called the masked man from outside the hospital wing within Cherry Blossom Manor, where Momo lay as soon as the doctor had left. Izuku, what do you know about quirks? Izuku had been silent for a moment, wondering if all for one was testing him again. A quirk is a superhuman ability people possess. There are three types and… And what about what makes a quirk genetically speaking? Um Izuku had racked his brain trying to remember what he'd read over the years in the faint hope that one of the medical textbooks would have told him he had even a chance of developing a meta-ability of his own. There's a term, one that refers to the traits that compose a person's quirk. Quirk factors. All for one supplied, plus alpha traits is another acceptable term in some circles although I personally prefer the former over the later. Yeah, Izuku said, nodding his head even though the man couldn't see it. Everything was coming back to him now, quirk factors are not only the primary quirk power, but also the genetic and biological mechanisms that allow the quirk to function. Overhaul's quirk factor is located in the hands which is why once Chisaki, Izuku paused for a moment as his actions to the man's unconscious body rose to the forefront of his thoughts before he shoved them down, lost his he couldn't use it anymore. Perfect, all for one said, and Izuku could practically feel his mentor's proud smile. But there is more, information known only to me and a few select others. What is it Izuku asked eagerly, more than ready to learn anything new he could about quirks, the powers that made up his world. It is possible to manipulate one's genetic structure to have multiple quirks to give a person more than one quirk factor. That's what you do, Izuku whispered at the realization, his mouth falling open in awe at the sheer number of possibilities this knowledge presented. Indeed, all for one confirmed, my quirk allows me to give and take quirks. I analyze the genetic structure of a person's quirk, destroying it in the process, and copy it, graft it if you will, within my own DNA within the genetic information of my quirk itself. When I give someone a quirk I do the same thing copy the quirk's genetic information from within myself before pasting it onto whomever I am giving it to passing it along and making the person's body react as if the quirk had always been there. Unlike an organ transplant where the recipient's body might reject the new organ this process smooths out the transfer, basically tricking the body into believing the quirk had always been there, that it's a part of them. Then you can give Momo, super regeneration, Izuku had said excitedly, you can heal her then take it back and give it to Toga before. No I cannot all for one had growled, bringing Izuku's excitement to a halt mid-sentence. Slowly the former king of the underworld exhaled, do not make presumptions when you do not have all the information Izuku, he chided, his voice once more calm, instructive even, it can cost you everything. It did me. The last part was spoken softly, a whisper but it was still loud enough that it was picked up and transmitted to the green eat on the other end. 
I am able to have multiple quirks because all for one seems to have an infinite space to store the information of the quirks I steal. However even then there is a limit I am unable to overcome. It's like like a computer. Picture each quirk as a file with the size of the file varying between quirks. The stronger the quirk the bigger the file. Since quirks first emerged the size of the files have increased with each generation as quirks have grown more powerful and complex. I have an infinite memory or in other words I am theoretically capable of obtaining any number of quirks, storing the information within me to use at my discretion. However my body, the hardware is only able to handle so much power in a file before it gives out and breaks down. While I personally have an incredibly powerful hardware, the hardware of others, their bodies, are unable to keep up if I try to force their memory past what it is capable of. And what happens then Izuku asked, already fearing the answer. What happens to any computer all for one said his voice flat, devoid of any trace of emotion, it gives out. Slowly Izuku lowered the phone and turned to look through a pane of transparent glass into the room where Momo lay still in her bed, unnaturally still. The faint voice of All for One reached him through the phone. They become little more than mindless dolls living zombies with no will of their own. Puppets without string. Even when I take back the quirk their condition doesn't change. It's unnatural as if their very spirit has fled them. What about Gigantamacia Izuku had asked, raising the phone back to his ear as he tried to hang on to any shred of hope that was left. Unaware of the tears that fell from his eyes as he pictured Momo. The Ravenet girl, her face devoid of emotion and her eyes blank, unfocused, empty of the soul he'd grown to see within them every time their eyes met. He has multiple quirks but he's not mindless. I was getting to that, all for one side and Izuku could hear the man shift in his throne to get more comfortable. The person breaking upon getting a second quirk is what happens most of the time. All for one said, stressing the word, however there are exceptions. One thing that I have learned over the years is that a person's ability to handle a second quirk might be relative to a quirk strength, as well as if said quirk complement a quirk the person might already have. Izuku's silence attested to the boy's confusion and all for one gave an audible sigh over the phone, not of exasperation that he'd have to explain but rather, what Izuku presumed, was the fact that the man forgot that not everyone possessed the same information, and knowledge that he did. It's simple for anyone to see that some quirks are stronger than others. A flight quirk like the one possessed by that American hero captain celebrity would be stronger than a float quirk that merely lets someone levitate in midair. However a quirk that I possess, airwalk, would be stronger than float but weaker than Captain Celebrity's quirk, flight, as airwalk lets me stand on and control the air around me. As for quirks that complement one another that is far easier to explain. If someone had a quirk that gave them limited hydrokinesis their body would likely be able to withstand a quirk that allowed them to produce water since it would complement their already existing quirk. However if I gave them a quirk of the same strength except that it allowed them to produce fire, or when their body would likely shut down from the strain. So a person can only handle so strong a quirk without their body shutting down. Izuku said slowly, and if a quirk is complementary to the one they already have then it is far likelier for the recipient to be able to handle a new quirk, one potentially stronger than other quirks they would have been able to stand. Exactly, all for one confirmed, however neither matters in Yeyurazu's case. Very rarely, so rare in fact it has only happened twice in my life the second quirk I give someone will fuse with their original. When Yeyarazu's ancestor came to me and I gifted him line the quirk fused with the man's creation one combining the two into a single quirk one that carries some, if not most, of the powers of the quirks that created it. So tightly tied to the Yeyarazu line is the Yeyarazu quirk that it is one of the only quirks I am unable to steal. That means you can't take Momo's quirk, replace it with super regeneration, and then switch the two back, Izuku realized. You'd be forced to push another quirk upon her which would he trailed off at the picture his mind presented him with. Good, all for one interrupted, you're beginning to realize the conflict that lies there. However even when I give someone a quirk that they are able to handle it isn't uncommon for there to be side effects. What kind of side effects? The kind that drastically shortens the user's lifespan while possibly causing the body to physically tear itself apart. All for one said grimly. This is especially true for children and teenagers whose bodies aren't fully developed. In those cases there has never been anyone who has survived for any real length of time without being modified in some way. Izuku froze and listened numbly as all for one pressed on. Another possibility my associates and I theorized is that quirks that heal the body or provide energy to the user could potentially counteract the effects of having multiple quirk factors. We tested it on Gigantamacia but his body was already heavily modified at the time to help him withstand the strain so while our theory is plausible we would need more information to test it before we could implement it to help Yeyurazu. Then what do I do Izuku yelled in frustration, slamming his clenched right fist into the window beside him sending the glass pane wobbling. Oh how do I save her he sobbed as he collapsed to his knees leaning against the wall for support as his body was racked by heavy sobs, the tears which had been descending slowly now pouring out in a mad torrent. 
For a minute all for one was silent and as the time dragged on deep within Izuku, in the darkest parts of his mind where the voices that always told him he was useless dwelt, whispers once again began to emerge, birthed by his insecurities. Ones that whispered to the greenie telling him that just like everyone else all for one had abandoned Izuku too. There is hope Izuku, the man finally said, his words were softer, the tone reassuring and despite himself Izuku couldn't help but grasp onto them. Yesterday you successfully captured the vast majority of your targets. Gigantamesha brought me the ones he caught. But Chisaki, he's locked in the dungeon underneath the manor, Izuku interrupted and hadn't that been a surprise, to find a row of prison cells underneath the manor when he'd gone exploring soon after he first arrived. As far as Izuku was aware Overhaul was the first person to actually make use of the facilities although he hadn't asked Momo, it didn't exactly seem like a topic you could bring up in polite, everyday conversation. I've looked at your research, all for one set, Overhaul, the quirk, is a power capable of miraculous things. For a moment Izuku thought he heard something, a faint tone of wistfulness maybe, within the man's voice. It is entirely possible that with it you would be able to heal Yeyurazu, return her to her natural state. Izuku it is time. You mean, Izuku said, tears forming in his eyes as he imagined what was about to happen. What he could soon do to help Momo and Toga, the people he now considered to be his friends. Yes Izuku Midoriya, in two days it will be time for you to get overhaul as your very own quirk. Now Izuku sat at Momo's bedside, his eyes drooping from a lack of sleep the last two nights, if the black circles underneath his jade orbs were anything to go by. A yawn forced the green eat's mouth open, lasting for a good three seconds before Izuku managed to ring it in. Shaking his head Izuku tried to clear his mudded thoughts unconsciously causing his feet to cease their constant tipper tap. The soft groaning of a doorway behind him alerted Izuku to someone else entering the room, but he didn't even turn, rather feeling their presence walk up behind him where it stopped. How is she Toga asked, her voice soft. Turning to look over his left shoulder Izuku took in the blonde girl's condition. Like Momo, Toga had been severely injured from the raid, losing her left arm of which the only remnants were a few centimeters of flesh extending from her left shoulder to form a noticeable stump. The girl's choice of a spaghetti strap white tank top no bra Izuku noted impassively, due to his tiredness, seeing two hard protrusions in the middle of the vampire's fatty orbs gave the broccoli-headed boy a clear view of the injury. The stump was wrapped in bandages but Izuku had not yet spoken to the girl about what she wanted to do about it. All for one had no end of connection so an artificial limb wasn't an impossibility, but truthfully Izuku believed that such a prosthetic would vastly lower Toga's abilities. She hadn't told him in words but he had learned enough about her quirk in the limited time they'd been around each other to know that Toga's quirk factors were spread throughout her entire body allowing her to emit the grey goop that caused her transformation. No left arm, no transformation on that limb which meant while she could transform the rest of her body into whomever she possessed she would always be short a left arm. It might be possible for an artificial limb to emit a 306 static hologram of the person's normal arm, but a single touch from anything and Toga's cover would be blown. Without assistance and likely within enemy territory the risks of Toga being injured or killed were far too high for Izuku's liking, especially since he'd only learned since the Shai Hasekai raid how much he hated to see his companions get hurt following his orders. However the missing arm wasn't the only major injury Toga had received during the raid. Looking down Izuku's eyes settled on Toga's left thigh which was wrapped in bandages, concealing the baseball size hole that Izuku knew penetrated through the limb underneath. Sheer luck had caused the spike that impaled the blonde to miss the bone but even then it had torn the muscles and arteries to shreds. It was a miracle Toga had been able to make it back to the mansion before passing out and only the medicine within the hospital wing had kept her alive until the doctor had arrived the next day to see her. The doctor had begun operating immediately on the blonde mere minutes after examining her wound. For five hours he worked to reconnect arteries, muscles, and tendons all in an effort to keep the vampire from dying from loss or possibly requiring an amputation. He had emerged exhausted but pleased, and after almost a day and a half of rest Toga was walking on crutches despite the doctor's clear orders not to although she made sure to leave her injured leg off the ground, much to Izuku's relief. Like Momo the doctor had predicted a full recovery time of months without a quirk to speed up the process, and like the Ravenet Toga's strength after her recovery was uncertain. Looking back Izuku could imagine a dozen different ways to take down Overhaul without putting either of the girls in danger, but despite all his efforts he was unable to come up with a way to do that and capture the organization's other leaders at the same time. The raid had been the best bet but Izuku was still unsure if what he gained would outweigh the costs his two friends had paid. Shaking his head Izuku turned his head back to Momo as he responded to Toga's question. She's better, her bruises are fading slightly and her burns aren't as raw as they were. He blushed slightly, on thank you for changing her bandages and applying the burn cream. I know it must be hard doing it one-handed but if I did it, Izuku's face went from a light blush to beet red as images flashed through his mind that he didn't want to see but certainly liked. It's no problem, Toga said and Izuku shivered as two weights suddenly pressed into his shoulder blades. We wouldn't want anything inappropriate to happen to poor, defenseless, Momo now would we? Toga purred and Izuku shivered at her warm breath against his left ear feeling the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. 
TT Toga, he whimpered. Come on, Izuku, Toga whispered and Izuku thought he might have felt her lips brush against his ear. After what we went through I think the least you can do is call me Himiko. Titagouch Izuku screamed now wide awake as he turned to look at the vampires, his left hand coming up to cover his ear. Did you just bite me? He asked disbelievingly. Toga responded by ing her lips and Izuku felt rushed to his face as his eyes tracked the movement realizing for the first time just how full they were. You misbehaved, Toga exhaled and Izuku saw something strange in the girl's eyes. Playfulness mixed with, frustration now say it with me Himiko. Toga, Izuku warned but he was unable to react as the blonde pounced pushing Izuku back so he was leaning precariously off the chair he would have fallen if it wasn't for Momo's bed pushing into the top of his back keeping him semi-upright. Toga leaned over Izuku, her right hand pushing into Izuku's left shoulder and in her eyes Izuku saw that the playfulness was gone. Only the frustration remained before the blonde lowered her head, hiding her eyes from view. Say it. What? Say it Izuku's Viridian orbs locked with Toga's gold as the blonde brought her head up and the quirkless boy was surprised to see actual tears in the girl's eyes. You say her name. Toga. You do say it all the time Momo this, Momo that. I know we haven't known each other as long but you trust me. Toga looked at Izuku with clear unbridled desperation. You needed me for your plan to work. Trusted me. But now, now all you do is sit here by her bed. Toga gestured wildly in Momo's general direction, and worry about her. The only time you actually checked in on me was when the doctor was here but as soon as he left you went straight back to her. Tears leaked down Toga's cheeks but the blonde made no attempt to wipe them away. I have to know, she whispered, begged, I have to know that all this wasn't meaningless, our time together before I went undercover. Tell me it wasn't an act, that you weren't using me, that that you actually considered me a friend. Toga, Izuku said softly. Say it Toga screamed her face hidden by the wild yellow locks that fell forward to cover it. Tears dripped down onto Izuku's freckled cheeks but the green eight remained motionless. Please, say it. Toga whispered, her voice broken. For a moment silence fell over the room, the only sound Izuku's quiet breathing, the beeping of the heart monitor, and Toga's wild pants as she recovered her breath. Himiko. Toga's face sprang up, her hair falling to either side of her head as she looked at Izuku. W-H what? Himiko, Izuku said again, his eyes locking with hers which began to tear up once more. That's your name, the name of a girl I trusted explicitly to achieve my goals and the name of a girl I would be happy to call my friend. Tears fell from Tagano Himiko's eyes as her sole remaining hand left Izuku's shoulder to come up and cover her mouth. Himiko is the name of a girl who tried to hurt me, who's obsessed with, and can frankly get a little too excited about the smallest things but, Izuku smiled softly, not All Might's tooth-filled grin but a soft one, a simple upturning of the edge of his lips paired with the softening of his cold emerald eyes, for all her faults I would never change a single thing about her, it's what makes Himiko, well Himiko. Izu, Toga sobbed, burying her face in his chest, now broader and more defined due to months of training. Please, she whimpered, please tell me I can stay. That you won't send me away now that you don't need me. Tell me that you won't leave me alone. Izuku didn't speak for a moment, instead letting the question hang in the air. Himiko might not have realized the importance of her request but Izuku did. If Himiko stayed then she wouldn't be able to leave, all for one would make sure of it. However Izuku could also tell that the request was Himiko's worst fear made manifest, being alone, unloved due to her quirk and the requirements needed both to use it as well as the desires it manifested within her. Izuku might not know the girl's full past but he could hazard a rough guess. Abandonment, a fear of authorities due to actions likely not entirely her own. Quirk dependency on a liquid that people seemed to fear whenever it wasn't within their bodies. Himiko had suffered just like he had but unlike him she hadn't had someone there to help her. An inco of her own that offered unconditional love no matter how hard it got or how much the world seemed to turn on you. For a moment Izuku felt the grief that he'd buried deep within him well up but he forced it back down. Now wasn't the time he could mourn later, right now he had to focus on Himiko and his answer. Yes, he said softly in the way that the girl froze and her crying let him know she'd hurt him. You can stay but if you do, he warned, you won't be able to leave. Himiko looked up at him confused. I wouldn't stop you, Izuku said with a small bitter laugh, one that contained his years of torment and abandonment. But my teacher, my sensei, he would. He's protective that way. For a moment Himiko remained still and Izuku braced himself for her to stand up, to leave so he was unprepared when the blonde instead nuzzled herself deeper into his chest like a cat burying her face against his body. That's okay, she purred contently, as long as I have you I'll be fine. Izuku tried to sit up but Himiko's weight kept him down, leaving the two balancing precariously between the seat Izuku had been sitting in and Momo's bed. Tossari, Himiko Izuku corrected, can you please get off me now? Himkyo ignored the boy completely and as Izuku felt his ire beginning to grow he heard a repetitive soft sound emerge from the blonde's mouth. Izuku's left eye twitched as he realized that the girl had fallen asleep on him. Although annoyed Izuku forced himself to take a deep breath before exhaling heavily letting out a sigh he glanced down at the girl getting his first real good look at her since the raid. She was clothed in a simple white tank top with spaghetti straps, the top of which was pushed outward due to the girl's ample ass giving Izuku a nice view of not only Himiko's cleavage but also a few inches of her bare midriff, stopping just over the girl's belly button. 
Two rather hard spots, one on each of Himiko's s reminded Izuku that the girl currently wasn't wearing a bra, which sent the greenie into a blushing storm although it fell away once he realized that no one was there to see him in such a compromising position. It seemed to Izuku that Himiko's outfit showed more of the girl's skin, a warm peach color that contrasted against Momo's milky white, and clung to her body more than Izuku remembered. His opinion wasn't helped by the fact that Himiko has chosen to pair her top with an olive green skirt that fell just below her butt. In fact it was due to how short the skirt was that Izuku had even been able to see the bandages on Himiko's thigh in the first place. As he looked Himiko over the blonde seemed to shift unconsciously under his gaze, her head slinking back and forth before finally coming to a rest atop his chest, right over Izuku's heart that beat just a few inches below her. The movement brought Izuku's attention to the young vampire's face and once more his eyes found themselves wandering before stopping to rest on the blonde's full, plush lips. For a moment Izuku stared at them but when he realized what he was doing he shook his head and his eyes drifted up to Himiko's own closed eyes. Dark circles underneath them made Izuku shift slightly with guilt but he quickly stopped as his already awkward position caused him to slide a few inches lower towards the ground. Already on edge, uncomfortable, and frankly just not wanting to hit his head against the tiled floor, Izuku slowly rotated his shoulder blades and elbows in an effort to gain a few more inches of height, all while trying to avoid waking the girl atop him. It took him several agonizing minutes of sheer focused will but Izuku succeeded in raising himself up. Unfortunately the boy hadn't given his impromptu plan as much thought as he had the raid which led to the greenie, and the blonde atop him sliding into the already occupied bed at a near diagonal angle to where Momo lay, the two actually lying across her blanket covered thighs and waist. Once more Himiko moved her arms wrapping around Izuku's chest, hugging the boy in her sleep while Izuku flushed as she unconsciously pressed her body against him. Fortunately for Izuku, although his shoulder blades were now trapped by Himiko's hands, Izuku's arms remained free allowing the greenie to reach out to either side of himself in an effort to escape the blonde's tight grip while possibly allowing the boy to sit up. However, while his right hand sank into the mattress and the sheets that covered it, Izuku's left hand hit something equally soft, plush, and cloth-covered but vastly different in size and shape. Confused, the green eat squeezed the strange spherical mass, his hand sinking into it reminding the boy of the time he needed dough with his mother when the two made dinner together. The shape and feel of the mass was strange, unfamiliar, like nothing Izuku could recall touching before. As Izuku continued to finger the soft object his mind ran through the possibilities of just what it could be and as his fingers brushed against a hard protrusion on the mass it struck the boy just what, or rather who he might be touching, and where. Paralyzed by panic at the thought, Izuku's face turned the same red as the crimson Himiko loved so much, said liquid rushing to his face, currently frozen in an expression of horror. Slowly, jerkingly like a malfunctioning robot, Izuku's head turned to the left and his emerald orbs found his traitorous hand exactly where he feared it might be groping the bandaged covered flesh of Momo's. Well, at least it can't get any worse, Izuku thought with an empty smile on his face, as if his soul had vacated his body. Unfortunately, Izuku like most had not learned the lesson that the universe seemed to take sadistic pleasure in proving statements wrongs as at that very moment black goop forced itself out of the mouths of the bed's occupants. For a brief moment Izuku's eyes met the yellow of Himiko's, now wide awake, seeing the fear in them as all for one's warping quirk was used on her for the first time. Izuku tried to smile at the girl reassuringly but before he could the black liquid covered his face obscuring her from his view. When Izuku reappeared he found himself on the floor in all for one's makeshift throne room, lying on the floor before the seated man himself. The sound of groaning from his right told Izuku that Himiko lay on the ground beside him while a quick glance to his left alerted Izuku to the fact that Momo was there as well although it seemed the blanket she'd been sleeping under had accompanied her leaving the rave net clad and only the bandages around her chest and a pair of tight jean shorts that hugged her ample rear quite attractively. Detecting the man's well-hidden amusement at the state of his companions Izuku scowled. It seemed that his mentor found humor in the girl's closeness to Izuku although Izuku feared that their state of dress might make all for one think that he had been having his way with the two girls, never mind the fact that one of them was in a coma. I Izuku, Himiko said uncertainly as she pulled herself up to sit crisscross on the concrete floor. Her eyes flashed to him for answers before turning to look at the suited masked former emperor of the underworld. All the while her sole remaining hand remained out of his sight. Likely, if Izuku had to warrant a guess, clutching a throwing knife she'd hidden somewhere on her person. What's going on? A simple question but one with so so many possible answers but in this case there was only one part of it that Izuku cared about. Himiko, this is the man who's going to take Chisaki's quirk and give it to me. It was a show of how much Himiko trusted Izuku that the girl didn't even question his statement instead nodding along like the fact that there was someone who could give and take quirks made perfect sense. Okay Mr. Masked Guy, she said with a bright smile that displayed her prominent canines, nice to meet ya. Izuku was shocked by how casual Himiko was, even though the man had been nothing but good to him Izuku still felt the need to constantly stay on his best behavior around the injured criminal, as if everything that happened in his presence was a test and the slightest mistake or slip-up could, and would, lead to his death. 
Izuku wasn't sure if it was intentional on all for one's part or not but it certainly made him determined to try and meet the man's expectations. After all who knew what could happen to him if he didn't. After Himiko spoke, all for one stayed silent and Izuku mentally prepared himself to beg the powerful figure to spare the girl. They might not have had the months to build a relationship that Izuku had had with Momo but ever since their initial meeting in that deserted alley there was no denying the connection between them. Izuku had met a kindred spirit for the first time in his life and Himiko had too. Someone who could understand what they'd been through not from reading about it or seeing it but from living it, experiencing the derision, scorn, and hatred of those around them for things outside of their control. People say that monsters live under the bed, or in the shadows of the dark but those who'd lived through hell on earth knew that the real monsters were the ones that looked human but weren't. So it came was nothing but a surprise to the greeny when instead of getting mad at the blonde all for one did something Izuku had never seen the man do, he laughed. It was short, strained from the man's wounds, only lasting a few moments before it dissolved into a coughing fit but it was amused laughter all the same. Casting a look over at Himiko Izuku found the girl with her head head to the side. Her cat-like eyes full of the same confusion Izuku was currently feeling but as all for once coughing died down Izuku turned his attention back to his sensei. Thank you Himiko Toga, the man spoke, his tone slightly warm if Izuku had to put a word to it although he could only say that because of the months spent with the man. To someone meeting him for the first time the voice would have sounded as cold and devoid of warmth as it always seemed. It has been too long since I've found something so simple so amusing. He sighed, it is honestly refreshing to have someone who doesn't fear me on some level but unfortunately this is not the time to get to know one another better we have much to discuss, and much needs to be done. However before we begin Izuku, the green eat stiffened as he felt all for one's eyeless gaze turned to him. Who is this woman to you the voice just moments ago slightly warm and if not friendly courteous at least was now as cold as the vacuum of space. It was a voice that belonged to a ruler, one that sat above all others and Izuku could feel his desire to submit. The craziest thing. He suspected that this was not one of all for one's many quirks. No, this was the man's natural inborn charisma. She is a follower, he answered fighting the urge to bow down as he dared to return the man's gaze with his own. One that I came across when I was recruiting for the raid and it would not be a lie to say that it is due to her that the raid went off as well as it did. Without Himiko I have almost no doubt that Chisaki would have escaped in the confusion and I would have had to waste precious time tracking him down. A pursuit which would have an increased chance of failure due to him now being on the lookout for any attacks or pursuers. So she's useful, all for one summarized coolly, giving nothing away when it came to his personal thoughts on the matter. Izuku felt a bead of sweat trickle down the side of his face but continued on. Yes, he said nodding his confirmation. Despite knowing that all for one lacked working eyes he had no doubt the man could very well see him just fine. Her quirk is useful for reconnaissance, spying, infiltration. Ooh, ooh, Toga interrupted with a grin, her hand raised in the air like the schoolgirl she normally dressed as as both men turned to look at her. Don't forget assassinations I can do those too, she said proudly with a nod of her head up and down. And assassinations, Izuku conceded. She's also the only person to return to me from the raid despite suffering the worst injuries as far as I'm aware of anyone else besides Momo. Izuku's eyes, despite his best efforts, darted to the left corners of his eyes in an effort to find comfort in the Ravenets, albeit unconscious, presence. And what are your plans for her? She's proven her loyalty and her usefulness, Izuku said slowly as he decided to take a risk so I intend for her to serve me directly. With Momo heading off to infiltrate UA, I need a lieutenant to assist me. Gigantamasha has proven that while he will do as I command, he does so out of loyalty to you, not to me. I have yet to prove my worth to him and I fear that I will be unable to do so without a quirk. Himiko though, she trusts me and follows me, she follows my orders even when they endanger her and she has shown that she is willing to do whatever it takes to help me. As Izuku spoke he kept his eyes firmly locked onto his mentor's mask, determined not to see the blonde's reaction to his next words. To me she is irreplaceable if not for her quirk, then her personality. She's someone I can see myself coming to like being around. For a moment silence descended only to be interrupted mere seconds later by a vampire's shriek of joy. I see you KU and Himiko yelled as she lunged forward wrapping the boy in a one-armed hug as she began to run her head up and down against his neck and chin like a cat, the resemblance so uncanny Izuku could practically feel the girl purring. You were so cool, it made me like you even more she leaned into him pressing her chest against his arm, burying the limb in between her cleavage as she looked up at him with admiring, worshipful eyes. If you keep saying such nice things about me I don't think I'll be able to control myself, she said as a blush crossed her face, her yellow eyes glazing over as if seeing images Izuku felt he would honestly rather not know about. Izuku blushed too as he averted his eyes away from Himiko's cleavage, where they'd inevitably been drawn. 
It's nothing, he stuttered. I was just as saying what I honestly thought. A low chuckling interrupted the two and together they turned to face the masked man still sitting in his throne although all for one now let back to rest comfortably in his chair. No longer sitting up like he was ready to take action if he deemed it necessary. I see what you mean about loyalty, the man said, his filtered voice filling the room. She is incredibly attached to you especially for how little time you've known each other. It's almost suspicious as all for one trailed off Himiko straightened up. Although she still kept her arms encircling Izuku she was no longer pressing herself against the green eat. The only way for those who knew her to tell she was on edge. Are you asking me a question the blonde asked emotionlessly. Her face blank and eyes dead as she tilted her head slightly to the side. No, no, no all for one denied waving the question aside with a swish of his hand, merely making a point. I know how much Izuku must trust you to say that but I wonder if you understand just what it is you have at your disposal. If you think. But it doesn't matter, all for one said, looking down on the two, reminding them just who was in charge. Izuku's choices are his own. I am merely here to support him, to act as a guide and mentor when he asks it of me. He will make mistakes but he will learn from them and he will grow. This is a fine example of a choice that could backfire on him or benefit him greatly. Either way he will grow stronger from the experience. However, shifting in his seat, all for one bent forward appearing almost eager. Himiko is not the main reason you are here is it? No, Izuku whispered. You're here because you want something, something you worked for months to get isn't that right Izuku when the green eat didn't press on instead looking downwards the man pressed on regardless. I can only imagine what it was like to, after years of abuse for something you had no say in, get a power, a quirk to call your own. Izuku heard a gasp of surprise from beside him but didn't turn. He didn't want to see the golden cat-like eyes of his new lieutenant friend. Other whatever their newfound relationship was, Izuku didn't think he could stand it if he saw Himiko looking at him with pity. People pitied him and he hated it, they were being condescending. Hypocrites, liars looking down on him despite saying, acting like they didn't. They were all fakes, even the heroes. When the number one hero tells you that you can never be a hero, never save someone, or help just because you lack a quirk to call your own well, you can't be any more of a hypocrite than that when you proclaim for all to hear that anyone can be a hero. Letting out a deep breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding, Izuku imagined he was breathing out all of his anger, not forgetting it but rather burying the feelings down to use later. Izuku knew emotions could be a powerful motivation so long as you didn't let them control you and after the life he had, Izuku had more than enough motivation to last him for years. It was hard, Izuku reminisced, and then to lose it all again he shivered as he trailed off, remembering the feeling of loss he'd felt waking up all those months ago, reaching inside for a power he'd had for mere hours only to find it empty, gone. It had been one of the worst moments of his life, as if his dreams were shattering all over again and Izuku could scarcely imagine what it would be like to people who'd had their quirks for years. It would be cataclysmal, as if a piece of their soul, their identity had been carved out of them and taken away. When you offered me a new quirk, a replacement every part of me wanted to say yes, to accept anything no matter how weak or useless it was just so I could have a quirk to call my own again. But, yes, that's not what I want, looking up, his head having fallen forward as he recalled his traumatic past, Izuku gave all for one a powerful look. It was unconscious but the grievously wounded Lord of Darkness couldn't help but smile under his mask. The look was filled with purpose, something Tamira still had yet to find and comparing the two in his head all for one couldn't help but marvel at how much further ahead of his former heir the latter appeared to be. Focusing back on the green eat all for one managed to hear the boy's next words. I want to transform society, change it irreparably so that the broken system we have in place right now is nothing but pages in a history book. However you've shown me that nothing can be done without power, raising his right hand, curled into a fist, Izuku stared at the appendage as he continued to speak, his voice soft, a whisper, seemingly lost in his own thoughts. For so long I've been powerless, useless, nothing but a Deku. He scowled at the last word, spitting it out as if it personally offended him. It probably did all for one thought thoughtfully. Deku, useless, it was a childish nickname if it was one. A simple play on the characters that made up the boy's name but one that could be highly effective on the developing mentality of a child. One that was quirkless in a society where your quirk was everything to a great many. If he had been called that ever since he'd been diagnosed and had years of mistreatment added to it, well, all for one could easily see himself hating the word with a passion if he had been in the boy's worn red shoes. However now, now I have the chance to get something I've always wanted and use it to build the world of my dreams. I should be ecstatic, excited, and yet as happy as I am I can't help but feel more scared than I've ever been in my life. That's because you don't know, looking up Izuku found all for one looking down on him as if the man had just noticed something he'd missed before. Before you knew deep down what the future held for you your place in the pecking order and despite your dreams you never made any attempt to change that. Izuku's mouth opened at that but fell shut as a look of contemplation crossed his face allowing the centuries-old man to continue. But now, now you don't know what the future holds, what possibilities await you. The world is opening itself to you in ways that it never has before and that newness, that originality, it's intimidating. For a moment all for one paused, allowing Izuku to think over his words, however, you need to remember that you are not doing this on your own. 
I am here, as always, to guide you. Yeirazu is there to support you and now Miss Toga is as well. You are no longer alone and with the power that awaits you I truly believe that you truly stand a chance of making all your dreams of a world of equality, fairness come true. Izuku didn't feel it as he collapsed to his knees. He didn't feel it as Himiko rushed forward, her face panicked as she shouted, asking if he was okay. He didn't notice all for one beginning to rise from his throne and worry before relaxing as one of his many quirks let him know the reason for the green eat's momentary weakness. Izuku wasn't aware of any of that, all he knew was that the spot deep inside of him, the one that had been cold and dark for so long, was finally breaking. It was a spot created from a life spent isolated, alone, separate from his peers, friends, and even his own family. A fear so ingrained in Izuku's nature that it might as well have been a part of his soul was shattering apart as the Greenit realized that, for the first time in his life, he had people who would stay by him, who believed in him. That wouldn't leave him or abandon him, at the drop of a hat or a moment of weakness. And as Izuku's brain finally began to understand just what it was he now had the dark voices within the green eat. The ones that had haunted him for years telling him he was useless, disliked, hated the voices that on the rooftop where All Might had crushed his dreams had yelled out at the boy urging him to take his so-called friend's advice, and Jump finally began to fall away. Izuku didn't know how long he spent on the cold concrete floor crying his emerald eyes out. He didn't know how long he knelt there, leaning into Himiko's one-armed embrace as the blonde rubbed circles into his back with her sole remaining hand, her eyes looking at his body shaking as it was raked by heart-wrenching sobs with a mixture of emotions worry, pity, fear, but most of all concern. Izuku wasn't aware of all for one raising his hand, a telepathy quirk silently activating to carry the comatose Yeirazu from the floor where she'd been lying to an empty wooden table that rested nearby. All he was aware of was the feelings flowing through him overflowing with their sheer strength after years of disuse. After he'd been diagnosed as quirkless Izuku had begun to distance himself from everyone around him, a process made easier by the fact that his classmates and teachers had begun to treat him like a leper, someone with a disease that they could catch if they weren't careful. Even his mother, and co, had it been spared as slowly Izuku began to retreat into the confines of his room, hiding the bruises and burns, the result of countless beatings, from the woman's concerned gaze. He'd learned his lesson the first time he'd complained to her showing her a bruise from where he'd been shoved off the playground, scratching his hands and forming a bruise on his arm from how he'd landed. The next day his mother had stormed the school with a fury that reminded young Izuku of the dragons he'd read about in his storybooks. However while the Viridian-haired woman might have seemed like a dragon to the young boy to the principal, and staff she was nothing more than an annoyance, one that took the form of a small, barely 5'3 portly woman whose best days had clearly been left in the past. All that had come of his mother's tirade had been a lazy reminder from Izuku's homeroom teacher reminding the class that bullying was not allowed in the school so as the man put it looking at them through his wire-framed glasses with bored gray eyes. Don't come and complain to me about it unless it's a serious matter. The message had been clear and even if it hadn't been Bakugo was more than willing to make sure Izuku understood it during free time. This time with the help of the rest of the class who'd each taken their turn to beat the small boy with their little meaty fists, or uselessly claw at him with barely developed quirks, all of which were too weak to do more than put pressure on Izuku's skin, too weak to even from a bruise. Only Bakugo had actually hurt him that day, activating his quirk and creating an explosion right in Izuku's face. It had been big enough to catch a teacher's attention and for a brief moment Izuku had hoped as they walked over an expression of concern on their face that finally, someone might care enough to check on him, to tell Bakugo to stop and make sure that Izuku was alright. But it hadn't happened instead the teacher had merely taken Bakugo's hands in hers and looked them, and the blonde, overwordly while going on about how the explosion could have hurt him, could have damaged his hearing from the noise, or caused his arm to break from the force it exerted since his body wasn't fully adjusted to it. As she'd been preparing to leave to take Bakugo to the nurse to get him checked over Izuku had reached out towards the teacher weakly, his voice speaking the thoughts running through his childish head, why why won't you help me? He'd spoken loud enough for the teacher to hear and as she stood up and began to turn around Izuku could picture it. Picture an expression of concern on her face as she came over and apologized saying that she'd merely seen Bakugo first, and no need activated his quirk, that she hadn't noticed Izuku due to her focus being on the blonde. Izuku could see himself accepting her apology, saying that it was alright before she took both of the boys to the nurse. Bakugo would go back to being his best friend and the others would decide that Izuku could be their friend too everything would go back to how it had been the day before Izuku had been diagnosed and Izuku could put this all behind him as if it were a bad dream. He could picture it all so clearly that he began to smile a bright childish one filled with hope for the future, but it fell as the teacher turned his way an expression on her face not of concern but of contempt, disgust and only latter would Izuku know that her ire was directed at him. Why her voice rang out over the green-haired toddler like the voice of a god which to the young boy and most children and general adults seemed to be filled with scorn, 
and derision. Why would I help a Deku she asked using the nickname Bakugo had started to use for the green eat. She'd left then, left with Bakugo leaving Izuku to lie there in the dirt, his hand still outstretched as his eyes looked blankly at their retreating figures, growing ever smaller. The other children left him alone there on the ground, spreading out and splitting up into groups as they played games with their friends. Everyone had somebody to be with, something to do everyone that is except for useless, quirkless, Izuku Midoriya. When he'd gone home that day his mom had asked him how it had gone and for a moment Izuku had hesitated. He wanted to tell her the truth, tell her that despite her efforts things had only gotten worse. That Bakugo had actually used his quirk on Izuku for the first time only she couldn't see it since Izuku had been a good boy washing the dirt and ash off his face and clothes like the teacher had told him to. He wanted to tell her everything but after a moment of silence he'd flashed her a bright smile, the same one he'd had on his face as the teacher had turned. And then he lied, telling his mother that everything had been just fine. That Bakugo had been annoyed at being reprimanded but that was it and all his other classmates had been nice to him. His mother had smiled at him and returned to making Katsudan, Izuku's favorite, humming a quiet tune to herself slightly off-key as Izuku retreated to his room. In the space, darkened from drawn curtains, Izuku had pulled up All Might's debut video his mom had taught him how to after his diagnosis and a hopeless attempt to make her son feel better pausing it on a close-up of the man's signature grin as the speakers stopped after uttering that then unranked hero's first words to a chaotic world. As his signature line I am here slowly fell away leaving the room silent, Izuku turned to a nearby mirror. Slowly, hesitantly his lips split apart as the green eat smiled, the same one he'd shown to his mother and teacher earlier that day. As he studied his reflection, looking it over, Izuku couldn't help but wonder if his eyes had always appeared so lifeless and dull. No, he shook his head as he pushed the rising voices of doubt down. Everything was fine, he was okay. Eventually everyone would get over his quirklessness, realize that even if he didn't have a power Izuku wasn't useless, a Deku. Bakugo would realize it and the two could be friends again, go back to the ways things used to be before the visit to the doctor. He could still be a hero, be like All Might. Sure there had never been a quirkless hero in the decades since the position became an official job. Sure hundreds if not thousands of quirkless had tried to become heroes, tried to defy the opinion of society, only to often end up critically injured, dead, or heavily traumatized either physically or mentally but that didn't matter. As he restarted the video his jade eyes glued to All Might's muscular form Izuku renewed his resolve to be like the man, to help others, to be a hero. Back in the present Izuku's shuddering sobs began to die down they hadn't lasted more than a few minutes but to him they had been the release of years of loneliness, fear, and derision. Izuku took a deep breath, before letting it out. His bottom lip still trembled as he exhaled but to those there, the conscious ones anyways, it was obvious that the green eat was once more taking control of himself, harnessing his emotions. Are you alright Himiko asked concerned but Izuku ignored her, his gaze silently focused on the seated man who'd both given, and taken, his first quirk. He wished to continue. All for one said, it was not a question though it may have sounded as such, it was a statement. Yes, and you are in control. Yes, I apologize for my outburst. Izuku said, bowing his head in apology to those present. Himiko waved her hand in front of her face as her seemingly permanent blush grew a shade darker. It's fine, she said with a forced laugh. I'm always willing to find out more things about my friends. All for one was silent for a moment, his head lowering a bit in thought before rising to look at Izuku as the green eat rose from his own bow. It is fine to feel emotions, Izuku, the Emperor of Darkness spoke, his filtered voice leaking through the mask that rested on his scarred face, to feel pain, hatred, but also love, happiness, and joy. We may be villains but we are not monsters, not all of us anyway, not completely so to experience emotions, to grow from experiences, success and failures, that is the most human thing of all. Now I believe it is time to give you what you have worked so hard all these months to earn. As he spoke the man raised his hand and the black goop that had brought the three teens to him appeared from the ground sprouting into a vague pillar that fell away and dispersed leaving the man known as Kai Chisaki in its place. Though he wore the same clothes as the day the shy Hasekai had been raided but if one saw the young man now they would certainly not believe him to be the young master of the powerful Yakuza group. Chisaki's dark green jacket was missing entirely from his assembly as was his tie and mask. The sleeves of his black dress shirt were torn off leaving frayed edges that ended just above his elbows and his pants, torn in several places, were dirtied by brown stains and a mysterious dark liquid whose origins was better left a mystery. However the greatest change in the man's appearance were the bandages wrapped around the man's wrists, where his arms abruptly ended. Dirtied by dried the bandages were beginning to yellow, clearly having not been changed since they'd been roughly wrapped around his arms. Despite his sudden appearance, and as Izuku and Himiko could attest a brief feeling of suffocation, Chisaki's face remained expressionless, a thousand-yard stare in his eyes. He was clearly alive but it was like he was dead, his soul crushed, and Izuku couldn't help but compare it to all for one's description of those who were overwhelmed when given additional quirks. they become little more than mindless dolls living zombies with no will of their own. Puppets without string as if their very spirit has fled them. Kai Chisaki, all for one spoke, pausing a moment to give the man in question a chance to speak. 
When no retort was forthcoming the man continued although he sounded displeased at the lack of a response. Do you know why you are here nothing? The sound of all for one's deep filtered breathing filled the room. Clearly he was not pleased nor used to those he spoke to not giving him their undivided attention yet Kai Chisaki stood there all the same and did exactly that. A hiss of gas emitted from all for one's mask as the man seemed to force himself to calm down, to rein in his emotions. It doesn't matter, he said after a moment, whether you are aware of your surroundings or not whether you know who I am or not. All that matters is the power that resides in your body. The power Izuku desires as he finished speaking all for one rose from his throne and strode forward reaching Chisaki in three large strides he grabbed the man's forehead with his left hand. Your quirk. Now Chisaki reacted, his blank expression fell away as his eyes regained their focus, peering through the massive hand partially obscuring his vision. His eyes locked onto the dark skull-like mask he could barely make out through the fingers gripping onto him. Tales the old man had told him rushed through Chisaki's head, tales of a demon, an evil with the power to take the power of others. Chisaki had respected that man, respected his abilities. After all in a world overrun by the disease that was Quirks, the power to remove the disease of others had seemed miraculous. In fact it had been the tales of the demon that had given Chisaki the idea to remove Quirks permanently using Eri when the boss had presented the little girl to him. He'd used his quirk on the boss, made him comatose knowing the old man would never approve of his actions. But if the demon with the power to remove power was here for him then didn't that mean? No, 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 Chisaki's voice, dry and hoarse from disuse the last few days, rang out through the room as the man began to thrash about. You can't have it he shouted, his eyes wild, panicked. Not now, not until I cure the world. Fix the boss you can't do this to me Chisaki screamed tears leaking from his golden eyes as he struggled to escape the masked man's hold. However all for one's grip remained firm, unrelenting even as Chisaki raised his amputated arms and began to smash them against his body. As began to flow, soaking through the bandages as the wounds reopened, all for one turned his head to the two looking on, his calm voice drowning out Chisaki's loud shouts. Izuku come here. All for one ordered and the green eat quickly obeyed, striding forward to stand in front of his mentor even as Chisaki continued to fruitlessly beat against the man's large chest beside him. Reaching out his right arm, all for one rested his hand on Izuku's face, and then he activated his quirk. Izuku had braced himself, prepared himself for the hellish pain he knew that was coming thanks to the first time his sensei gave him a quirk, but it didn't matter as this time there was no pain. Instead all Izuku felt as Chisaki's quirk flowed from the young mysophobic man, through the transit that was all for one, and into Izuku was a feeling of coolness, like a glass being refilled with a cold beverage. It was strange and the feeling went on for several seconds before all for one lowered his hand, and stepped back Izuku remained on his feet but Chisaki immediately collapsed, falling onto his knees the former Yakuza boss sat on his heels as the thousand-yard stare returned to his eyes. To those watching it was obvious that something within the young auburn-haired man had broken. Likely irreversibly but no one in the room cared about that as black goop spilled from the man's mouth warping him to wherever all for one desired. Instead all the eyes in the room were focused on Izuku who stood there looking at his hands. After a moment he lowered them, turning his gaze to the masked form of all for one who had returned to sitting on his chair, seemingly winded from what little physical activity had been required of him. Izuku knew that his mentor's condition was worsening. That walk he'd been on where he'd met Izuku was now a thing of the past, but to see the man having to rest to recover from merely standing and using his quirk, it hurt Izuku, especially after all Sensei had done for him. Izuku was shaken from his thoughts by Himiko who spoke, her voice low, hesitant I Izukun. Are you alright? Izuku turned and flashed the blonde a reassuring smile. Yes Himiko, I'm just fine. That seemed to break the blonde's hesitance and she rushed forward wrapping Izuku in a one-armed hug as tears leaked from her eyes, the green eat in her grasp stiffening as he screamed mentally in a panic. I'm so happy, Himiko sobbed, too don't know why but seeing you there with that hand on your face, knowing your past. It's it's like I was watching you accomplish your dream right before my eyes. And then as happy as I was I couldn't help but worry that I'd lose you. Izuku's head turned robotically towards all for one seeking assistance the masked man seemed in no hurry to provide. Himiko I'm not going anywhere, Izuku reassured the blonde, hesitantly rubbing the back of her head as she buried it into his chest, her tears no doubt staining his shirt. Now this was familiar territory to the boy who'd grown up having to deal with his overly emotional mother. Izuku muttered soft reassuring noises as the blonde let out her fears, her tears, and her loneliness until finally her crying began to die down but even then she seemed in no rush to move her head or step away from Izuku. H Himkyo, Izuku said after the girl had finally stopped crying for a minute or two, you can let go now. Oh, right. The blonde said, backing away with a sheepish smile, her face doing a lighter imitation of Izuku's own. Out of curiosity, all for one spoke out, causing the two to turn their attention to him. The eyes of his skull mask locked onto the girl. What would you have done if Izuku had perished just now? I would have tried to kill you, Himiko replied, her gaze cold and hard as she stared down the century-old villain. No matter how badly you hurt me if I was able to kill you in the end it would have been worth it. Hi Himi. And if you did kill me all for one question with a tilt of his head. 
If by some miracle you succeeded in killing me and escaping with your life what would you have done then? Kill myself, Himiko said with a shrug, seemingly ignorant of how Izuku looked at her in shock and alarm. A world without Izuku in it, she shuddered. That's not a world I want to be in. Himiko Izuku shouted, grabbing the girl's arms as she turned to look at him startled. Never say that again he shook the blonde as he yelled at her do you honestly think I would want you to do that to kill yourself because I'm dead. Be but Izukun. No buts Izuku roared with a strength that surprised all for one. He knew about the boy's hatred for society, for its norms and hypocrisy, for heroes, the ones who destroyed both his dream and the one person he cared for. He knew of Izuku's strength of will, to be able to resist the offer for a quirk so soon after getting a taste of one was no mere feat but to see the boy so charismatic. He grinned under his mask, Izuku would be extraordinary when he was through with him. No matter what happens Himiko, promise me that you won't kill yourself. That you'll live on without me. It looked like the blonde wanted to argue but as Izuku continued to stare into her golden eyes the girl's fighting stance fell away, replaced by one of defeat. Okay, she whispered, her head hung low. Promise me. A moment of hesitation but then, I promise. Thank you, Izuku said sincerely, that's all I ask. So what's it like Himiko asked, her deliberate change of the subject fooling no one but the green eat seemed willing to let it go for now. It's different, Izuku said, raising his hands once more to study them. When I got air cannon it was painful, like nothing I'd ever felt before and I could feel it. His eyes seemed to lock onto a distant memory, one only he could see, feel it as my body physically changed to the quirk. My cells, tissue, all of the things that Mimi were changing and I could feel it all. He paused and a shudder ran through his body before Izuku shook his head as if shaking off a bad dream. This time though there was no pain. Ah yes, all for one spoke, raising a hand like a child who had something to add to the teacher's conversation. Through experimenting I and my colleagues found that when I give someone quirkless a quirk their body mutates, physically adapts to create a space within their very DNA to hold a quirk. That space can be filled by whatever quirk I give no matter how powerful it might be, or it can be left empty should I remove the quirk. That is why when you received overhaul there was no pain. You already had the space within you to hold the quirk it was just empty until I gave you the power. Izuku didn't reply, instead studying his hands once more, twisting his wrists to study both sides of them as if by doing so he might be able to see the spot within him where Overhaul now dwelled. After a moment of looking his hands over Izuku turned his head towards his masked mentor, you told me how to use air cannon, taught me the basics of the quirk, can you do the same for Overhaul? Before he finished all for one was already shaking his head no, unfortunately not. When I steal a quirk I gain a basic understanding of how it works but I did not steal overhaul. It did not pass from the original user to me to you like Air Cannon did rather it was a straight transfer from Chisaki to yourself. I merely acted as the conduit for it to flow through. Overhaul is truly your quirk now in every sense of the word. It will be up to you to discover how to utilize it, to make it work and then once you have done that, to bend it to your will. Every ability, every power up, all of it will be done by your hands. As the man finished speaking, Izuku stood there, eyes closed, having shut them during the man's speech. When Izuku opened his eyes he found himself looking, not at all for one, at Himiko, but rather at the other occupant of the room, his gaze having turned towards where she lay unresponsive on a nearby table. He didn't know it but his gaze was firm, full of that same inner strength all for one had come to see more and more often in Izuku the past few months, as the green eat's confidence grew. Slowly Izuku took a step, then a second, and slowly but surely the green eat began to make his way over to where the unresponsive girl lay. Izuku Imiko asked. Her voice sounded clouded, dulled, as if Izuku was listening to it from a distance or from underwater, but the green-haired boy didn't care not faltering or deviating the slightest from his path. When he finally reached Momo's side Izuku briefly paused looking at the Ravenet girl's body before. Slowly, he raised his right hand bringing it down onto the girl's bare shoulder as he closed his eyes. All for one leaned forward eagerly and Himiko too seemed to pay more attention, her look of concern replaced by one of attentiveness. But nothing happened. After a minute Izuku raised his hand, and turning it over he looked at his palm as if seeking an answer that, to those watching, did not seem forthcoming on the basis that palms, normally, can't talk. My quirk, he whispered echoing all for one's words as he lowered his hand once more. Eyes closed Izuku did not see bear shock that crossed Himiko's face, could not tell that behind his skull-like mask all for one's scarred visage broke into a sinister grin. He was unaware of the vein-like throbbing lines that appeared under Momo's skin, quickly spreading across her body. Rather inside his head Izuku's thoughts were focused on one thing, reaching for the quirk that now lay inside of him. He felt the power as it flowed into him. Felt it spread out as if it was exploring his body before the power flowed back to his hands where it seemed to settle down and rest. The pools of power were there, Izuku could feel them, he just wasn't sure how to access it as he fruitlessly tried again, and again to direct the power to heal Momo. It's my quirk, he repeated mentally to himself, overhaul was not Kaichisaki's it was not all for ones, or Himiko's or anyone else's, it was Izuku's and his alone. Even then the pool of power that Izuku knew to be overhaul remained out of reach even as the green eat seemed to time and time again grasp the power only for it to slip away at the last second. 
It was as if Izuku was in a pool or a lake trying to drain the water with his bare hands only for the water to drain out between his fingers every time he scooped yet Izuku had no other ideas to try. As the power slipped away from him once more Izuku took a deep breath as he mentally stepped backwards trying to rethink his approach. His mind wandered, grabbing and discarding every bit of information related to quirk activation Izuku had learned over the years. From videos where heroes discussed using or activating their quirks to research papers on the topic written by Dr. Tsubasa or Dr. Yujiko each was examined briefly before being being tossed aside in favor of a new tidbit. Eventually though, when nothing was immediately forthcoming, Izuku remembered back to the first quirk all for one had given him, air cannon. Quirks are like your fingers and toes, Izuku thought, quoting his masked mentor's words as the man had explained how to use the quirk, you control it, it's a part of you. However while some quirks can be used instinctively others need to be used deliberately. Izuku knew that overhaul was not an instinctive quirk, it was clearly deliberate and required the user to activate it. The question and the reason for Izuku's struggles though was how. Thinking back to air cannon once more Izuku pictured the first time he'd used the quirk, the feeling of the air flowing into his arm through the small hole the center of his palm. Imagining the feeling, wanting the hole to act as a vacuum. Without realizing it Izuku's mind flowed to overhaul he imagined how it would work, how it would break things down only to build them up again better, improved. To heal, to hurt, the possibilities were vast and though it would take time Izuku truly believed with this quirk, it would truly be possible for him to overhaul the corrupt society he lived in. Almost without realizing it the power of overhaul flowed through Izuku's hands and in the green eight's head a rough image took shape, one that grew more detailed with each passing moment. It started as a rough outline as a human body that quickly turned feminine in appearance. Another moment and the outline of the body was recognizable as Momo's although it quickly became a detailed copy that Izuku knew instinctively would be indistinguishable from the actual girl. But the image didn't stop there, within Izuku's head wounds began to form on Momo's nude body. Everything from the cuts where her body had hit the wooden walls to scrapes that were already scabbing over to the burns from the explosives the ravenet was replicated in minute detail in Izuku's head. Although some might think that the green-haired boy would be embarrassed at seeing his best friend in the nude it didn't phase the young boy to him the image wasn't Momo. It was akin to looking at a nude mannequin, something inanimate carrying none of the experiences, memories, or soul that made up a person. As such Izuku had no problem mentally looking over the image of Momo, studying her wounds and injuries. At least he did until his brain began to hurt, Momo's body had become translucent, see-through and though Izuku could still make out her exterior features the main part of his mind was focused on what he could now see inside of the girl. Beneath the Ravenet's clear skin muscles appeared. It was like he was looking at the muscular system from his school books and with a start Izuku realized exactly what it was. He was seeing Momo's muscular system but just as the thought crossed his mind Momo's muscles became clear as well. Bones, veins, arteries, organs, tendons, muscles, layers upon layers, every part of the body that comprised the girl known as Momo Yeyurazu was laid bare before Izuku by the power of overhaul but the information, the knowledge was overwhelming. Changing each and every microsecond as electrical signals were sent throughout the body, as flowed, saliva pooled, her heart beat, everything was made available to Izuku but there was simply too much of it. Izuku opened his mouth to let out a tortured scream but he couldn't, it was all inside of his head. Inside his head Izuku's consciousness curled up in a ball, tucking into itself like a turtle in a hopeless attempt to alleviate some of the pain pounding through his head getting worse with every passing moment. Focus, Izuku thought, barely able to organize his mind as he tried to push back the overwhelming rush of information, her head. Focus on her head. Overhaul seemed to respond to his desire and the mental image zoomed in on the girl's head, the rest of the body seeming to fall away taking with it. Thankfully, the rush of information as well. Izuku could still see the signals and flow in Momo's head but it was manageable, he could stand it. Though tired and drained, Izuku focused on the image before him, ignoring everything else he forced the quirk to zoom in on Momo's brain and in a moment he was standing inside of the organ. On all sides of him electrical signals and pulses in the form of little white dots zipped along on neurological pathways, flowed through the carotid and vertebral arteries but looking around Izuku couldn't find what he was looking for there was no obvious wound, no sign of the trauma that the doctor had said caused Momo's comatose state. It wasn't until his metaphysical eyes followed a white dot that seemed to disappear for no reason that the boy realized what the problem was. The only way to describe it was a blob, a red blob of what could only be resting almost in the dead middle of the rear of Momo's brain. She's hemorrhaging, Izuku thought in horror as the full scale of what had happened hit him. On his orders Momo had fought, been injured and wounded so badly it was almost a miracle she was still alive. But she wasn't alive, she was dying, bleeding internally in her brain yet even a doctor hadn't been able to notice what was happening. Like a sledgehammer it struck Izuku, if he didn't save Momo now, she would die, he would lose his first friend in years and he would do so because she had done as he had commanded. No, Izuku growled, no I refuse to let that happen directing his anger at the blob that was killing his friend Izuku grasped at the power of overhaul, and felt the quirk respond to his will like an eager puppy, raising his hand Izuku rested it on the spot and directed overhaul into it. 
As he watched lines spread from where he was touching until the blob was completely covered, and with an iron will, a king's command for the thing before him to be gone, to disappear, to cease the blob broke apart into pieces that vanished like dust in the wind. Immediately the white dots that had been absorbed by the blob and kept from reaching their intended destination zipped past heading to wherever white dots that represent complicated biological structures went. But Izuku wasn't done yet, the rage still burned within him and he reached out sending overhaul flowing through Momo's body. Information rushed at him but Izuku pushed it to the side. He didn't need to know everything he only needed to know the irregularities, the things that were there that shouldn't be. He felt it whenever overhaul came across a bruise, a wound, it was like an error message in his brain telling him hey, something's wrong right here. Izuku didn't examine the injuries, he didn't need to. Each time one was encountered all he did was direct overhaul to break apart the wound before rebuilding it complete and healed something the quirk seemed to know how to do instinctively, like a built-in autocorrect except for injuries. Find, breakdown, rebuild. Find, breakdown, rebuild. Again and again the process repeated itself until it became repetitious, routine almost calming in its simplicity, and as a result Izuku's burning hot rage, his fear, began to die down, cool under the monotonous nature of his task. As his anger fell away Izuku began to analyze what was happening, and gradually the way overhaul worked came to him. He had been mistaken in that overhaul was two distinct powers the ability to break things down and then repair them as he desired it was a singular power. He couldn't repair things, well he could, but only after they were broken down. Overhaul broke things down, disassembled them at the molecular level. That was how Izuku was able to see all of Momo's body, examine it all. He had been breaking it down. It was why Overhaul hadn't responded when he'd first tried to use it to heal the Ravenet. He'd been trying to heal her, repair her. He couldn't do that until after he overhauled her first. Only once something was broken down could it be rebuilt as he desired. Chisaki had broken down the floor in their fight only to then rebuild it, shaping it into his deadly spikes. And when he injured Toga Izuku thought his mind forming connection after connection now that he had experience using Overhaul himself, he didn't rebuild her arm, merely disassembled it before deactivating his quirk. Simultaneously as Izuku realized the true nature of overhaul, the quirk finished repairing Momo's body. Mentally taking a step back Izuku let out a sigh as he let the power of overhaul go, feeling it slip away from him to settle back in his hands. Immediately the space Izuku had found himself in fell away leaving the green eat back in the dark room all for one seemingly called home. Taking a step back, in real life this time, Izuku turned towards Himiko. How long has it been he asked, already suspecting the answer. Himiko looked at him confused, what do you mean you were only touching Momo for a second and then these lines started to spread all over her body, and her wounds disappeared. It. Izuku tuned the blonde out, so the time he'd spent working on Momo had all been in his head. It made sense, Chisaki had overhauled the floor and Toga's arm in moments so there was no reason what Izuku had done to Momo would be any different. Izuku also couldn't help but give the former Yakuza just the tiniest bit of respect. The man had likely gotten his quirk when he was young and had years to practice it, learning how to deal with the rush of information that came with it. Still as a child Izuku could easily picture the man being overwhelmed by the rush of it just like he had. Overhaul might actually be the cause of Chisaki's mysophobia, Izuku hypothesized. Seeing a person's muscles and when he used his quirk on someone. Maybe disassembling a limb but forgetting or not knowing how to reassemble it. It would be so easy to become fearful, scared even of germs. To want to stay clean, permanently especially since overhaul requires him to touch the target before it can be used. Izuku was shaken out of his musings by a low groan. Turning on the spot Izuku's jade eyes found the source of the noise and widened at the sight. Tears blurring his vision as he rushed forward to wrap Momo in a bone-crushing hug. How Momo blurted out, her cheeks blushing red at her friend's rather physical greeting. Is Izuku, she stammered, turning her head to the side in embarrassment, you can let go of me now. If anything Izuku's hug became that much stronger as Momo brought her hand up to pat him on the back. I'm okay, Momo said softly. Reassured slightly, Izuku backed away, wiping away tears which gave Momo the opportunity to realize that the only clothing she had on were the medical bandages wrapped around her chest and a pair of jean shorts. Letting out an eep Momo quickly created a blanket which she wrapped around herself protectively, blushing even redder. It seems that Miss Yeirazu has recovered. All for one's filtered voice rang out through the lab causing the three teens present to turn his way. As they processed the man's words though both Izuku and Himiko turned back to the ravenet taking in her appearance. The broken, although realigned left arm was now straightened and currently being put to use by the black-haired girl to keep the blanket pulled tight to her body. From what the two could see of Momo's exposed skin the burns that had marred the girl's upper body, as well as the various cuts and bruises that had dotted the rest of her were now gone, as if they'd vanished into thin air. Am I missing something? Momo asked, her expression one of confusion. Because all of you are acting like I just came back from the dead. Izuku and Himiko shared a glance but before they could say anything all for one spoke drawing their attention to him. During the raid on the Shai Hasekai you were injured. The masked man said bluntly, to such an extent that you ended up in a coma, one that a doctor said you had a very low chance of recovering from. 
Momo had paled at the man's words and when she spoke she did so in a weakened voice, then how am I how did I recover from such a grievous state? Izuku, all for one said and it might have been the green eats imagination, but he thought that the man might have sounded. Proud of him he succeeded in capturing Kai Chisaki, and in doing so earned the quirk he desired. I gave it to him and just now he succeeded in using it to heal you of not just the comatose state you'd been lying in but of all the other wounds you'd suffered as well. Momo turned to Izuku and bowed to him as best she could from kneeling on a cold floor with a blanket covering her. Thank you, Midoriya-sama, she said formally and Izuku could hear the respect and thankfulness in her voice. I truly appreciate what you have done for me this day and will work with my utmost to repay you. Momo at the teen's words the ravenette looked up and for a moment the two looked into each other's eyes, the rest of the world seeming to fall away around them. Hey Himiko said, sticking her pouting face in front of Momo blocking the ravenette from the Izuku's view. Don't you know it's rude to stare at a girl when she's practically naked? Both teens blushed crimson at the reminder of Momo's half-undressed state, and speedily turned away from each other. Momo quickly began creating some clothes with her quirk while Izuku waved his hands in front of his face, stammering out protests that were unintelligible to those present. Himiko meanwhile merely laughed at the reactions her words had garnered while all for one leaned back on his makeshift throne taking in the chaos before him. Izuku, he said after a minute, cutting off the green eats ramblings and restoring order to the room, since you were able to heal Yayurazu I do believe that you should try the same with Toga. At his words Himiko turned to look at Izuku who was already nodding his head to his mentor's words, I already plan to do that, the green eat said, I just wanted to make sure that Yayurazu was okay, understandable, all for one reassured him, but you also have to make sure that you take care of the others who follow you lest they become disgruntled with your leadership. Izuku nodded his understanding and Toga moved quickly to take the spot on the table Momo'd vacated. Lying down she turned her head towards Izuku as a playful grin split her face. It's my first time, she said softly raising a hand to cover her mouth in mock embarrassment, so be gentle. Izuku merely rolled his eyes as he laid his hand upon her and activated overhaul. Once more Izuku found himself looking upon the outline of a human body although this time the body's left arm was gone with only a stump indicating where it had once been. As the body grew more detailed and the various systems that comprised it began to appear more, and more information began to flow into Izuku's mind who quickly shut it down before it could overwhelm him. Focusing, Izuku allowed overhaul to sweep through Himiko's body like he had done to Momo, allowing the quirk to break down and rebuild any injuries it came across. Cuts and scratches disappeared although the only one Izuku paid any attention to was the hole in her leg as it sealed up. Finally the scan was complete leaving only the blonde's missing arm for Izuku to deal with. Concentrating Izuku broke down the stump before attempting to rebuild the limb, but he couldn't. Frowning, Izuku tried again. And again. And again. However, no matter what he did or how he changed his efforts, Himiko's arm refused to heal. To Momo and all for one looking on it was only a moment between when Izuku activated overhaul, and when he stopped leaving the results of his efforts behind. The boy didn't speak, didn't look up, and as the two studied his patient it quickly became clear why. Although the minor injuries that had marred the blonde's body were gone, as was the hole in her shin, Himiko's arm hadn't returned. Instead the stump which had only moments ago been wrapped in bandages covered in dry to cover the hideous open wound beneath was now gone completely. Smooth flesh flowed down from Himiko's shoulder turning inwards at the blonde's exposed, but hairless, armpit before going down the side of her body in a single smooth continuous layer of skin making it appear as if the girl had never had a left arm in the first place. Sitting up on the table Himiko stretched her sole arm upwards and outwards, the movement of her shoulders showing that she had done so with both and it was all too easy for those looking on to imagine a phantom limb stretching in the arm above the blonde as well. After a moment Himiko lowered her arm back down and looked around although her gaze quickly focused on the green eat who'd fallen to his knees at her side. Izuku muttered to soft for anyone to hear. What was that Izuku Himiko asked, ing her head to the side. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Izuku said looking up with tear-filled eyes. Your arm I tried but it, it wouldn't and I, I couldn't I am sorry. He said as he bowed into a doja his forehead actually touching the floor. I see you ke you. All three teens whirled to face the seated supervillain. Izuku's sobs dying down as Himiko drew in a sharp breath taking in the exposed scarred face of the man for the first time, a face whose few remaining features were contorted in rage and anger. Tell me boy, all for one spat out the last word like an insult as he growled, growled, at the trembling green-haired teen. Just now when you tried to heal Toga did you give it your all? Yais, Izuku croaked out. Did you purposefully not restore the limb withhold it for some reason? A punishment perhaps? No. Then why are you bowing your head all for one shouted? You are the leader, she lost the limb on your orders so don't get on your knees and cry like a dog step up, show some backbone, and take responsibility a sorry won't cure cancer, it can't fix a meal for a homeless man or provide heat for a family freezing to death in their home. 
It won't stop a crashing plane or a car about to hit you so don't apologize for something that is beyond your control. Silence descended as all for one stopped his rant, grabbing the nearby oxygen mask that rested beside him he quickly put the plastic device to use. Once it was secured onto his face all for one rested his arms on his throne, his helmet sitting discarded on the floor beside him as he looked down on Izuku with a clear air of expectancy. Izuku and the girls were trembling. It wasn't due to a quirk possessed by the weakened villain nor was it a result of the man's high charisma. No it was a result of being in the presence of a man who even in a weakened state was no doubt capable of killing them all with ease. For a moment all for one had dropped his facade of a caring wise mentor, and shown the three teens a glimpse of his true personality. He'd hidden it quickly but it had been there and all three knew that they were only alive, only there because of the man's mercy, and his interest in them. He's probably stronger than All Might, Izuku realized with a dawning horror and he couldn't help but shiver at the thought. He might no longer like the number one hero and his respect for the man might have plummeted so far it could very well serve as the next Grand Canyon, but he had to acknowledge the man's strength if nothing else. To change the weather with a mere punch, to lift a collapsing skyscraper with his bare hands, to move at speeds faster than even the naked eye could register, there was no doubt in anyone's eyes the world over that All Might was anything but strong. Yet Sensei, all for one, Izuku stopped the thought before it could because if he imagined a fight between the two he couldn't say with certainty that he knew who would win. Izuku's racing brain was interrupted by a sigh and he quickly focused on the man, the villain before him. I'm sorry for my outburst, all for one said, the sound of his unfiltered voice making it clear the man at least seemed apologetic. You were the one who gave the orders that cost young Toga her arm so it is indeed within your right to feel responsible for what happened. However, all for one said, raising a finger towards the boy his attention was focused on, you are a leader and a villain. You are not on the right side of the law where sincere apologies will buy you the forgiveness of your comrades and associates you are a villain, and as such apologizing, bowing your head to another is nothing more than a sign of weakness, of obedience. It shows that you are weak and it paints a target on your back to not only other villains who want what you possess, but also your own allies, those you trust to have your back and support you. They will see you as nothing more than another victim they can target and once that happens, once that perception has settled into their mind, no matter how strong you might become nothing you do will change it. For a moment Izuku considered all for one's words and he could feel the truth in the statement. He knew the man spoke true for no other reason than that the green eight had lived through life based on the preconceptions of others. The perception that being quirkless made you weak, that you were powerless. Kaken, his old classmates, former friends, teachers, All Might, and even his own parents had judged Izuku based on his quirklessness, treating it like it was a condition that weighed down any expectations they could ever have for him. Deku. Useless. Such a fitting nickname for one that had no future to think of. Gritting his teeth at the thought of his former nickname Izuku turned towards Himiko, the only sign of his inner rage, the green fire that seemed to burn savagely within his eyes. Himiko I apologize but I am unable to heal your arm. He said, his voice flat although the various emotions underneath were easily detected by all present. Why the blonde asked, turning her blank gaze from her shoulder to Izuku. I tried, Izuku said, I really, really did. He took a breath and his eyes turned distant, as if he was remembering or seeing something the others couldn't. I broke your arm down at least three dozen times, tried to reassemble it again and again, but all I could get was the stump. Eventually I realized overhaul, as powerful as it is, does have a weakness, the green eats eyes were focused and he took a moment to look individually at the faces of those present. It cannot create matter. Himiko didn't understand the importance of the statement but the blonde could tell by the way that the big-chested girl's eyes widened and the masked man leaned back in this chair contemplatively that whatever Izuku had said was important. Seeing her confused look the green eat seemed to take pity on the blonde as he spoke addressing her unspoken question. What I mean Himiko is that when I'm rebuilding something I can only do so using the materials I have at hand. I couldn't reassemble your arm because your arm was not there. I didn't have it so when I tried to restore your limb the only resources I had available was what was already in your body. I tried to use other body parts, taking a little from here and a little from there but it only weakened everything else, and the makeshift arm was severely mutilated and ill-functioning. Two, he took a deep breath once more letting it out before speaking. I eventually decided it would be better to use what remained of your arm to strengthen what other limbs you had. Part of your stump was used to seal the hole in your thigh while what remained was divided up between your right arm and legs. I don't know what effect they'll have on you, probably minimal at best, but they might make you slightly faster and stronger, just a few more muscle fibers in addition to what was already there. Himiko was silent, her head falling forward and as the silence dragged on Izuku's hopeful expression became more downcast, his eyes slipping beneath his green mane as they studied the floor like memorizing the cold surface would help the situation. Eventually Himiko spoke, her voice a whisper from behind the curtain of her hair that only Izuku and all for one could hear, Ari are you going to get rid of me? For a moment Izuku didn't react but when her words registered he began striding forward his step steady and sure. As he got closer the blonde seemed to shrink in on herself and she actually flinched as Izuku raised his arms, squeezing her eyes shut as if she was preparing for him to strike her. 
so it came as a surprise to the blonde when Izuku instead wrapped her in his arms hugging her. Remember my promise, the green eat whispered, his breath tickling the girl's ear making Himiko's face heat up, you can stay with me for as long as you want. Himiko responded by wrapping Izuku in a hug of her own, her nails pressing into the young boy's back possessively but Izuku didn't react. Her breath was shaky but after a moment she let go and though it appeared as if Himiko had been about to cry it was obvious the young woman had been able to get her emotions back under control giving Izuku a small but genuine smile he had no trouble returning. However the moment came to an end when a rough voice spoke out drawing the two's attention, along with the ravenette who'd been looking on, to the speaker. Izuku, all for one spoke his non-existent eyes directed at the boy. I want you to try and heal me. Izuku blinked in shock before opening his mouth to protest, but he was cut off before he could begin as all for one held up a hand. I know that you doubt yourself after your failure with Himiko, that you are unsure but know that I believe in you Izuku, all for one said, his mouth, the only feature left on his scarred face breaking into a reassuring smile. You've come so far in the months since I saved you, worked hard to earn the power that now dwells within you and I truly believe that you have the power to heal me. Taking a deep breath Izuku stepped forward slowly, hesitantly until he stood on the uprise that made up all for one's throne, standing next to the centuries-old villain like he was the man's right hand. For a moment he hesitated, remembering the fury and anger all for one had directed his way just minutes ago. Did he really want to heal a man that even injured could likely go toe-to-toe -to -toe with All Might? Could he do so knowing that the man would likely kill and injure hundreds, thousands, even millions because he wanted to? Izuku hesitated as words from the past rose up, whispered by the dark voices that dwelt within him. All Might it's not wrong to dream kid, but you need to be realistic. Beck Hugo if you want to be a hero that bad let take a last chance skydive off the roof. His mom I'm sorry Izuku. I'm so sorry. Each sentence, each word was like a chain holding the green eat starved. Broken spirit down and even Toga's surprised gasp when all for one revealed that Izuku was corkless took the form of a collar around the boy's neck holding him kneeling against the floor. However in the end it wasn't all for one's words that served as the key, nor was it Himiko's or Momo's. It was All Might's words that changed everything without power can one become a hero I don't think so. Power, Izuku's conscious whispered, looking at his metaphysical hands that slowly curled into fists, every single time it comes back to power. A dark grin crossed the boy's face as his eyes began to burn with a maddened fear. The chains straining to hold him down as he began to push against them for the first time in his life, Bekugo's explosions. All might strength, all anyone cares about is power. Metal creaked under the strain but Izuku didn't stop. Well I have power now. Useless quirkless Deku's gone. A chain snapped flailing around like a whip, and he is never coming back. I have friends, an image of Momo and Himiko flashed through his mind, a teacher, all for one's proud smiling scarred visage, and a quirk of my own another chain snapped and Izuku's right leg was freed, planting it firmly on the ground the green eat struggled to rise to his feet. I don't care what I have to do, but I will change things. Izuku reached his fingers outstretched towards the closest chain. I'll make it so no one has to suffer like I did. So close it was almost within his grasp. And I will be free his finger brushed against the chain and Izuku activated overhaul the quirk flowing through him like it had been ready and waiting to heed his call. The chains that had bound Izuku down, forged from the words and traumas that had made up his life, shattered and Izuku's mental visage rose to his feet standing tall. In the real world no longer hesitating, Izuku raised his hand before gently lowering it onto the top of all for one's bald scarred head, suppressing his innate urge to shiver at the feel of the rough, dry almost scaly skin underneath his fingers. Izuku slowly let out his breath as he closed his eyes and activated overhaul. Once more the vein-like pattern crawled its way down from where Izuku's hand lay and then to the horror of the audience watching the top of the man's head burst like a grape. Gray brain matter, red, white bone fragments, and gore splattered outwards covering everything nearby. But Izuku remained standing as sweat raced down his face, his eyes still clenched shut. For a moment nothing happened and both Momo and Himiko became worried. Himiko had seen Izuku use overhaul on Momo and while it might have seemed longer to the greenie to the blonde it had taken the boy less than a second to revive the ravenet from her, presumably, dreamless sleep. Similarly Momo had seen Izuku use his quirk on Himiko, and though he might have failed to bring her arm back it had been only a second for him to remove the stump entirely, turning the open wound into smooth flesh. However, this was taking much longer and while both of the girls believed in Izuku and his abilities in the back of their respective minds they couldn't help but worry that maybe, just maybe, all for one's old wounds might be too much for even overhaul to work a miracle upon. Neither of the girls expressed their worries, the concerns they felt instead both chose to believe in their friend, the boy who'd worked so many miracles already upon both of them. The two knew they'd changed since meeting the green eat. Momo had lived a life of grandeur, wanting for nothing but isolated nevertheless from her peers because of her status. It was Izuku who'd been her first friend, who'd cracked the perfect heiress persona she'd worn for years like a second skin, and shown her what friendship was. And Momo had repaid his friendship with absolute loyalty and devotion, so much so that she'd gone as far as to swearing herself to him after only knowing the green-haired boy for a few months. Others might have called her decision hasty, ill-thought-out. The Ravenette didn't regret it and today Izuku had proven her choice had been the right one. 
He'd healed her when he hadn't needed to, done so for no other reason than he didn't want to lose someone precious to him and Momo. Momo didn't know why but ever since she'd awoken every time she looked at the boy her stomach seemed to curl. It was strange and while Momo had originally been worried she couldn't help but find herself liking the strange foreign feeling that seemed to dwell within her. Compared to the subtle changes in Momo, Himiko's changes on the other hand were much more obvious. When she'd been diagnosed with her quirk everything had changed. Her parents had distanced themselves from her, taught her to hide her cravings as if the feelings were unnatural, like they weren't as much a part of her as her fingernails, her eyes, hell even her quirk itself. For years she'd followed their teachings, tried to be the perfect little girl that they seemed so obsessed with having. The pressure to conform, to hide who she was, hurting herself not physically but mentally as she tried to suppress her innate desire as she starved, yearning, needing the crimson liquid full of life was it any wonder that she'd one day snapped. After that life had been nothing but a blur, full of running and hiding in an effort to keep herself from going back, from having to return to the life of pretending to be that perfect little girl. It made her nauseous merely thinking about how she'd been back then and Himiko had sworn that no matter what happened in her new life, no matter how much trouble she got in, no matter how badly hurt she was, even if she died it would still be better than going home. At least now if she died she died being true to herself. Himiko hadn't known what to expect from her new life but she certainly hadn't expected Izuku Midoriya. To find out that she wasn't alone in her isolation, that there were others like her was shocking by itself. Logically she knew there were others it would have been almost statistically impossible for there not to be someone else who was abused and mistreated in this world for something outside of their control. But so caught up in the perfect little life she had been living, Himiko never had the chance to take time to really think about it. Then Izuku had arrived and someone, for the first time in her life, had willingly offered her what she wanted most. Drinking his had been euphoric and sensing a kindred soul and the boy had made it easy for Himiko to decide to follow him. They hadn't spent much time together before she'd gone undercover but as she had sat in Kronostasis' apartment drinking the dead man's Himiko had daydreamed about her new crush, the first one she thought was perfect without cuts all over his body. The feeling was strange but it hadn't been hard to realize that he was now the most important thing in her life. When Izuku hadn't come to visit her as she lay recovering from her injuries Himiko had panicked. Visions of the greenied abandoning her were on the forefront of her mind and as the hours passed the visions only grew worse. Darkened by the knowledge that likely the only reason Izuku had accepted her in the first place was because her quirk was useful to him. She didn't want to go back, back to the cold, dirty streets. Yet she knew that after Overhaul removed her arm her worth fell immensely. What use did Izuku have for a spy that could only turn into people with one arm? She'd gone to Izuku hoping that if she couldn't get him to appreciate her quirk maybe she could get him to appreciate her body. She knew it was wrong, but her morals were minor compared to the fear she was feeling. Offering her body, letting it be used, something innate told her that if she did this she would lose something valuable, something more important than her ID. When Izuku had accepted her, not only in that white sterile room but here defending her against the man in the mask who was apparently her master, her crush on him had grown from, well, a crush to an obsession. He didn't know what she'd been about to do, and she didn't plan to tell him. However that fear she'd had of her body being used, treated like a simple object, had been replaced by a warmth in her chest she'd never felt before. She had no doubt that her Izuku would be able to heal her master using a quirk he'd possessed for less than an hour. He was hers, everything, he could do anything and she hid the smile that grew on her face because no matter what happened, she would be there with him. Sharing a glance the girls turned their attention back to Izuku, silently tried to send the greenied all the support they could. Another few seconds passed with no change and just as the girls grew worried that overhaul would indeed prove useless against the sheer amount of damage the man had possessed, something changed. Slowly the matter that had splattered across the room began to move, not sliding down the walls or dripping from the ceiling but moving to float over to where all for one's body lay slumped over in its throne. Slowly the grey matter, red, white bone, and other miscellaneous pieces of what made up a head congealed into a rough semicircular mass that grew more and more defined as tendrils lowered from the orb, connecting to the exposed neck of the lifeless body underneath. Izuku fell to the ground like a puppet with its strings cut, his ragged breath coming in exhausted pants like a tired dog. A sheen of sweat covered his body causing Izuku's clothes to stick tightly to him. However as Izuku fell neither Momo nor Himiko rushed forward to help him. Instead they stood in their spots frozen in place by the dark pressure that seemed to be pressing down on them from all sides and it was all they could do to keep their eyes up, keep them focused on the suited being in the chair the power seemed to emit from. As they watched the formerly lifeless body straightened itself up, a single hand rose into the air, quickly followed by its companion, the two appendages reaching upwards before freezing as they touched their owner's face. For a second they paused before quickly resuming their exploration, Desperate, needy. A nose, smooth unscarred skin, one ear than another, white hair all of it was found and touched, explored as if each item was new and being felt for the first time but there was one place the fingers didn't touch. Instead the man in the chair wrapped the fingers of his right hand around the breathing mask that had fallen to lie against his chest slowly lifting it to rest in front of him. For a moment he held the device aloft before his arm and muscles seemed to swell with power as the man closed his hand crushing and shattering the plastic mask within. 
Turning his clenched fist over as he stretched his arm out the man opened it, allowing the plastic to rain down to the floor. As the noise reached his newly reformed ears the man's mouth opened and he took a hesitant deep, slow breath of air. He coughed, one that spawned several others which quickly grew into a fit that eventually fell away. Raising his head the white-haired man took several shuddering breaths and then for the first time in years the Emperor of Darkness, the symbol of evil, the King of the Underworld, opened his crimson red eyes to the world and smiled. Letting out a deep breath she'd taken without realizing it the sniper opened her purple eyes. The change from complete darkness to a clear night illuminated by the bright lights of the city below caused the woman to still as she allowed her vision to adjust. A half a minute later she tapped the long scouter on the right side of her face, activating it. The formerly clear blue-tinted screen quickly became dotted with various markings and symbols, the main one in the very center of the screen being a circle with a vertical line that emerged from the bottom of it. The lines had several horizontal ones that cut across it at regular intervals, each one labeled with a different distance. A small display on the bottom right corner of the screen told the sniper what the temperature, weather, and wind speed were around her. Letting out a breath the sniper activated her quirk and setting down the fleshy bipods that rested at the front of her rifle on the elevated ledge that ran along the roof she trailed her left hand through her two-tone hair tearing some off in the process. The action was painless and even if it wasn't the pain would have been crushed down years ago she reflected as she began to fiddle with the hair, molding it into a more desirable augive shape. As her hand continued its ministrations the sniper's eyes remained focused at the rooftop across the street in front of her. From the file she'd received the sniper knew that her target, a much-beloved local hero, would make his way through the area within the next ten minutes on his regular patrol. Each time the man would stop on the roof she was watching using the building's height to make sure that everything was okay on the bustling streets below before moving on. The woman didn't know why her superiors wanted the man dead but she knew better than to ask. This wasn't her first mission. Her first time fixing problems the commission wanted dealt with but it was her first mission alone and the woman knew it was as much a test of her abilities and willingness to follow orders as it was to actually contributing to the betterment of society. After all this was also going to be the first time she killed a hero. A part of her didn't want to do this, felt that all of this, the intrigue, the killing, was everything she was supposed to stand against. She'd voiced those thoughts in the beginning of her training when the subject of killing had first been broached but her worries had been explained away as for the greater good. After all, if killing a single person could stop the detonation of a nuclear weapon that would otherwise level a city wasn't it better to kill the individual no matter how innocent, or guilty they might be. It was the trolley dilemma and she was old enough to know that in the end not everybody could be saved nor did everyone deserve to be. Shaking her head to clear away her thoughts the woman focused on her task pushing down and suppressing her emotions, as she'd been taught. She could break down later in private, right now she couldn't afford to be weak. As if in response to her determination a tendril of flesh emerged from her rifle stretching in front of her right eye where it curled to form a crude scope. The scope didn't magnify the woman's vision zooming in on the target like a normal scope did rather, it merely narrowed her field of vision allowing her to focus on where her shot would hit with pinpoint accuracy. It was accurate for about half a kilometer, maybe three-fourths of one if she was lucky and focused but the scope didn't take into account the wind, distance, or weather conditions, that was what her lightning bolt-shaped long scouter support gear was for. She didn't need it necessarily under the supervision of various teachers the best the country, and Hero Association had to offer she'd spent years honing her shooting in all kinds of conditions, learning the math and calculations needed before practicing them again and again till she could perform them perfectly inside her head. The more physical aspects were repeated until they became instinctive, programmed into her muscles and body until they came to her as natural as breathing. For a moment the woman's mind followed the thought, carrying her back to memories of the training she'd had to endure and it was this distracted state of mind that cost her. The sound of loose gravel being kicked up on the rooftop behind her caused the woman to spin around though she made sure not to move her right arm, and the rifle attached to it spinning only her body. Turning the woman found herself greeted by the glaring visage of the very hero she'd been on the lookout for. Shadows hid the man's eyes from view while a mask covered his mouth and nose, straps running back to his ears making it look similar to a doctor's mask, albeit one made out of metal. His outfit consisted of a pair of white long pants, loose around his legs, with a utility belt with several gray pouches strapped across his waist. His top was burgundy in color, a thin open vest of tight protective fabric that covered his back and arms while leaving the chest entirely open, showing the Herculean-like muscular form underneath. A long crimson cape fluttered on his back, the edges of the cape ripped from the various battles it had been through. The collar of the cape was high and encircled the hero's neck reaching up towards the man's similarly collared hair which jutted forwards at the front in a singular spike but on the sides near the back split away giving the hairdo the appearance of a T if one was to look at him from above. For a moment the two stared at each other and the woman could feel a drop of sweat form along her forehead before slowly descending down the side of her face. Then the man spoke a single word, his voice deep and manly, you. The woman couldn't contain a gulp of fear, her quirk was powerful, lethal even, especially at range but it was next to useless in close quarters combat. 
Most of her training had consisted of increasing her sniper abilities making them second nature, and while she had covered close quarters combat, even fighting those whose quirks gave them an advantage in the situation she knew that her skills paled in comparison to a hero who fought that way daily. I know you, huh? The woman blinked in shock, her eyes widening as she looked at the hero in confusion. Yeah, you're that new hero right the one trained by the commission. The eyes, her voice cracking in disbelief, was was he fanboying over her. Her nervousness was obvious and the hero quickly bowed his head in apology. I apologize if my behavior made you uneasy, he said before straightening up as he crossed his arms in front of his chest. I just try to pay attention to new heroes as they debut I can't help but think that anyone who becomes a hero is really manly. Doing what you can to help others no matter the cost knowing the danger that could await you yet having the courage to do that day after day. What's more manly than that? Yeah, the woman said, as she regained her composure, dragging the word out, I suppose it is pretty she hesitated, manly. You're right it is the red-haired hero said enthusiastically, there's nothing better than the feeling of saving someone, being able to look at them and say don't worry, everything's going to be alright. The man walked forward and raised his right foot and rested it on the ledge to the right of the woman's gun and looked down at the city below them. Do you see them down there he asked, his voice softening. Every time I look down there, see them walking around and living their busy lives I'm reminded of just why we do what we do. They look up to us to keep them safe, trust in us, believe in us and it's our job, our duty to make sure that their belief isn't wasted. But what about when you can't save somebody the woman asked, her voice speaking before her mind could stop her. What do you do when you're weak and you don't believe you know, that you can't live up to their faith? For a moment silence hung over the two and it took most of the woman's self-control to keep from just hopping over the ledge to fall to her death in the street below. What was she doing she was supposed to kill the man in front of her not of a philosophical conversation about what being a hero meant mentally tearing her hair out in frustration the woman's attention turned back to the man as he turned his gaze from the bustling streets below to the clear night sky above them. When I was a psychic I failed to save somebody. His tone was soft but the woman could hear the grief polluting the simple statement. That day I hesitated, I was scared and because of that a four to three year old father of two never made it home to his family. He never got to hug his wife and two daughters again. Never got a chance to tuck his little girls into bed, watch them grow up, or grow old with his wife while his kids found spouses of their own. Turning the crimson hero fixed the woman in place with a look. He died because my spirit was weak and I carry that burden with me every day, and I'll do so for the rest of my life. We are heroes but we're also human and as a result it's natural to feel fear, to be afraid especially in a job like this where danger and death is an everyday occurrence. What matters is that we overcome our hesitation and fear, rise above it to become something more. You might fail to save someone but once they're gone there is nothing you can do to change what happened. If you fixate on your mistakes, the people you couldn't save, then you will never be able to be the best hero you could be. You could try but the weight of your guilt will bind you tighter than any chain ever could. There are no redos, you can't go back and change what happened so don't focus on the fact that you couldn't, didn't, do more. Use that loss to drive you so that next time you don't hesitate, don't falter. Nobody can save the world by themselves so just focus on saving what you can. That's my advice rookie. Turning the red-haired man began to walk away before turning to shoot the woman one last look. It was nice meeting you and know that you will have moments in your career where you will doubt yourself. Where the villains, disasters, and people who need help just seem to keep on coming. Go on and on without an end in sight. When that happens and you wonder if you have what it takes to carry on, if you really are making a difference, know that in the end you are helping people. It might not seem like it but you are making a difference in these people's lives. A tear streaked down the woman's face and the man turned his back to her respectfully as he resumed walking but he could still hear her words, thank you. Underneath his mask the man smiled but as he opened his mouth to tell her you're welcome, a muted shot rang out. The man's brain didn't have time to understand what was happening didn't get a chance to even attempt to activate his hardening quirk. Before the red-themed hero fell forward collapsing to the roof dead as a puddle of crimson began to pool underneath him courtesy of the rather large hole through his chest. For a moment the woman stood there frozen, not believing what she'd done as smoke trailed upwards from the muzzle of her rifle. Shesh done it she'd killed a hero. As the realization sank in panic began to rise within her as well as doubt. Just just what had she done she'd just killed a pro hero and not some no name but a man who'd broken through the top hundred on the charts and was still steadily climbing the ranks. She tried to push down her panic, the commission had ordered it she'd just been following orders, but the woman still couldn't push the sheer sense of wrongness that tore its way through her. She wanted to be a hero damn it, protect people and keep them safe. What was heroic about shooting somebody who as far she knew had done nothing wrong? Kami she'd shot him in the back of all things. The contents of the woman's stomach rose within her passing through her throat and into her mouth forcing the woman on her hands and knees as she retched, her quirk deactivating automatically without her focus to keep it activated. When she finished the woman gasped for air, taking deep, shaky breaths as each arm gripped the other in front of her core. Trying to preserve a warmth the woman couldn't feel as she shivered despite the rather warm summer night around her. 
She tried to turn her thoughts to other matters but all her brain could do was replay the montage of the hero's final moments over and over again the man turning away from her exposing his broad, muscular back her arm coming up a single bullet firing and a hole being torn through the man before he collapsed forward his body turning slightly as it fell as if wanting to see at least the face of his killer, but dying before he could. The woman forced her mind away seeking something, anything that could preoccupy her thoughts and ironically it was the words of the hero now that lay dead before her that answered. When you wonder if you have what it takes to carry on, if you really are making a difference, know that in the end you are helping people. It might not seem like it but you are making a difference in these people's lives. As the words echoed through her mind in the man's deep voice the woman's shaking began to abate. She had followed orders, she had done her duty. Closing her eyes the woman used her training to regain control of her breathing, slowing her panting down as she forced herself to take slow, deep, heavy breaths of oxygen. She didn't know what the hero had done to deserve the hit, she couldn't know if what she'd done was right but she had to trust, to believe that what the commission, no, what she was doing was helping others. Standing up the woman forced herself to act casual, stretching her arms out right over her head as she leaned backwards, popping her back all while trying to ignore the body that lay near her. Everything she did, no matter how wrong or evil it might seem, she was doing for them. The people that even now were walking unconcerned on the streets below her unaware of the dark actions taken just above their heads. Having collected herself the woman turned around to leave just in time for her field of vision to be filled by a large hand grasping at her face, torn wide fingernails stretching, reaching towards her as she dodged out of the way. Activating her quirk the woman fired her gun instinctively, at this distance not needing to aim or even worry about accuracy, her training making it so that the bullet pierced through the stomach of the thing right where its heart would be. The creature fell backwards, stumbled and the woman exhaled only for her relief to wither away as she took in the monster cloaked in the skin and tissue of the hero she'd just killed. The thing stopped its backward stumble as it turned its gaze towards her, a single eye mad with lust and endless hunger shining through the shadows that covered the crimson orbs. It charged and the woman fired again and again, her bullets tearing through the beast splattering, bone, and gore on the ground behind it but the creature didn't falter in its charge even as one of her bullets tore through its mask taking both the metal mouth guard and the left side of the jaw that lay underneath from its body. The woman leaped backwards trying to hop out of the thing's reach but she was too slow as the back of her knees hit the ledge running around the border of the roof. A hand wrapped around her face and the beast's momentum carried the two of them up and over. Together they fell, grappling back and forth as wind blew past them, setting their hair and the remnants of the creature's cape fluttering wildly. The creature snapping at her with what remained of its mouth while it's torn, wide nails tore deep furrows into her pale flesh. The woman deactivated her quirk and using her hands grabbed the creature's wrists forcing them back but she could do nothing as the creature's head and jaw snapped at her, yellow saliva mixed with crimson splattering her face. A noise, a primal roar of defiance tore itself from the woman's throat as she pushed her muscles to the limit twisting the two of them in midair, and forcing the beast underneath her so it was falling below her. The ground rushed up at them and the last thing the woman saw was the body of the man who had once been crimson riot splattering across the ground before darkness filled her vision. Sitting up in her bed Kaina Tsutsumi gasped for air as her left hand grabbed at the neckline of her tank top. The black fabric drenched in sweat sticking tight to her body as she desperately tried to pull the constricting piece of cloth away from her throat. She struggled with it a moment before forcing the clothing up and over her head where it fell to crumple atop the sheets that covered her lower half. Kaina's large ass having been pulled upwards with the tank top fell down bouncing against her chest for a moment before they returned to resting against it, her nipples hardening, as they were exposed to the pre-morning air inside her room. As her purple eyes darted around, Kaina's breathing began to slow, years of training kicking in, as her brain took in the familiar comforting sight of her bedroom, her surroundings outlined by the faint yellow light of a street lamp leaking in from behind the curtain drawn over her window. Confirming she was alone Kaina collapsed backwards with a groan, her head slamming into one pillow as she grabbed its companion pulling it over her face to muffle her yell of frustration. As her scream died away Kaina tossed the pillow aside uncaringly as she stared upwards at the ceiling, her expression blank. Why why did this keep happening to her she tried to think back to when they'd started, the nightmares. She couldn't name an exact time the dreams had always been there ever since she'd started her job but it was only recently that they'd begun to make a more regular appearance. For months now they'd filled her non-waking moments, sometimes, like tonight, she'd dream about past times when she'd been ordered to neutralize someone. Other times she'd find herself in a seemingly endless field of golden wheat that stretched as far as the eye could see under the warm light of an afternoon sun shining down from a clear blue sky. That was one of the more peaceful dreams or at least it was until she started sinking into the mud underneath her. Mud created from the spilling out of the bodies of all those she'd killed who now lay around her. Their accusing unseeing eyes turned to stare her way. She'd try to escape but the harder she tried the faster she sank, sometimes the decaying, dirt-stained arms of her victims even reaching up to drag her down faster until cool wet earth filled her vision. Shivering at the memory Kaina wrapped herself tighter in her sheets, uncaring that they were still less with her sweat. She knew she wouldn't be able to sleep the rest of the night, she was never able to return to the land of Morphis once she awoke from the nightly terrors sent her way, 
but God's willing she was going to try. After all, she wanted to look her best when she saw the little unicorn later today along with her favorite insomniac. Shota Aizawa let out an annoyed groan, one perfected by hundreds of introverts throughout history who'd found themselves adopted and fostered by the extroverts that called them friends. As he sipped his cup of coffee courtesy of one poor nurse who'd found himself at the end of the man's red. I'd glare, the tired teacher cast a sideways glance at the twenty files resting on the seat in the hallway beside him. He knew that he should read them, diligently review each of his Suntop students' profiles so he could have a basic understanding of what they were capable of come the first day of school tomorrow but, in all honesty the man couldn't be bothered. He himself had attended UA over a decade ago and he had learned through first-hand experience that files didn't tell you everything. Sure they gave you information, information about people's past, their abilities and skills, their quirk and what they could and couldn't do with them. However it also built up preconceptions, tricked your mind into believing things without actually knowing them through experience. His students would be coming to him with these mental blocks in place and if Shota let himself be tricked as well his students would never be able to reach their full potential. They would grow, yes, but they would always be a pale reflection of what they could have been and none of them would be the wiser for it. That was why the first thing Shota did with his class was a quirk apprehension test. Their scores would be in their files already but not only did the Ministry of Education foolishly score them without the use of their quirks they did so months before the students even began the process to apply to high school. Holding a test that he could supervise was just one of the several reasons Shota did it though. Allowing him to witness his students' quirks firsthand, testing them to use their quirks creatively, seeing what effect quirk exhaustion had on them, to how well they were able to push through it and carry on made it much more rational to test his students immediately than to have them sit through the entrance ceremony. As for guidance sessions with Ryo, those were actually useful for helping his students figure out what kind of heroes and hero work they wanted to do once they went pro but Shota could put those off until after he judged that they at least be semi-competent heroes and if nothing else, they could do them next year. The squeaking of springs as someone sat down in the unoccupied chair to his left drew Shota's attention, and he turned to look at someone he judged hesitantly as one of his better acquaintances. Tsutsumi met his gaze head-on and flashed him a devilish smirk that he responded to with one of his trademark scowls. Why are you here? Shota asked bluntly. I'm here to see the little unicorn, Tsutsumi replied with a smile. Why are you here? She still won't use her quirk. Shota said, his expression blank, despite their assurances she keeps insisting that her power is evil and only hurts people. They thought that she might be willing to use it if I was here to watch since she knows that I can stop it should things go wrong. Hum, sounds feasible, Tsutsumi said as she leaned back in her chair trying to get comfortable. Do you think it will work? Shota replied with a shrug and for a moment silence fell between the two heroes. Why haven't you come to see her? Shota didn't answer but Tsutsumi didn't let the silence stretch this time. She asks about you and no wants to know where the scary scarf man is at first I thought it was because she was afraid of you. Wanted to make sure that you would stay away but I asked and she told me that she actually liked it when you were there. She stopped to look at her companion but Shota didn't reply. His head hung forward resulting in his shaggy black mane hiding his face from view. I've come to visit her, Tsutsumi said after a moment. Brought her a little stuffed unicorn for her to sleep with. She cried when I gave it to her. Apparently it was the first toy she ever got that actually came from someone who cared. She. I'm not good with kids, Shota said, his voice low but firm, cutting through Tsutsumi's tail. They don't like me, scare easily. You saw her reaction when I tried to reassure her. She broke out crying. There's a reason I'm an underground hero. Tsutsumi hummed in agreement before she shot Shota a sympathetic look as she raised her right hand to rest it on his upper back comfortingly. That might be true in most cases Aizawa but she wants to see you and whether you admit it or not I know that you want to help her. You never volunteer to help kids with troublesome quirks, cuts into your brooding time, and I know that the doctors would never have been able to reach you if it wasn't for the fact you gave them your number. Shota didn't reply and Tsutsumi put her arms behind her head as she relaxed, closing her eyes, although it was obvious to those who paid attention that she was still awake. They stayed like that for a moment but this time it was Shota who interrupted the silence. Stay away from her, his voice was still low but Tsutsumi heard it all the same, her right eyelid rising slightly as she looked at her companion who turned his head to stare at her, his expression one that would have intimidated many a lesser criminal and hero. Why? Don't play coy with me Tsutsumi, Shota growls his lip curling at the corner to expose the teeth underneath. I know what you do for the commission I know that you're their little cleanup lady or did you forget that I was ordered to provide support for some of the missions they gave you? I know you're skilled enough that you won't miss from a kilometer away especially if a certain someone erased the villains for worn quirk beforehand. I might have ignored it once, put it aside as an accident or a one-off, but it's too big a coincidence when every time I help you out the target dies either on site or en route to a detainment center. And what are you going to do with these wild theories of yours? Tsutsumi asked, her blank face looking like it had been carved from stone although she'd shifted slightly so her right elbow was now pointed towards Shota's side, something the man didn't miss. Nothing, Shota admitted harshly but reluctantly. I'm an underground hero, it wouldn't take much to make me disappear or suffer an unfortunate accident one day. 
I don't have the influence you pros build up over the course of your careers and even if I did what citizen want to believe that their country is ordering the execution of criminals much less heroes. No, they'd rather ignore the dark side of heroic society in favor of keeping what peace they have. Then why do you want me to stay away from Uri? Tell me if this sounds familiar, Shota said, casting his dual-haired companion a measured look, an orphan or someone in a similar situation with a powerful quirk that has nothing, and no one to rely on, saved from a bad situation or life by a hero or someone that acted heroically, a child or teen in need of a home that the commission just happens to be uniquely placed to provide. Sound like a familiar bird hero to you. You're worried that the commission will find out about her and turn her into the next Hawks. No, I'm worried that you'll sentence an innocent little girl, one whose life so far has consisted almost solely of being a lab experiment to be controlled by politicians, and yes men with an unhealthy desire for more power than they already have. For a moment the two locked eyes, Shota's shadowy black orbs filled with steely determination clashing against Tsutsumi's emotionless purple as the tension thickened in the air around them. It was Tsutsumi that blinked first, turning away to look at the blank wall beside her. They don't know about her. What? You heard me, they don't know about her. Tsutsumi repeated, looking at Aizawa, her expression softening. When I go and visit her they think that I'm just doing my normal hospital visits to boost my ratings. A child that can't control their quirk is nothing new even if she's a little old for it but the commission's too busy keeping an eye on Hawks to think about raising another kid so soon. As for her quirk it's not in the system yet, and even when it does go in it won't be hard to get them to underreport it, people do it all the time. Why haven't you told them about her Shota asked suspiciously, although his expression had softened from arctic tundra to morning frost at her revelation. You know how powerful she is without control, isn't it your duty to tell them about her? Duty's such a funny word, Tsutsumi said as she pulled a piece of hair from her head that she began to mold with her hand. As a hero it's my duty to protect people. At the commission it's my duty to keep people safe by taking care of someone every now and then. Duty this duty that. Hashi chuckled bitterly. My duty, the way I see it, is to do what I think is right and I think that the right thing for Uri is to keep her as far away from the commission as I can. I know that despite being a hero my job isn't good and just. I'm the dark side of heroism just like you said and that's a burden that I've, she paused, closing her eyes as she took a deep breath holding it a moment before letting it out, that I've resigned myself to carrying. I don't want her to become the next Takami, the next me. After everything she's been through she deserves better than becoming like us. On that at least we can both agree. Silence descended once more as the tension surrounding the two pro heroes began to ebb away leaving just the normal bustle and chatter of a hospital hallway around them. Uri sat upright in her bed, pillows against her back and sheets pulled up to her waist as her bandaged arms rested on the covers in front of her. The creaking of the door opening drew the crimson-eyed youth's attention and she turned the sun outside the window behind her outlining the girl in a golden glow the form of a small stuffed toy unicorn resting on the bed beside her pillows. She was greeted by the smiling visage of a woman in a pink sleeveless dress that reached down to just above her knees. A paler pink cow neck encircled the woman's throat with a zipper pulled up as far as it could go. Black floral text, meaningless to the girl although she thought the flower-shaped characters were pretty, ran down the front side of the dress on the right. Two low-heeled sandals rose in color completed the ensemble but the woman's most eye-catching feature wasn't her clothing instead if one was to look at her their eyes would be drawn to the two white feathered wings that sprouted from the woman's shoulder blades stretching out about a foot on either side of her. The wings were much too small to fly with but combined with the woman's blonde hair that fell in ringlets to her sizable bust and her vivid bright blue eyes it made her all the more angelic. Kinnison, Uri said, identifying the kind nurse who'd taken care of her the last few weeks. What are you doing here? Well, Erichin, Kinnis replied with a smile as she stepped closer to the little girl. Her hands clutched behind her back hiding them from view. I have a surprise for you. A surprise? Yep, a surprise. Kinnis said, nodding her head in confirmation with her eyes closed before opening them again as tilted her head to the side. Her left arm emerging so the woman could raise a finger to her chin in thought. Although I guess it'd be more of a present really oh well, she said with a shrug as she smiled widely. I'm sure you'll love it. Her bottom lip began to quiver as tears rushed to her eyes or, she sniffled, or do you not want it? Uri rapidly waved her arms back and forth in a panic as she tried to calm down the tearful nurse who seemed on the edge of dissolving into sobs. And in Okanison, don't cry, the nurse sniffled again. I I want your present. Ah really the blonde stammered through her tearful eyes. Do you really mean that? Uha, uha, Uri hummed, nodding rapidly. Great Uri could only blink in shock as the tears vanished, the waterworks disappearing as if they'd never been there at all. Now I want you to close your eyes and stick out your hands. I'm going to place something into them but you can't open your eyes until I say so, okay? Uri's response was to blink her crimson eyes for a moment before obediently doing as Kness had asked. The girl stretched her arms forward and closed her eyes, feeling rather than seeing the woman press her hands together forming them into a small cup. When a small weight was rested within them Uri began to open her eyes only for a hand to rapidly fill her field of vision before she could see anything. Uri jolted backwards but Kniss, hidden behind her hand, rushed to reassure the young girl. Ah, ah, I said no peeking. She chided her smooth voice calming the white-haired youth who relaxed back on her bed. 
Great now, close your eyes and don't open them until I say to. Yuri closed her eyes again and she felt rather than saw the hand pull away. Okay you can open your eyes now. Kniss said a few seconds later. Yuri did as Kniss instructed. Opening her eyes she looked downwards tilting her head to the side in confusion as she examined the red semi-round object resting within at her little hands. She gulped as she turned her gaze from it to the nurse lady who'd given it to her and back again. This, she asked hesitantly, her voice low and soft, is for me. The wings on the back of the kind blonde-haired nurse fluttered slightly. Yep, the angelic woman confirmed, an excited smile on her face, I think you're gonna love it. It's called an apple and it's my favorite fruit in the whole wide world. Applery whispered softly looking with wonder at the fruit just a shade darker than her own crimson eyes. Yep an apple, Kniss repeated, it's a red delicious to be specific they're really popular in the United States, and trust me when I say it cost me more than enough yen to get one here. The news caused her to turn her gaze from the fruit to Kniss looking at the angelic woman with just a hint of fear. Kniss merely sighed and raising a hand rested it on Eri's head trying her best to ignore the way the girl seemed to curl into herself at the motion. Don't worry Eri, she said soothingly, I wanted to do this for you. Why? Eri asked suspiciously as she blew up her cheeks as if to act more intimidating although all it did was make Kniss want to squeal at how cute it made her because I thought you'd like it. Eri seemed to weigh her response for a moment as she let the air out of her cheeks returning her gaze to the fruit clutched in her hands. Kniss meanwhile let out a mental sigh as she cast a pitying look at the young girl before her although she was careful to hide it. She'd been here when the two heroes had brought the girl in and she'd been there when the doctor had come to the rather obvious conclusion that some very bad things had been done to the young girl. He'd done the usual tests pressure, temperature, checking her ears, throat, eyes, as well as her reaction time. Everything had seemed normal but when he'd begun the physical examination the doctor had quickly become very, very concerned. Strange, that was the word he'd used to describe it, like nothing he'd ever seen before. He said it was as if someone had operated on the girl, cut her open and then sealed the wound before leaving it alone so it could heal. The only problem was the time it would take for a surgery scar to become so minor it was practically invisible was years if not decades, much longer than Eri had been alive. The subsequent discovery of multiple such scars decorating the little girl's body had led the doctor to the rather obvious if horrifying realization that the girl had been operated on repeatedly only to have her body healed again, and again, and again. This wasn't operating on a patient to save their life, or actions taken out of anger no it was calm, systematic torture under a complete and utter sadist. Torture that was repeated dozens, hundreds of times with Eri likely being awake through it all. Shuddering at the mere thought Kniss turned her gaze to the white-haired girl. With what she'd been through Kniss thought it was a miracle that Eri was as kind as she was. Heaven only knew how bad she'd have been if she'd had to experience what the sweet little angel before her had gone through. As it was, Kniss resolved herself to help Eri to the best of her ability, and Kniss knew just how she'd start, by helping the girl to smile. Eri had tried to smile when Lady Nagin had asked her to on one of the sniper hero's past visits. Kniss could still remember the girl had tried to move her mouth contorting her face like she was trying to make her mouth go a certain way before pinching her cheeks with her hands drawing them upwards. Seconds later her hands had fallen to her lap as a tear fell to land beside them turning the blue cloth of her hospital dress a slightly darker color. I'm sorry Eri said tears filling her eyes as she looked up at them with the look of one who was lost and looking for help. How do you smile again? Shaking her head Kniss focused back on Eri who was slowly raising the apple to her lips where she paused to look at the winged nurse. Kniss nodded her head in encouragement, smiling widely as the girl bit into the apple with an audible crunch. For a moment the girl didn't react, her face blank as her arms fell to rest on her sheet-covered lap. Apple still in hand as juice ran down her face. At the unexpected reaction Kniss was unable to stop the worry that rose within her. Did she make a mistake did Eri not like it Okami what if she hated apples? Kniss was wrenched from her musings by a high-pitched noise and looking at the horned girl she couldn't stop the smile that spread across her face. Eri's eyes sparkled with emotions as her mouth curved upwards into a toothless grin, highlighting the girl's dimples and the juice that stained the area around her mouth. The noise had been a high-pitched squeal of delight as Eri turned to look at Kniss. Kniss and Kniss and it's sweet it's really sweet. For a moment Kniss could do nothing as she was lost in the cuteness of the young girl before her. So adorable she could practically see the golden aura dotted with flowers and apples that surrounded Eri. However looking into Eri's crimson eyes glittering with happiness Kniss felt her grin grow as she closed her eyes and tilted her head to the side. I know aren't they the best Erichin. Her response when she opened her eyes was Eri taking another bite of the apple HM thing her approval as she rapidly nodded her head up and down. Awa, look at that the little unicorns decided to show a smile and all without her favorite heroine present. Turning, the two occupants of the room found themselves looking at Lady Nagant who was using the doorframe for support with one hand while she hid her face behind the other as she gave an obvious faux sob. 
It's enough to break my heart. Kniss smiled at the pro-heroine's antics as Uri began to wave her hands in protest, bubbling about how she was sorry and that Lady Nagant shouldn't cry. Kniss couldn't help but chuckle into her fist as Lady Nagant played it up pouting about how the evil nurse Kniss was trying to steal the little unicorn away from her with apples. The back and forth continued for a moment before Lady Nagant interrupted Uri's bubbling as she raised a finger to the corner of her mouth. Oh yeah I almost forgot. I brought you a special guest today Uri. A guest Uri asked, ing her head to the side in confusion. Yep, and don't worry even though he looks scary I promise he's as harmless as a cat. Lady Nagant replied with a grin. I heard that. A tired voice complained which caused Nagant's smile to widen even more as she leaned out of the room to grab something before pulling it back in. As a nurse Kniss had dealt with many different heroes as well as their antics, but she couldn't help the twitch that developed in the corner of her eye as she looked at the figure whose right arm was wrapped up in Nagant's seemingly vice-like grip. Lady Nagant she spoke, her voice deceptively peaceful and friendly. Apparently her tone hadn't been as disarming as she'd intended as the heroine turned to look at her with just the barest hints of nervousness on her face. Yes. Is this man the special guest you mentioned? Yes. Then please explain to me why you felt that it was imperative to introduce Yuri to a homeless man you clearly picked up off the side of the road she scolded. You have no idea the kind of diseases that he could have from being out on the streets. What if Uri becomes sick with one of them what would you do then Kniss's rant was interrupted by the objective of her scolding breaking down into hysterical laughter. Laughing so hard Kniss thought she might, for the first time in her life, bear witness to someone actually die laughing. The man meanwhile let out a long, suffering sigh as he muttered something under his breath about Nimiri, Hisashi, and Emmy never finding out about this, while he gave an exasperated look with his tired black eyes. Sorry, but I'm actually a pro hero. Oh apparently her eloquent response laden with disbelief and doubt didn't sound that believing as the man's shoulders drooped while Nagant, whose laughter had been dying down returned with renewed vigor. Yeah he might not look like it but he's a real licensed hero. Nagant got out as she leaned against the wall chuckling, his name's Eraserhead. He was the one who first found her when her quirk went wild and got it back under control. He's not good with kids though and made her cry so I had to get him to come here. Did did you not want to see me the quiet voice of the room's youngest occupant cut through the conversation like a hot knife through butter as the three turned her way, finding Iri with her head downcast, and the apple core clutched in her hand. I'm sorry Iri began to sniffle, I just wanted to say thank you. As the little unicorn began to cry, Eraserhead shivered as he felt the other females in the room turn to glare at him. He could practically feel them telling him to fix this, now a command backed by the dark auras promising death and pain rising from their bodies. Sighing, the high school teacher let out a groan as he ran a hand through his shaggy, untamed hair. I was worried, he said, it was soft but still spoken loud enough for Uri to hear, causing her to lift her head to look at him with red tear-filled eyes. I thought that you wouldn't want to see me since I made you cry the last time you saw me. He explained. Uri sniffled you you were scary but you helped me she sniffled again. You turned my power my quirk off and when you did her lips curled up just slightly at the corners, I was so happy. I just wanted to say thank you but you never came. Eraserhead couldn't help his internal, he knew he was going to regret what he was going to say next but seeing the abused kitten look on the girl before him he couldn't help himself. It's because you want to make sure she control her quirk, he tried to convince himself, yeah, that's why no other reason. Absolutely no other reason at all. Would you like it, if I came to see you again he mumbled tucking his head down so his mouth was buried in his capture scarf. This time the smile that split the girl's face was one of absolute joy, yes she said. Eraser had nodded his acceptance of the request and if anyone asked, the twitch at the corner of his mouth was because he was trying to hold in a sneeze and he'd expel any student that said otherwise. Itsuka bit back a curse as she weaved to the side to avoid her opponent's strike. Ducking down she swept her right leg already knowing that it would fail to connect. She expected her opponent to leap into the air so she was shocked when the man instead merely took a step back. She mentally groaned as she launched the roundhouse kick, having already committed to the action, and too late to change it. It was simple for her foe to grab the extended left leg and use it to pull her off balance. As she bunny hopped forward, her leg still gripped in her opponent's arms, Itsuka gritted her teeth as she twisted her captive leg. It was painful, her opponent had quite the grip on it after all, but the small movement allowed her to twist her hips and swing her right up at the man's temple. Even with the superior endurance bodies had now thanks to Quirks the power, and momentum of the attack would have had almost anyone seeing stars, that was if the blow connected of course. Instead Itsuka's foe merely shoved the girl's captive leg towards her torso letting the limb go as he did so causing the airborne girl to fall to the ground in a heap of odd angled limbs, and white fabric. As the orange-headed girl sat up she found herself greeted with a fist hovering inches in front of her face. For a moment she stared at it, her eyes almost crossed before she closed them letting out a heavy sigh that both of them knew to be her admission of surrender. Opening her eyes back up Itsuka watched not the least bit annoyed as the fist opened up into an inviting hand, one she took as she was helped to her feet. Letting out a groan the orangette took a moment to stretch her limbs, particularly her legs as she waited for the man to speak. You did alright today, he said after a moment, you were a little slower than usual but that is to be expected since you weren't allowed to use your quirk. 
As it was, your main mistakes were committing to your attacks beforehand. It left you open and once you fell into a pattern or overcommitted I was easily able to take advantage of them. Itsuka nodded her understanding as the man let a relaxed, easygoing grin cover his face. Now go upstairs and take a shower, your mom's probably almost done with breakfast. Itsuka rolled her eyes but she nevertheless did as she was commanded. Coming back downstairs having showered and switched her kikogi out for her new UA. School uniform, Itsuka sat down at the kitchen table grabbing a bit of both eggs and rice with her chopsticks before shoveling the food in her mouth as her eyes furred to the grandfather clock that stood near the doorway. Eyes on your food, missy. A calm voice interrupted the orange jet's concentration and Itsuka couldn't help the shiver that ran up her spine as she turned her complete attention to the bowl that rested before her. Moments later another bowl was set on the table and Itsuka raised her eyes slightly to look at her mom as the woman sat down across from her. Dressed simply in a pair of jeans and a plain white t-shirt Aka Kendo looked like your average suburban housewife, something the red apron that hung from her neck and was tied tight behind her back did nothing to discourage. Aka's hair was the light orange of a tangerine in contrast to her daughter's dark pumpkin shading but the teal eyes the two of them shared more than affirmed their relationship. So, the woman spoke her eyes on her daughter as she poked at her food with her chopsticks. Are you excited for your first day of school? Yeah, Itsuka admitted. She shook her head. I still can't believe I got in. I mean it's UA. You deserve it honey, Aka said before pausing to take a bite of her own rice and eggs. You worked hard to get accepted. I can barely remember the last time you worked on your motorcycle you spent so much time either studying or training with your father. Itsuka flushed red, bringing her chin to her chest in a vain attempt to hide her blush. Speaking of your father, where is the man? I would like to have a talk with him. The woman's voice, formerly smooth and warm, became just a bit harder on the word talk and Itsuka stiffened in her seat. Forcing herself to swallow, Itsuka opened her mouth only for her father to choose that exact moment to come bustling into the room allowing Itsuka to avoid speaking by shoveling some more food in her mouth. Hello, honey, Itsuka's father, Yai said leaning down to his wife lovingly on the cheek. What's for breakfast? Itsuka and I are having rice and eggs, the kendo matron said flashing the man of the house a small smile with her eyes closed. The woman's smile fell though as she raised a hand to her cheek and continued speaking. Unfortunately it seems we're all out of eggs, so you'll have to make do with something else. Really I asked, his bright smile faltering briefly before it was put back into place. I could have sworn I got some eggs when I went to the store earlier this week. Aker responded with a noncommittal hum and the man's eyes furred to Itsuka who at that moment seemed to find something incredibly fascinating about the tabletop next to her bowl. Oh well, I was in the mood for toast anyway. The man's hand was reaching for the clearly visible bread that was out on the counter when his wife spoke again. Her tone is warm as ever although his hand froze just short of the loaf as the words register. Hem, she hummed. But we're all out of bread as well. Yai gulped as he turned towards his wife, his face pale while the woman gave him the same close-eyed grin she'd sported since he'd first entered the room. Honey he questioned. Honey Aka said, raising a finger to tap at her chin. Each one reminding the unfortunate man of a judge about to hand out their final ruling, I think we just might be out of that too. Gotta go I'll be late for school. Kendo blurted standing up from her chair as she dropped her chopsticks on the table and rushed for the door. Itsuka, Aka called, drawing the name out and freezing the orange jet in her tracks one hand actually on the kitchen doorway. I don't recall you being dismissed. Casting a longing glance at the front door and the freedom it would provide Itsuka reluctantly turned around and made her way back to her seat, collapsing into it roughly her expression downturned. Now, now, Aka chided, I just wanted to have a she seemed to ponder for a moment. Talk with the both of you. Understanding the unspoken command, I took his seat as well. Very good, Aka congratulated, her tone that of an owner who'd just seen their dog perform an amusing trick. Now would either of you like to tell me what you were doing this morning? Her companions were silent although their eyes briefly flashed to each other before returning to the table. Itsuka Aka questioned, her daughter stiffened as she gulped before focusing her attention on a knot in the wooden table. The matron let the silence drag on until it became clear the orange jet would remain silent. Sighing the woman turned her attention to her husband. Yai she tried, this time the pause that followed was much shorter. Yai, your wife is talking to you, the woman tried again in a sing-song voice, but the tone made it clear that if the man didn't answer he could expect to find a new place to sleep at night for the foreseeable future. The man mumbled something. What was that? He mumbled again, Yai if you don't speak up the bed is going to be empty for the foreseeable future, Aka warned. We were in the dojo practicing, Yai caved, Itsuka shooting him a betrayed look although she quickly looked forward as her mother spoke. Really Aka said, her voice is cold and biting as ice. You two were in the dojo practicing on the first day of school a heroic school that is known to take only the best of the best, and that pushes its students to go. What's their motto again? Plus ultra from day one. Why yes, Itsuka. I Itsuka snapped to attention sitting ramrod straight in her chair. From now on you are forbidden to train with your father before going to school. You can train when you get home if you have the energy or on the weekends but I will not have you wearing yourself out only to get hurt from something that could have been avoided if you'd been at the top of your game. 
Am I understood? I, Itsuka had a lot more downcast. Although she didn't like her mother's ruling she understood the sensibility of it. She wanted to be a hero and although she'd pushed herself hard in the time she'd spent training with All Might the last few months she understood that it would be nothing compared to what it would be like at UA. Maybe it was better to drop the morning training sessions, she could always start them up again later if needed after her mother had calmed down a bit. As for you Mr. Aka continued, drawing her daughter's attention back to the conversation at hand, you and I are going to have a talk later. Yes, honey, I said, nodding meekly. Great, now Itsuka you should get going if you don't want to be late. Leave your bowl I'll clean up, have a great day at school. Behave, make lots of friends and remember. I know I know, Itsuka said standing up and heading towards the doorway, I love you too. Striding towards the front door, Itsuka grabbed her bag from the coat rack tossing it over her shoulder as her hand landed on the knob before she was ambushed from behind and pulled into a hug. I still have to say it. Aka said flashing her daughter a smile. We love you little tiger. Itsuka blushed at the nickname. It was something her mom had started calling her as a child and although she'd stopped using it over the years she still pulled it out whenever she wanted to embarrass Itsuka or just was feeling like her daughter was growing up. We're proud of you darling, her father spoke up, a hand on the back of Itsuka's head pulling her gently to his chest. You'll never understand until you have kids of your own but... I love you too, Itsuka said, trying to muffle the tremble in her voice and hide the tears that sprouted in the corner of her eyes. She gave the two a squeeze before dropping her arms, her parents following suit a few seconds later. I'll see you guys tonight, she said, pushing the door open and striding through it casting one last glance over her shoulder before she let it swing shut behind her. Walking down the steps, Itsuka started heading towards the station. While not the longest ride in the world, it was still more convenient to ride to school on the bullet train rather than walk across the city to get to UA. As campus, once she got on the train and settled in an open seat Itsuka pulled out a motorcycle manga she'd taken a recent interest in and began to read looking out the window every now and then at the buildings as they went past. She once thought she caught a glimpse of a hero running or hopping across the rooftops, but the figure disappeared before she could get a better look. After catching a glimpse of a limo stopped at a traffic light Itsuka finally acknowledged that she was spending more time looking around than reading, and put the manga back in her bag. Normally the small paperback book would have been enough to occupy her attention, but today Itsuka just couldn't seem to get into it. She figured it was nerves originating from starting at one of the top schools in the country, but she wasn't sure. After all, how bad could her first day at school really be? Sitting in the backseat of her limo Momo fit the description of the Yeyarazu family heiress to a T back straight feet crossed. Dressed in a uniform ironed fresh that morning everything from the girl's stylized ponytail to her manicured fingernails and perfect posture gave the ravenette the appearance of a prim and proper young lady. In fact the only thing that seemed to detract from the image was the phone currently raised to her right ear that the girl was speaking into. How is your quirk training progressing she asked. The voice on the other end of the line sighed. It's going but that's not the real reason you called me is it? Momo was silent for a second before she spoke softly. No, I suppose it wasn't. The silence that followed was her encouragement to continue. I just I am unsure if I will be able to pull it off, she admitted. It's not that I intend to betray you or work against you, it's just, you're worried about getting caught. No, that's not it. She leaned back resting her head on the top of her seat as she looked up at the roof of the car above her. I want to help you, I feel like I belong at your side assisting you however I can but at UA. I won't be there to. To what look out for me assist me Momo do you know why I wanted you to infiltrate UA? And spy for me. You said it was so that I could provide you with information. Momo remembered repeating Izuku's words back as she pondered the purpose of his question. So that I could look for potential allies while gathering information about students and heroes. I could also protect you, sabotage any information they might possess while working against them without their knowledge. That's right, Izuku said, you doing this shows how much trust and faith I have in you. I know you can do this Momo, I know that you will make me proud. This is an investment in the future, you're a first year right now and I honestly don't expect that you'll be able to do a whole lot. You shouldn't have a whole lot of action until your senior year and it's only afterwards when you go pro that you'll actually have access to the information I'll likely be wanting. Then why? Because you're my friend Momo, the voice said, cutting the rave net off. You weren't there after the raid. You didn't have to wonder if your friend, one of the only people you care about, was going to die because of something you ordered. Izuku-sama. No Momo, before the raid I was sending you to UA. Because I wasn't sure if you would be able to deal with everything we'd have to do as villains. I worried that you couldn't handle it. You might have been raised to be a villain, the next lieutenant in the family, but I was the one who met and trained with the girl underneath the perfect heiress persona. The raid showed me that I was wrong but now I'm more worried about keeping my friend alive than about any information you might be able to get me. Midori Asama, if you are doing this to protect me then I swear on the Yeyarazu name that. Momo, stop talking. The command came through the phone crisp and clear and Momo fell silent as the within her hated up. The command imposing itself over her although it was weak, the green eat likely giving it unintentionally. Momo, I don't want you to get hurt, not right now so soon after that. I he paused, I can't protect you, not right now. At UA. You're safe and I promise, no I swear to you that I am not throwing you away. 
I need you Momo but not right now. Right now I need to focus on growing stronger, learn how to use this new quirk of mine. And having me around would only distract you. Momo said bitterly, her voice cold. What no, bye. It's fine, I understand. If I learn something I'll let you know. Momo, wait. Izuku begged, and although Momo wanted to hang up, the command strayed her hand long enough for her to hear Izuku's next line. Look I'm sorry. He paused once more, I know you have to go and Sensei wanted to speak to me so I guess just don't hold back. Show them what Momo Yeyurazu can do. There may have been more but at that point the command had weakened enough for Momo's finger to hit the end call button terminating it having been in the middle of doing so before she'd been frozen and finishing the second the command weakened enough for Momo to do so. Closing her eyes Momo's head fell forward to hang loosely the phone coming up to rest lightly against her forehead. Idiot. The ravenet muttered. Stupid, overprotective, heroic, idiot. Madam Yeyurazu, the driver's voice made the girl sit up from her slouch, her back straightening automatically, we're here. Oh, um, right. Thank you Sebastian. Momo said mentally cursing her brief stumble as she glanced out the window to see the famed UA. Gates and a steady stream of students flowing through them. Grabbing her school bag she pushed the limo door open and stepped out, closing the door behind her. As Sebastian drove off Momo paused in front of the UA. Gates looking up at the interconnected golden letters above them. Momo knew that to all the other students standing where she was now was a source of pride. An elite school for only the best of the best, one Momo knew many others would kill to get into yet Momo would give almost anything to trade places with that person. To instead be standing by the side of an idiotic greenie in an isolated manner watching the cherry blossoms that gave the manor its name as the two drank tea and talked. For a moment Momo considered turning around, simply walking away but before she could even follow that line of thought a youthful face filled her mind's eye, and her legs carried her through the gates. The brick path was lined with concrete archways and stone busts of UA, S most famed alumni. Momo was surprised to see that it wasn't just the bust of famed heroes that dotted the path like best genus, endeavor, and all might but others as well. Famous inventors, businessmen, and even some she couldn't name was a subtle but nonetheless physical reminder that it wasn't just heroes that UA was famous for. Entering the building Momo quickly found her way to the door to class 1A pausing outside of the massive door clearly built for students with growth or gigantification quirks. Taking a deep breath the ravenet pushed the door open and stepped inside. As was normal for the first day of school the few students were already in the room milling about talking with one another as they waited for class to begin. Glancing at the chalkboard at the front of the room Momo quickly found her seat in the back right corner by the windows and made her way over hanging her bag beside it before sitting down and turning her attention to her classmates. A boy with dual red and white hair sat beside her a scar or birthmark of some kind covering a large area around his right eye. He too sat silently and made no move to socialize with the others instead taking them in just like she was. A glance up at the board informed Momo that the boy's name was Shoto Todoroki. In front of Momo sat a vertically challenged boy by the name of Minoru Maita. Purple ball-like objects obviously related to his quirk made up his hair giving it a vague mohawk shape. He sat in his seat but his attention seemed to be focused solely on a pair of girls chatting at the front of the room. There were two of them, both rather contrasting in appearance. The first had unruly pink fluffy hair rather reminiscent of cotton candy out of which poked two thin pale yellow horns that leant away from each other and curled into hooks. The girl's skin was a bright pink slightly lighter than her hair and contrasted sharply against her eyes, a pair of golden yellow irises against black sclere. The girl was obviously enthusiastic and rather outgoing talking animatedly with her companion. Said companion was a girl although that was about all Momo could say about her, based on the skirt and the way the uniform top pushed out slightly against her chest. The simple observation was because the rest of the girl was translucent, completely see-through with no markings or body parts visible to the naked eye. I wonder if she's visible in infrared, Momo wondered idly. She has to be warping the light around her otherwise any food she eats would be visible in her stomach. That means logically anything that enters her becomes translucent as well. But what if she was covered in something like paint or flour anything touching her doesn't become see-through otherwise her clothes would be clear right now. That means, Momo's thought process was cut off as the door opened and two more people entered the room. One was a rather tall boy with square glasses and short dark blue hair that was flattened neatly down and parted to the right side of his face. The boy's right hand was chopping through the air rather robotically and he seemed to be lecturing his companion if the way the slouching spiky-haired blonde's twitching eyebrow was anything to go by. Momo looked at the two studying them with interest and found it more than a little amusing that everything the blue-haired boy seemed to say only made the blonde matter. The two looked at the board but while the blonde made his way to the vacant desk three in front of Momo revealing himself to be Katsuki Bekugo. Katsuki Bekugo, Momo thought, studying the boy as he collapsed into his chair and raised his feet to rest them on his desk. Why does that name sound so familiar the blue-haired boy meanwhile merely hung his bag at the desk for Tenya Ida before returning to the blonde to continue his lecture although this time it was about his disrespect to the desk and all those who'd both built and sat in it. As the lecture dragged on the clock ticked closer to the start of homeroom and the students one by one began to take their seats allowing Momo to label the Pinket Mina Ashido 
and the invisible girl Toru Hagakure. Just a minute before the bell rang an orange-headed girl entered the class, her hair tied up into a high ponytail on the left side of her head while her right stuck up in unruly tufts. Her bangs split into three-pointed clumps around vivid teal eyes that took in the class lingering briefly on Bakugo before turning to the board. The girl rushed to take the seat open for Itsuka Kendo which coincidentally was the desk vacant behind the delinquent blonde and in front of the boy with the purple ball mohawk. Seconds before the bell rang Ida returned to his seat as well, his hands folding into a pyramid shape as his head hung low an aura of despair surrounding him making it obvious that the boy had failed to lecture Bakugo to his satisfaction. As the bell rang signaling the start of school the door opened to reveal a giant yellow worm that fell to lie in the open doorway. For a moment the class started before they turned to face one another, low mutterings breaking out as the students pondered what to do before the worm rolled over to reveal a human face, one that looked at them with dark shadows under its half-open black eyes and a mouth that as they watched open to let out a deep, exhausted sigh. Okay, the man muttered as he stood up the yellow body falling away as the man unzipped it and stepped out revealing the yellow thing to be a sleeping bag as well as his actual body. It took you all 34 seconds to be quiet. Time is limited. You kids are irrational to waste it. The man paused then looking up at the class and allowing them a moment to take his appearance in. He was slender and tall, pale skin with messy, shoulder-length black hair that partially hung loosely around his head. His face was lined with stubble and was was dressed in a baggy black outfit that consisted of a long-sleeved shirt and matching pants that were tucked into his boots. A utility belt was strapped around his waist and a long white scarf was wrapped repeatedly around his neck. This man is a teacher Momo wondered and she didn't need to look around to know that her classmates shared her thoughts on the matter. She didn't recognize the man which considering the number of heroes spread throughout Japan and around the world wasn't surprising but UA. Only hired pro heroes to teach at the school and Momo certainly didn't remember any pro heroes who looked like a homeless person in need of a shower, warm bed, hot meal, and maybe a trip to the groomers. She was shaken from her thoughts however as the man spoke again. I'm your homeroom teacher, Shota Aizawa. Nice to meet you. Momo didn't react outwardly unlike several of her fellow students who she couldn't help but notice gaping in surprise although it was quickly silenced when the man reached into his sleeping bag and pulled out what the students all recognized to be a blue and white gym uniform. It's kind of sudden but go to the locker room and put this on. He muttered, blinking sleepily. Then go to the field outside. All the students just looked at him blinking with confusion. The man sighed, you have 10 minutes. Then he walked away. A cork assessment test the questioning shout, while not unanimous, certainly carried more than a fair share of the assembled students' voices with it as it echoed across the empty field the class of 1A stood assembled in. What about the entrance ceremony the orientation a blushing brunette with a bob cut asked, clearly nervous that the class would be missing the normal things students did on their first day of school. If you're going to become a hero you don't have time for such leisurely events. Aizawa said, earning some questioning looks at his turned back. One of UAS selling points is how much freedom the students are given but that also applies to teachers. He turned to look at the kids letting out a weary sigh at their confusion. You kids have been doing these since junior high right he asked, holding up a list of eight events. Physical fitness tests where you weren't allowed to use your quirks the Ministry of Education still takes the results from students when they don't use their quirks. He sighed, it's irrational. His eyes roamed over their faces before stopping on a particular one. But Hugo, you finished at the top of the practical exam. In junior high what was your best result for the softball throw? The blonde looked at the black-haired man sullenly, 67 meters. Aizawa pulled out a ball, do it again with your quirk. For a moment Bakugo looked at the man before walking forward and taking the ball from him making his way to the pitch where he took his spot inside the circle. Feel free to do whatever you want, Aizawa said as he held up his phone to judge the distance, just stay inside the circle. Give it everything you got. The blonde turned as instructed and took a moment to stretch his body, loosening up before all of a sudden reeling back his arm he brought it forward an explosion erupting from the palm of his hand as the ball went airborne. The majority of the students kept their eye on the ball as it emerged from the explosion trailing smoke and fire as it soared down the field before returning to earth. Momo however found her eyes glued to the grinning blonde as he smiled in satisfaction, smoke trailing from his hands. It's him, she thought, her teeth grinding against one another as her fingers curled into a fist, nails biting into the palm of her hand. He's the one who made Izuku's life a living hell and now he's here, at UA. A soft growl slid from the ravenette's throat although she hid it as the violet with the ear jacks turned to look at her curiously. Momo's eyes were hard as she stared at the blonde frostily but before she could do anything rash Izuku's last words came back to her. Don't hold back, show them what Momo Yeirazu can do. Don't worry Izuku, Momo thought as a plan began to form in her mind, I will. Katsuki Bekugo was on top of the world as he turned to look at the reader in the teacher's hands. 705.2 meters, more than 10 times as far as he'd been able to throw it without his quirk. He couldn't contain the grin that spilled across his face as he made his way to stand back amongst the extras, so this was the difference how huh, and he would only get more powerful. All right, the teacher said, a dark grin spilling across his face catching Katsuki's attention, you think is fun, fine let's have some fun. 
Whoever comes last after all eight tests will be judged to have no potential and be expelled. Protests broke out immediately upon that statement, but Katsuki didn't even waste his breath. It didn't matter if the teacher was telling the truth or just trying to motivate them because Katsuki Bakugo was going to be first. Just like he'd been in the entrance exam, just as he'd been at Aldera, and just as you'd been at the slime incident, a voice in the darkest crevices of his mind whispered, You certainly would have been the first to die if not foe. Us teachers are free to do as we want, Aizawa continued, raising a hand to push the hair out of his face. Welcome to UA. S Hero Course, try to go plus ultra and all that. The first test was a 50 meter dash but Katsuki didn't pay attention to anyone until it was his turn to go. As he set up on the starting block he cast a glance at his opponent only to freeze as he recognized the orange girl he'd saved at the entrance exam. As if feeling his gaze on her the girl turned to look at Bakugo before flashing him a competitive grin. Good luck, she said, I'll see you at the finish line. Hubbuck Hugo snarled, his temper as the veins in his neck and forehead throbbed. What was that? A gunshot rang out and the girl pushed off her hand enlarging to grip the ground which she used to pull herself forward before shrinking again as she broke into a sprint. Beck Hugo reacted just a moment after she pushed off, cursing himself for getting distracted. He pushed off the starting block bringing his hands up behind him as he straightened up he activated his quirk. Explosions blasted out of the blonde's hands pushing him forward, as he rapidly overtook the girl passing in front of her and over the finish line. 4.63 seconds, the robotic voice reported. The orange jets came a moment later, 5.86 seconds. Snarling, Bakugo stomped his way over to the girl. What was that back there he growled? Were you trying to distract me get in my head and screw me up? He wasn't sure what he'd expected, for the girl to rise to the questions and get angry at him, maybe that she'd break down crying. What he didn't expect was for her to flash him a genuine smile. Good going, she said and he could feel the sincerity in her voice, you did great so make sure to keep giving it your all. With that she turned and walked away leaving a confused blonde blinking dumbly in her wake. Huh. The next test was grip strength and Bakugo was frustrated to see multiple people score higher than him in the test. Explosions couldn't help him here it was all about physical strength and while he might be stronger than most it was nothing compared to some of those with quirks suited to the task. An octopus looking guy got 540 kilograms while the orange headed girl he was starting to think of as carrot top actually broke the thing. Not only did her hands grow which seemed to be her quirk but orange glowing veins seemed to encircle her hand before the machine snapped. What frustrated him even more was that she wasn't the only one to break the machine. A black-haired girl with a ponytail made some kind of clamp that pushed the reader to its limits before it snapped in two. The teacher didn't even get mad instead just muttering something about them giving it their all and being creative. The third test was the easiest. The standing long jump all Bakugo did was use his explosions to stay airborne as he flew over the pit. Others seemed to share his idea though as five others passed the same way as well. A blonde who shot a laser from his stomach, a boy with exhaust pipes growing from his thighs, a blushing brunette, a dual-haired boy with a scar, and the black-haired ponytail girl. For the repeated sidesteps Bakugo just blasted himself back and forth with explosions and although he got second he still snarled as he lost to a midget with purple balls for hair. The boy had taken them off and made two piles bouncing back and forth between them at a rapid pace, so fast he actually left an afterimage in the air. Next was the ball throw, something Bakugo didn't have to repeat due to his original score, and once more carrot top and ponytail stood out. The former enlarged her hands and again Bakugo saw the weird orange veins wrap around it although only now did he notice how her hands seemed to be red as if they had a sunburn or something. She threw it 887 meters but the ponytail girl made it in cannon to shoot the damn ball out of. T3 and a half kilometers the class yelled and even Bakugo couldn't contain his shock. However both of those scores might as well have been meaningless next to the blushing brunette Bakugo dubbed round cheeks who got infinity on hers. Infinity. Even Bakugo couldn't compete with that. Sit-ups and the seated toe touch followed although the only people that stood out in those were a violet-headed girl and the toe touch who could use the earphone jacks that extended from her earlobes to touch her feet. And the octopus guy from the grip test that swing like arms who could easily do the same. The long distance run was last and of course all Ponytail did was pull a bike out of nowhere and ride the damn thing around until it ended. After that the teacher put up the results and Bakugo clenched his fists as he looked them over, stopping after he saw his name. Momoye Yurazu, Shoto Todoroki, Itsuka Kendo, Katsuki Bakugo. Fourth, he'd gotten fourth. In the entrance exam he'd smashed everybody out of the park 79 villain points and another 35 for rescuing the orange jet, as she'd fallen because apparently there was a hidden category called hero points. Bakugo didn't care though he'd passed although he couldn't contain his ire that second place, Itsuka Kendo had gotten a total of 113 points 53 from villains, and another 60 for heroics, one less than him. He'd put it off it didn't matter he was number one although now staring at the scoreboard he couldn't help the frustration rising up within him. He hadn't placed first in even one of the tests, sure he'd always been among the top scorers, but what did that matter when he hadn't even made it into the top three? It irked him especially since neither Icy Hot nor Big Hands had gotten first in any of the tests either yet they'd beaten him all the same. 
He wanted to challenge the three who'd bested him beat them down and show them who was boss, but he stopped himself. This was Yue. Not Aldra his old way of doing things just wouldn't work, and if it did, the voice he'd shoved down inside of him whispered, Wouldn't you only be sending someone else to their death? But Hugo was unable to completely stop the shudder that ran through his body at the thought. Images raced through his mind flashing by so fast he only got a brief glimpse of each of them Deku's terrified face as he looked up at Bakugo, his eyes watering as he stuttered out words the blonde couldn't make out which angered him almost as much as the damn nerd mumbling. His hand rising before he brought it down in Xpsoy and filling his vision as the last thing he saw was Deku flinch. The look of terror on Deku's face as Bakugo looked at him over his shoulder, telling him just how he might go about trying to get a quirk. His mother's tears as she sat at the kitchen table her head in her hands and her eyes red as she turned to tell him that Auntie and Ko and Deku were gone, forever. Then finally the last one, big hands. Falling from on high, her limbs shattered and broken while her orange locks of hair streamed upwards in a last-ditch effort to defy gravity its due. He'd saved her, lied to himself saying he'd done it because she reminded him of weak, useless, defenseless Deku but here, now he couldn't stop the truth no matter how much he wanted to. And, just as it had happened during the exam the broken body of the girl was replaced with that of a green-haired boy in the black middle school uniform of Aldra his image pressing itself over her like a second skin hiding her away completely beneath him. His ghostly visage so clear it might as well be solid. A look at a broken boy taking the last bit of advice from his childhood friend and tormentor. By the way, the expulsion was alignment to draw out your full potential. Aizawa said, looking over the class with a crazed grin. Of course it was, the number one, Ponytail said, arms folded in front of her chest as she looked around. It should have been obvious if you thought it through. The reactions of most of the class made it obvious that they hadn't noticed although Bakugo kept his eye on the teacher. Something about the man, the way he was standing and looking at them told the blonde that Aizawa hadn't been lying and Bakugo knew that if the man had decided someone didn't have potential they'd be gone. The man sighed, stuffing his hands in his pocket. We're done for the day, he said as he turned and began to walk off. Get changed, there are packets in the classroom with the curriculum and stuff so get one and look it over. Then feel free to do whatever, make friends, leave, I don't care. For a moment the class stood there blinking in confusion before Bakugo took the lead stomping off towards the locker room. He had some things to think over. Wow, that was exhausting wasn't it? Momo looked over, taking in the girl with the perpetual blush. Oh, I'm a Chaco Yuraka, she said sheepishly, raising a hand behind her head. It's nice to meet you all. Yeah, the petite violet with the earphone jacks extending from her earlobes joined in. I fell for Aizawa Sensei's lie completely. Although now that I think about it expulsion on the first day, that's just a harsh. She turned towards Momo, you knew though, how'd you figure it out? Well, gyro, Kayoka gyro. Well Jirison, Momo said, raising a hand to rest lightly against her cheek. It's like you said, it didn't make sense. Aizawa Sensei is clearly someone who cares about logic and expelling all of us on the first day based on a single test isn't logical in any sense. Some of us might not have quirks meant for such tests or excel in other areas less physically demanding in nature. It would be better for him to wait to grade our potential based on a variety of factors before making such an important decision. As Momo finished her analysis she looked up taking in the shocked expression covering the faces of the half-clothed girls. What? So smart the thought raced around the room striking everyone except for Ye Yurazu simultaneously. It wasn't a lie though, Momo thought seriously inside her head. I did my research that man had to be Shota Aizawa Yue. S. Harshest teacher known for expelling over 150 kids throughout his career. Most infamously he expelled an entire class three years ago although a few were able to make it back in over time were transferred to other courses. I could let the others know, but if I did that I'd be going against what I said. No, better to play clueless and observe for right now. I don't think any of us thought it through that much. The third-placed orange-headed score paused although it took the Ravenet a moment to understand what she wanted. All my apologies, she said lowering her head in a bow which made her black lace-covered chest do some very interesting things that caught the girl's attention. As she stood back up, my name is Momo Yeyurazu. Itsuka Kendo, the orange jet, Kendo offered in return blushing slightly although she wasn't the only one, Gyro and Yuraka doing the same. Hey, hey, I have an idea, the pink horned girl said, waving her hand in the air to catch everyone's attention. Why don't we all go to MCDs to get to know one another better? Oh, oh, I'm in, I'm in, the invisible girl said, hopping around in nothing more than a pair of panties. That sounds like fun Ashidachin. Toru, Ashido said, looking up from the bench she was sitting on as she pulled on her shoes. Pausing she grabbed seemingly thin air where the invisible girl was standing and began pulling it in opposite directions. What did I tell you to call me? Nina, Toru or rather Hagakure ed. That that's not my cheeks you're, ah, touching. Ha Ashido said in confusion, as she stopped pulling whatever she was touching apart. 
Instead with a frown on her face she began to play with it, moving it around and earning a high pitch deep from Hagakure. What am I touching then she seemed to find something and started rubbing it between her fingers. What are these she asked, they're hard or maybe stiff would describe them better. Yo yo you are touching my, mmh, s. Hagakure squeaked out causing all the girls in the room to turn away blushes covering their cheeks while Mina turned a vivid shade of lilac. Sasori, the alien-looking girl said immediately raising her hands skywards as she stepped backwards, almost falling down as she tripped over her gym uniform. It's it's fine, Hagakure mumbled, clearly flustered as she slipped her school uniform on. Anyway you were saying MCDs. Yeah yeah, would you guys like to come? Ashido said, turning to look at the other girls. I could go, Kendo said, a red blush covering her face. I don't have anything planned, Gyro muttered, still averting her eyes. Sorry, Yuraka apologized, putting her hands together and bowing slightly, but I'm still moving into my apartment. The last of the stuff was supposed to be delivered today. I have to go pick my siblings up from school, Kiro. A frog-like girl named Tsuyu Asui said, maybe next time and call me Tsuyu. Well what about Yeyamomo Ashido asked, turning to look at the only girl who had yet to answer. Yeyamomo. Yeah, yeah, your Azumomo, yeah, Momo Ashido explained, before looking downwards, do you not like your nickname? No, no I like it, Momo said, waving her hands in front of her in denial. It's just the first time someone's given me a nickname. Great, Ashido said, her downcast expression disappearing instantly, so can you make it? Um, Momo considered it she truly did. The girls had been nice and she felt like she could be friends with each of them. Plus it could only help her cover however as she went to say yes an image appeared in her head of a young green-haired boy on the ground, his back to the wall as he desperately tried to crawl away from a blonde who stood over him. A viscous grin covered the blonde's face and his hand was reaching downwards, sparks erupting from the end of it as if they were preparing to ignite something. The green-haired boy meanwhile had tears leaking from his eyes as he held his hands up in a futile defense against his aggressor. I'm sorry, Momo said, her voice slightly colder than she intended. But I have something else I need to do. Oh, Ashido said, uncertainly. Um, okay, maybe next time. Yeah, Momo said, her voice trailing off as she started walking to the locker room door. Next time. 